Scorpio Delta on Social's Mark. Location, the Level 1 Record Room. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Roger. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Roger. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Roger. Evan Cleave, R.S. Technical. Roger. Local Embed, R.S. Electrician. Roger. Restoring primary power and exiting. Amidst the stack of boxes in the Level 1 record room, A.J. stripped off his coveralls, revealing a paramedic uniform. The door to the record room was shut, but he heard the faint sound of footsteps approaching. It was time. We don't want to hear your excuses. The fact remains that it took your detail almost 20 minutes to restore power to the facility with the emergency generator when it should have started automatically and immediately on the loss of primary power, Alban yelled. Officer Motorkeek cowered. Yes, Madame Inspector, you're right. The response time was unacceptable, but I can show you the inspection records on the emergency generator. It passed the annual certification test just last month. Kalin turned his head to the side, hiding an insuppressible grin. Even though he did not speak a word of Czech, he had seen Alban in full dominatrix mode enough times to know exactly what was happening. The systematic humiliation of Officer Motorkeek was at a crescendo, and Kalin relished watching it. In thirty seconds, however, the spotlight would shift. All eyes would be on him. Kalin slowed his pace to a half-step behind the others, clearing his throat as he did. Alban looked at him and nodded. It was time. Out of Motorkeek's peripheral vision, he slipped a clear, dissolvable strip onto his tongue. I want to see all the maintenance records for the emergency diesel generator, Alban said to Motorkeek. Yes, Madam Inspector, Motorkeek said as he reached to open the door to the Level 1 records room. We maintain hard copies of all maintenance records in addition to the annual certifications. Alban screamed. Motorkeek spun around. Kalin was collapsed on the tile floor at her feet, writhing like a serpent. His legs and arms flailed in rhythmic, violent contractions. A puddle of urine pulled on the floor underneath his midsection. Beneath his rapidly fluttering eyelids, his pupils were rolled back, leaving only the white of his sclera visible. This man is having an epileptic seizure, Motorkeek yelled. He knelt and began to reach for Kalin's arm. No, don't touch him, she ordered. He told me what to do if this ever happened. Do not restrain him. She pulled her mobile phone from her pocket. I'm calling an ambulance. Motorkeek raised his two-way radio to his lips and called in the medical emergency to the front desk. Within minutes, a small crowd of Chiarek Norse personnel had gathered around Kalin, who continued to have clonic seizures. Nearly a minute passed before Kalin's body went still and then fell limp. His head flopped lifelessly to the side, and the gathering crowd of onlookers gasped. Alban knelt, checked his pulse, and looking up at the circle of concerned faces, said, He is unconscious, but alive. The paramedics should be here momentarily. Alban remained at Kalin's side until the squeal of stretcher wheels and pounding footsteps announced the arrival of the medical team. Two men in paramedic uniforms pushed their way through the circle of people and converged on Kalin. As Alban stood, extracting herself from EMT duties, she whispered, Mark. See Remy, R.S. coordinator. Bio, that's your cue. Move toward the door. When the paramedics address the crowd, you slip in and take position on the stretcher. Two paramedics came in. Three go out. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Roger, I'm ready. Okay, everyone, the show is over. Please make some room. We need to load this man onto the stretcher one of the paramedics said to the crowd in check. You heard him. Move back, people. The paramedics need room to work, Motorkeek said, taking charge of his gathered co-workers. The other paramedic began pushing the onlookers away, creating confusion and commotion, and no one noticed a third paramedic take position at the foot of the stretcher. 
This man wheeled the stretcher into position as the other two paramedics readied Kalin for lifting. On the count of three, we lift him. One, two, three, lift! The paramedic in charge directed, and they lifted Kalin onto the stretcher bed. Officer Motorkeek, please get these people out of here, Alban ordered. Yes, Madam Inspector, I'm very sorry. Motorkeek raised his arms and barked at the crowd. Back to work! The inspector is in good hands. Everyone, back to your stations. Thank you, Officer Motorkeek. She extended her hand, which he gladly took within his. Given this event, the inspection is over. However, your diligent cooperation will be noted in my report and will reflect positively on you as an individual, regardless of how the facility fares overall. Thank you, Madam Inspector, Motorkeek said with a smile clutching her hand in both of his until at last she pulled it free from his sweaty palms. If you have any future questions, you know you can count on me. He watched the inspectors hurry toward the ambulance. He was proud of himself. He had shown initiative today and leadership. Maybe instead of being fired, he would be promoted from section leader to chief of security. Chief Motor Geek. He liked the sound of that. With sirens blaring and lights flashing, an ambulance sped away from Chiarek Norse through the streets of Prague at one hundred kilometers per hour. In the cramped rear compartment, A.J. sat in silence, his knees wedged against the metal frame of Kalin's stretcher. With every jarring pothole, his kneecaps suffered a new bruise. He peered down at the motionless Kalin, resting on the stretcher. Kalin's eyes were closed, and his face was drenched with beads of sweat. This sort of thing is hard on a body, even for someone as fit as Kalin. Maybe you better check his breathing, said Alban, from her position next to him on the narrow bench seat. A lump formed in his throat. No one had warned him that Kalin's health would be put in jeopardy by the stunt. Damn, the tank was hardcore. He leaned over the stretcher and put his cheek close to Kalin's mouth and nose. He felt a warm, moist breath against skin, but it seemed faint and labored. He was about to suggest that they take Kalin to a real hospital, when, without warning, Kalin's hands shot up and clutched him by the shoulders. Boo! He jerked free from Kalin's grasp, knocking his head on the ceiling of the ambulance. Kalin howled with glee. Veronica wiped tears from her cheeks. She was laughing so hard. Even Alban could not help but chuckle at the scene. His initial confusion gave way to laughter as he joined in his colleague's revelry at his expense. Nice one, Archer, Kalin said, slapping A.J. on the upper arm. Very nice. Chapter 23 Boston, Massachusetts. Meredith rubbed her eyes. Instead of rousing from her nightmares, lately it seemed she was waking into them. These inspectors, were they Americans? She seethed. Her iPhone pressed hard against her right ear. She had not bothered to get out of bed, nor had she turned on the lights in her Boston hotel suite. No, Miss Morley, they were check. The nervous voice on the phone replied in heavily accented English. They were from the Ministry of Health. Did they have official ministry paperwork? Yes, of course. Email me a scanned copy of every document they issued. Do you understand? Yes, Miss Morley. If she had a detonator linked to that sorry-ass excuse for a covert facility, she would have pressed the button. She had once seen a bumper sticker that read, You can't fix stupid, and by God her people were validating that aphorism on a daily basis. Is anything missing? Did they confiscate materials, samples, records, hard disks, anything? No, madame. Nothing appears to be missing. But we are still conducting an inventory of the facility— all patients and research were already transferred to the Bucharest facility, so there was nothing for them to see other than the facility itself. And with the power outage, 
Most of their inspection was conducted in the dark. Power outage? I was not made aware of any power outage. I'm sorry. I thought you were already informed of the incident. We suffered a power outage at the facility today. About fifteen minutes after the inspectors arrived, we lost primary power, and the backup generator failed to start. It's good the transfer was complete, because ventilation and refrigeration were down for twenty minutes, the head of Chiarek Norse Security explained. How is it possible that the backup generator failed to start? We are still investigating, but apparently the fuel transfer line on the diesel generator was clogged, so the diesel was starved of fuel, even though the fuel tank was full. What was the line clogged with? The mechanic says it was sludge. Don't you find that a bit suspicious? No. The mechanic says this can happen if the fuel tanks are old, if the fuel is contaminated in some way, or if the maintenance is not proper on the machine. An awkward silence persisted before Meredith finally said, Is Dr. Pope with you now? Yes, he is standing next to me. Put him on the phone. Hello, Meredith. Xavier Pope's dulcet voice was a lullaby. With all the stress of recent events, she found herself suddenly yearning for his company. She missed their late-night sessions in Prague. She missed the euphoria they had shared during the early days of the project. The start of a new project was what she lived for. So much hope. So much anticipation. It was the same feeling she had as a girl, just after opening the first present on Christmas morning, holding a new treasure in hand, but knowing that many other gifts, each possibly more grand and exciting, still awaited unwrapping. Now that feeling was gone. Anticipation replaced by anxiety, fervor supplanted by frustration. She was cleaning up other people's messes. She hated messes. Have you positively identified the people who paid us the visit today? No. I've not seen a decent image of any of the inspectors' faces. We lost all camera footage during the blackout, and the video feed from the lobby wide-angle camera was corrupted before the power loss. How convenient, she mumbled. Indeed. And where the hell were you when all this went down, Xavier? I was en route to the airport. You told me to personally oversee the final preparations in Bucharest. Unfortunate timing. What about the server room? No forced entry, as far as we can tell. The servers have a thirty-minute UPS, so they stayed online for the duration of the blackout. Most of the doors in the facility have magnetic locks that fail when power is lost, but the server room has a key lock for double security. But it doesn't matter, anyway. All project data was exported off the servers before they arrived, and the clean files you provided were imported in their place, as instructed, Pope assured her. Excellent, Meredith said. And the record room? I pulled Foster's charts yesterday myself and replaced them with the ones you sent by FedEx. Well done, Xavier. It's good to know I have at least one person in this organization I can count on. Is there anything else I can do, Meredith? Find Will Foster before someone else does, she laughed. The line fell silent. Call me when the identity of the inspectors can be corroborated, she said. Do you still want me to go to Bucharest, or should I remain in Prague in case the inspectors come back? They won't be back. Leave on the next available flight. We've lost three days of research time. I can't afford to lose any more. You realize it will be difficult, if not impossible, to proceed without Foster. We have his entire genome mapped, Xavier, and months of research data. You should be able to continue the work without Foster now. It's not that simple, Meredith. There are over 20,000 genes scattered among three billion base pairs in the human genome. And just because you've identified a gene doesn't mean you know what protein it encodes. 
It also doesn't tell you what function that protein performs or how it interacts with other proteins. The Foster mutation is something we've never seen before. It could be expressed by a single gene or by multiple genes. We're still evaluating. I never said this would be easy, Xavier. And you still haven't answered my question, she said, her ire rising. She heard him exhale loudly on the other end of the line, and it annoyed her. Identifying the genes that express the Foster mutation is not the same thing as understanding how the mutation works. Before I can devise a gene therapy that confers Foster's unique mechanism of immunity, I have to understand exactly how his immune system operates. For that I need more time. Her tone soured. Enough. He'll be back in your custody by week's end, she said and ended the call without salutation. She looked down at her iPhone. She wanted to throw it across the room, but she resisted the urge and set it gently down on the bedside table. She exhaled slowly and told herself that she was proud of herself for showing restraint. Then she picked up the iPhone and hurled it across the room. It hit the facing wall with a thud and dropped to the carpet. She was tired, so very, very tired. When she was in college, pulling one or two all-nighters a week was no problem. Now her thirty-nine-year-old body was not as forgiving, and the events of the last several days had left her haggard, mentally and physically. She was functioning more on instinct than intellect at the moment, and her usual vice-like control over her emotions was slipping. Foster was proving to be vexingly more elusive than she had anticipated. She was not surprised that Raymond Zern and his half-wit brother Udo had still not located Foster. Hiring the Zerns had been a mistake, but Nicolora's team's impotence thus far was as appalling as it was astonishing. No sooner had she finished damning Nicolora's team than she began to second-guess herself. If her relationship with Nicolora had taught her anything, it was that his competence was overshadowed only by his cunning. If the tank did not have Foster yet, then she had reason to worry. With Nicolora, the straight line was never the shortest distance between two objectives. Surprise, Ministry of Health inspection, she scoffed in the dark. I know it was you, Robert. You devil. Her iPhone rang. She turned on the bedside lamp, got out of bed, and walked over to where she had thrown it. She picked it up off the carpet and looked at the caller ID. Fantastic. More bad news. What? she barked. Ms. Morley, this is Bart Bennett at VN Bioscience. We need to talk. Chapter 24 Prague, Czech Republic What's a blue gene? Kalin asked. It's a supercomputer made by IBM, Van Cleve said, without looking up from his laptop screen. Why would they have a supercomputer at Shiarek Norse? That's what I'm trying to figure out, but I'm having trouble concentrating because someone keeps interrupting me. Van Cleve snapped. You must have a couple of guesses what they're using it for. I have a theory, but you're not saying. With a sigh, Van Cleve looked at Kalin. It appears they are using it for DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing of what in particular? A.J. interjected. Again, I am still assessing the data the spiders were able to transmit before they went dark. I've found some inconsistencies. The data on their mirror drives does not match the data on the primary drives. What does that mean? It means that someone scrubbed their primary drives and uploaded new data, but they forgot to scrub the mirror drives, Van Cleve sniffed. Amateurs. 
What was on the primary drives? Alban asked. The same information Virogen gave us in Boston. And on the mirror drives? I'm not a microbiologist, but if I had to guess, I'd say we're looking at the entire genome of patient 65, a.k.a. Foster. A.J. looked at Alban. She nodded. Kalin cleared his throat. Okay, I'll ask the stupid question. What does sequencing Foster's DNA have to do with drug testing? I don't think Virogen is studying a particular drug. I think they're studying William Foster, A.J. mumbled. Did you find anything else on the mirror drives? Yes, but I haven't had time to pour through it, said Van Cleve. Can you give me access? I'd like to take a look at the data. Of course. Grab your laptop and pull up a chair. This can't be coincidence, A.J. said, pointing to the computer screen. Alban walked over and stood behind him so she could see over his shoulder. What did you find? Somehow, Virogen must have gotten access to my research data, because they copied my AAV vector protocol exactly. What I was testing on mice, they've been testing on real freaking people in a gene therapy preclinical trial for the past three months at Chiarek Norse. When Alban didn't respond, he spun around in his chair to face her. She met his gaze. You're not surprised by this? She said nothing. Because you already knew, didn't you? We had our suspicions. Of course. That's why Briggs recruited me in the first place. You knew they stole my fucking research. I'm such an idiot. There are no accidents in our line of work, A.J. How did you find out? The editor of the science journal Immunology tipped off your advisor, McNamara, that Meredith had gotten her hands on a pre-publication draft of your paper. McNamara was concerned, so he contacted us. He and Briggs have history. And when were you planning on telling me this? Does it make a difference? Hell, yes, it does. Breathe, A.J., Alban said, resting her hand on his shoulder. He shrugged her off, stood up, and started pacing. He ran his fingers through his hair and let out an exasperated sigh. Why wouldn't you tell me? That's a better question. We wouldn't have wasted all this fucking time. That's not true. Everything we've done, we would do again, regardless of whether you knew Virogen had commandeered your research or not. We needed proof. And now I need you to help us understand the connection. To what end does Virogen intend to use your research? Why do they need it? It's your turn to do the heavy lifting, A.J., so stop whining and do what we hired you to do. The prideful, defiant side of him wanted to challenge her, but the scientist in him knew she was right. More importantly, she was in charge. The conversation was over. Having witnessed the entire drama, Kalin swept in with perfect timing. Hey, guys, you should come take a look at this, he said. You won't believe what Van Cleve found. Van Cleve cleared his throat. Do you remember the data anomaly that Veronica briefed us on when we first arrived in Prague? Yes, the spike in homeless deaths and the coroner's reporting of toxic shock is the cause of death, Alban replied. I think I figured out why. Chiarik Norse was a participating hospital in the free vaccination program this winter in Prague. That's how they found their test and control groups of human subjects, said Van Cleve. Let me guess. They used homeless people to form the test group, A.J. said, aghast. 
25 homeless persons were involuntarily enrolled in a project codenamed the Calypso Directive and received treatments which ultimately culminated in 21 of their deaths, said Van Cleve. Wait a minute. Isn't that unorthodox for a drug company? Kalin interrupted. Unorthodox, unethical, unfathomable, not to mention entirely illegal, said A.J. Why would they do something like that? Kalin pressed. Expediency, greed, complete madness. Who knows? A.J. sighed. Not true. You do know why, Alban said. I do. We all do. Project Bioshield. Virogen needs to show Barda proof of concept before the money dries up. They're under pressure, racing against the clock, and so they're rushing. During her briefing in Boston, Meredith implied that her wonder drug was in the final stages of testing, said Kalin. The evidence we've uncovered contradicts that, Van Cleve said. A.J. nodded. I agree. Virogen is still early in the development phase. The data I looked at indicates at least four different AAV DNA prime boosted vaccine formulations were evaluated over the past three months. Say again in English this time, Kalin said. A.J. sat down and faced the group. Is anybody interested in a five-minute Immunology 101 course? The group nodded. Like an army, the human immune system also uses scouts to identify and tag foreign invaders that enter the body. These scouts are called lymphocytes. The invading pathogens have proteins, called antigens, on their surface that the scouts use to identify the pathogen as self or not self. When a lymphocyte finds a pathogen, it tries to connect to the invader's antigens. If it recognizes the antigen, in other words, if the immune system has a memory of the pathogen, then it activates other lymphocytes to rapidly produce millions of antibodies specific to that particular invader. The antibodies spread throughout the body, latching on to the antigens of the invading pathogens. Sometimes, by binding to the pathogen, the antibodies are able to neutralize it. In other cases, the antibodies simply mark pathogens for destruction by macrophages. But if the immune system has no memory of a pathogen, the body doesn't know which antibodies to produce. In these cases, the immune response takes longer. The scouts take the antigen back to the lymph nodes, a.k.a. central command, and recruit lymphocytes to manufacture antibodies that will work against the new threat. Once the antibodies are released, the rest of the immune system is alerted, and the macrophages and lymphocytes go to battle. The problem is that while the central command is gearing up for its retaliation, the invader is multiplying unfettered. That's the reason for vaccines, Kalin said, to give a small dose of the bad stuff so the body can fight back if it ever sees the germ again. You get an A+, plus, A.J. said. But... That's not what Virogen is after, is it? Alban said. No. They're investigating an entirely new path in medicine. They are trying to use gene therapy to prime or program a subject's immune system to respond quickly to an infection, even in cases when the subject has no memory of the invading pathogen. How can they accomplish that with gene therapy? Kalin asked. By copying my dissertation, A.J. said, laughing at the irony. At BU, I was investigating the possibility of using gene therapy to program existing lymphocytes to recognize antigens they had never seen before and produce antibodies they had never produced before, thus conferring immunity to the subject 
even after first contact with a new pathogen. I used a specific type of virus called an adeno-associated vector virus, or AAV, to insert DNA into existing memory B cells in mice. The new DNA contained instructions for making antigen-specific receptors and antibodies that the memory B cells of the mice were not previously programmed to make. Then we injected the mice with a target pathogen to see if they would mount a robust immune response. To everyone's utter disbelief, including mine, it worked. Why is the gene therapy approach any different or better than using a vaccine? Van Cleve pressed. Ah, the billion-dollar question. There are three main problems with vaccines. First, many vaccines require dosing regimens of multiple shots spread out over many months, with periodic boosters to confer immunity. Vaccines must be administered prior to infection to be effective. Once a person is sick, administering a vaccine is like handing a bulletproof vest to someone who has already been shot. Second, Vaccines are not without side effects. In addition to introducing DNA from the target pathogen, vaccines also contain toxic adjuvants and unintentional viral or bacterial DNA that can cause systematic and lasting side effects in patients. Third and finally, many pathogens exist, Lyme disease, Ebola, HIV, AIDS, to name a few, that we don't have vaccines for. Immune boosting through gene therapy appears to confer immunity much faster than vaccines do. Recent research on prime boosting for anthrax shows that subjects could have full immunity in as little as three weeks, as compared to 18 months when relying on the existing anthrax vaccine. Even more exciting than that is the idea of using gene therapy as a therapeutic for patients that are already infected. In my experiment, I was able to elicit full-scale antibody production against a new pathogen in infected mice within 72 hours of treatment. Ideally, we'd like that surge to occur within half the time. This is all fascinating, but what does gene therapy have to do with Foster? And more importantly, why the hell is Virogen decoding his genome? Kalen asked. A.J. nodded. Kalen is right. It doesn't make sense. Back in Boston, Meredith Morley told us that Foster was infected with a mutated strain of H1N1, but I can't see how sequencing Foster's genome relates to that. As we collect more pieces of this puzzle, the less Foster seems like a mole and the more he looks like a test subject. How can we confirm that? Kalen asked. Maybe it's time to ask him, Alban said with a straight face. Kalen laughed. I think you're forgetting something, my dear. We still don't know where Foster is. Alban smiled. Van Cleve, will you please show the others the probability matrix you've been working on? Van Cleve grabbed his tablet computer. Using the data the coordinators compiled investigating Foster's background, I built a probability matrix to analyze his social network. I wanted to identify and rank the people he is most likely to contact for help. The top-ranked prospect is this woman, Julie Ponty, he said, turning the screen so the others could see her picture. Ponty is thirty-two, unmarried, graduated from Tulane University, Foster's alma mater, one year after he did. According to her work visa... She lives in Vienna and is employed by an Austrian contract research company called Vienne Bioscience, which, I might add, was purchased 18 months ago by Virogen Pharmaceuticals. That 
Can't be a coincidence, A.J. said. Van Cleve sniffed. I don't deal in coincidences, only in probabilities. A.J. laughed. Okay. Then I think the probability is high that we will be taking a road trip to Vienna in the very near future. Kalin jiggled the keys to his Ducati. Race you there. Chapter 25 Boston, Massachusetts How did you get this number? Meredith said into her iPhone. From Xavier Pope. I've been trying to reach him for the past two hours, but he hasn't been picking up. He gave me very specific instructions. In case of an emergency where he cannot be reached, I am to contact you directly. I think this qualifies as an emergency, said Bart Bennett with a hint of trepidation in his voice. You have my attention, Dr. Bennett, so please start at the beginning. She listened without interruption as he related the morning's events. He went on to explain that Pope had sent him hundreds of samples for analysis over the previous two months, and how he believed the connection between today's sample and the others was indisputable. When at last he fell silent, she said, You did the right thing calling me. Loyalty and discretion are prized and rewarded in our organization. Since Virogen acquired Vienne Bioscience eighteen months ago, your name has crossed my desk more than once as someone who is a rising star. It looks like that director position might have just opened up. Now, tell me, does anyone else know about this? Yes, the woman who brought me the sample, Julie Ponty, and my lab assistant, John Henning. I want you to listen very carefully. All computer files and records associated with this event need to be deleted. All hard copies and prints need to be destroyed. Any slides or sample volumes need to be packaged and locked in the secure refrigeration unit for pickup by one of my couriers. Okay, I understand. What do you want me to tell my assistant, John? Don't worry about Mr. Henning. He's going to be reassigned. Reassigned? Nothing bad is going to happen to him, right? I mean, it's not his fault, he found out. He was just doing his job, Bart protested feebly. What would ever make you think such a terrible thing? Of course nothing is going to happen to him. We just need to occupy his mind with other things right now. A transatlantic reassignment will give Mr. Henning other things to think about besides antibodies and lymphocytes. He's been a great lab technician. I'd hate to lose him. The world is full of great lab technicians. Besides, Director Bennett, we'll have much more pressing responsibilities to fret over than the job satisfaction of lab technicians. Am I making things clear? Yes, crystal clear. Good. Now tell me about the woman who brought you this sample, Julie Ponty. I want to know everything. Meredith collapsed onto the king-sized bed in her hotel suite at the Copley Plaza and stared at the ceiling. Her morning had begun with a slap in the face, but thanks to Julie Ponty, she was officially back in the game. To say she was in control of the situation would be an overstatement, but at least she was equipped with knowledge she could use to influence each of the player's next moves. As she lay there, still dressed in the frayed Princeton University T-shirt she wore as nightshirt, she weighed her options. The report from Pope needled her. Yes, the surprise health ministry inspection could have been legitimate, but she harbored doubts. If Nicolora had directed his minions to infiltrate her Chiaric Norse facility, then it was because he didn't trust her. She wondered if he truly trusted anyone. 
When they were together, he was always probing, testing her loyalty. It had driven her crazy. One day, when she'd finally had enough, she blasted him in a fiery accusatory assault. Instead of denying her allegations, he had argued vehemently that she adopt a similar philosophy, stating that trust is a luxury that people in power cannot afford. Surveillance is the cornerstone of prescience, he stated, intelligence collection the cornerstone of insight. She asked him to teach her to think as he did, like a field general in battle, and he had granted her request. In the years since their split, she had honed her skills. She had contemplated a variety of security breach scenarios concerning Chiaric Norse and prepared for them. Tracks had been covered, electronic files, paper documents, and official statements for multiple contingencies had been readied in advance. If the inspectors had been Nicolora's team, she was confident they hadn't discovered anything of consequence. Still, she couldn't stand not knowing. Her lips curled into a coy little smile. It was time for her to spend some private time with her old teacher— collect some intelligence of her own. She had reserved her hotel room for an extra day for this very exigency. In her experience, a man's mind was surprisingly unfettered after a fierce orgasm. She decided she would not tell Nicolora about Julie Ponty, at least not before she knew his true agenda. Her hunting dogs, the Zerns, were another matter. When she had last spoken to Raymond, he was still in Prague, trying to pick up Foster's trail at the infamous Cyber Café. His pride was bruised after the events in Prague. She was confident he would not underestimate Foster again. Still, he had threatened to blackmail her. Could she rely on his discretion? She had already tried firing him, but that had only enraged him. She exhaled slowly. Realistically, she was stuck with the Zerns to the bitter end. With a single phone call, the brothers could be standing in Ponty's apartment in less than four hours. Better to send them to Vienna now, while the window of opportunity was still open. There was no telling how long Foster would linger in one place before running again. Next, her mind drifted to Julie Ponty and how she could best use this new chess piece that had appeared on the board. Was Ponty a knight or a pawn? Could she intimidate Ponty into cooperating with her? From talking with Bennett, it was obvious that she was clever. Had Bennett not already been read into Calypso, Ponty would have succeeded in using his laboratory to uncover Foster's secret and possibly Meredith's agenda— without anyone the wiser. If she had not yet pierced together the connection between Virogen, Leighton Harris, and Chiaric Norse, she undoubtedly would in short order. Meredith inspected her fingernails, French manicured, polished, elegant. Nothing like the razor-sharp claws she deployed in battle. If she were in Ponty's position, she would size up her enemy— quickly realize it was a fight she couldn't win, and ditch Foster. Actually, if she were Julie, she would negotiate a lucrative payoff and turn him in herself. This begged the question, what type of woman was Julie Ponty? How deeply did she care for Foster? Would she be willing to sacrifice her career to help him escape? or would she cave under pressure? Meredith picked up her iPhone. It was time to find out. Chapter 26 Prague, Czech Republic I'm sorry, but the hard disk from the computer at the cyber cafe is a dead end announced Stefan Zern to his brothers Raymond and Udo, as they walked into the hotel room carrying sandwiches. Public computers and cyber cafes are notorious for being infected with keystroke logging spyware. 
a phenomenon I had hoped to exploit. But in this case, the computer had an updated security suite installed. Also, cookies were disabled in the browser, and there was nothing useful cached in virtual memory. I found no clues to help lead us to Foster. It's okay. I know where he is, Raymond replied, clapping his hand on his younger brother's shoulder. How? Oh. It appears the American made a fatal mistake. He trusted a woman, Raymond said. Udo laughed loudly at the comment, too loudly, and it annoyed him. As I was saying, Foster contacted a woman who lives in Vien and asked her for help. She is also an American. Her name is Julie Ponty. And your source is... Our employer, Frau Morley. She phoned me personally with the good news five minutes ago. Even the coldest of bitches eventually warm to your charms, brother. How do you do it? Raymond laughed. After you hacked her VOIP account, I called her directly in her office and blackmailed her. She's been most cooperative ever since. The hack was a nice piece of work, by the way. Danke. It was nothing. A child could have done it, Stefan said, and then added, Blackmail is terribly underrated, in my opinion. It has been working so well for us all these years. Raymond tapped the top of Stefan's laptop computer screen and said, Let's find out where Julie Ponty lives, shall we? Ponty is spelled P-O-N-T-E. Stefan opened a browser window and performed an Internet search. Hmm, he mumbled as his eyes scanned the list. I find only one woman in Vienne named Julie Ponty. I'll SMS the address to your phone. Raymond's phone chimed and the text message with Julie's address appeared on the screen. Their job had become so much simpler with the advent of the Internet and mobile phones. Finding people had once been a tedious and painstaking endeavor. Now it was as simple as a click of a button. What now? asked Udo. We pack the van and drive to Vienne. It's time to collect our fee. Tell me something, Raymond. Why is this American, Will Foster, so important? Stefan asked. They don't tell me why, and I don't ask. Remember, we are like garbage men. We get paid to clean up other people's messes. They don't want to see us. They don't want to talk to us. And most of all, they don't want to know what we do with the trash. Chapter 27 Vienna, Austria. Oh, my God, Julie uttered. Will looked at the screen and then at Julie, perplexed. Is it significant that Virogen owns Leighton Harris? She stole a glance at the maroon-colored mouse pad on her desk. Printed beneath the company logo in bright white letters were the words, Vienna Bioscience a Virogen company. She repositioned the mouse so that it covered the text. Dodging his question, she redirected. What was the name of the facility in Prague where you were held in quarantine? I don't know. It was a total information blackout at that place from the day I arrived. The facility was part research hospital part laboratory. All I know is that my pants had the words C.N. Hospital stenciled across the butt. Julie opened a new browser tab. She entered Prague plus C.N. Hospital as a new search string in Google and pressed the search button. The page refreshed with the search results. She scanned the list and clicked on a link she thought looked promising. 
The site was written entirely in Czech and had no English-language option. As she scrolled, she quickly ruled out the site, as it was full of pictures of dogs, cats, and smiling veterinarians. She clicked back to Google and entered a new search string. Virogen plus Prague plus CN Hospital. The screen populated with a new list of links, and she read through them until one caught her eye. She clicked on the link, and it took her to a BBC World News article reporting, U.S.-based multinational drug giant Virogen Pharmaceuticals has announced today that it has acquired Chiarek Norse, the fifth largest research hospital in the Czech Republic. Holy shit! That's it, Will said, reading over her shoulder. Julie looked up at him. So it seems I have one more hunch I want to check. She opened a third browser tab and repeated the drill. This time she searched for Virogen plus CDC plus Xavier Pope. The first hit was a link to a Wall Street Journal article. She clicked on it and found an announcement listing, New Jersey-based Virogen Pharmaceuticals has announced today that Dr. Xavier Pope, formerly of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, has been hired as the director of the company's Immunological Therapeutics Division. When did you enroll in the vaccine trial? About five months ago. Look at the date of this press announcement, Julie said. Four months ago, Will grimaced. So Virogen recruited Pope away from the CDC because of me. Do you know how huge this is, Will? That's what I've been trying to tell you. Julie rubbed her temples. She didn't dare tell him that technically she worked for Virogen, too. When she had accepted the position at Vienne Bioscience five years ago, it had been an independent and privately held Austrian company. Eighteen months ago, Vienne Bioscience had been acquired by Virogen. As was the Virogen strategic policy, any acquisition that had strong brand equity retained its name and was permitted to function with tolerable autonomy. Julie had never really considered herself as working for Virogen, but she knew who wrote her paychecks. She could only imagine how Will would react if she told him. He would immediately reclassify her as the enemy and distance himself from her, if not physically, definitely emotionally. His trust in her would be obliterated. Her mobile phone chimed. She retrieved it from her purse and checked the caller ID. Blocked. Hmm, she said, and then warily pressed the talk button. Hello? Julie Ponty? My name is Meredith Morley, said the voice on the line. You have something that belongs to me, and you're going to help me get it back. Ashen-faced, Julie hung up her phone and turned to Will. What was that all about? I'll explain later. Right now, we need to get the hell out of here. She darted to her closet, grabbed a backpack, and began stuffing it with essentials. Talk to me, Julie. Who was that on the phone? Virogen. They know you're with me. It's only a matter of time before they come here. The look in her eyes was all the motivation he needed. He swiped her mobile phone from her hand and powered it off. They can track us with this, he said, handing it back to her. Keep it turned off. Then he grabbed the computer printouts off the desk and began stuffing them into the bag. Shh! Quiet, she whispered. Will froze. In the stillness, they heard the deadbolt click open on the apartment door. Shit! They've found us! Chapter 28
Will ducked behind the half-closed door to Julie's bedroom. She handed him a pair of scissors from her desk, which he turned point downward and gripped like a knife. Her Viennese city apartment was small and bereft of hiding places. Their only hope was for Julie to distract the intruder momentarily so that he would have the element of surprise for an attack. Ask who's there, he whispered to her. Hello? Who is there? Julie yelled out in German, still standing inside her bedroom behind the threshold. Silence. Her legs began to quiver. Maybe they had been mistaken, and it was not her front door that they had heard, but the tenant arriving home in the apartment above. If an intruder had entered, he would have had to break down the door. Unless the intruder had picked the lock. Or what if he had killed the building superintendent and had taken her key? She could hear footsteps in the hall. She felt her courage wane, and her feet began to backpedal. She looked at Will, who put his index finger to his lips and raised his hand, holding the scissors in a striking position next to his temple. A woman screamed. Julie's roommate, Isabella, stood in the doorway, her hand pressed against her chest. She exhaled with pursed lips and pulled a pair of white earbuds from her ears. Oh, my God! You scared the hell out of me, Julie. I didn't think anyone was home. I was walking by your room on the way to mine, and out of the corner of my eye I saw someone standing in the doorway. Isabella stammered in English, flavored with an Italian accent. You scared me, too. I thought someone had broken into the apartment. Did you not hear me call out? Julie asked. Isabella pointed to her iPod, peeking out of her front right jeans pocket. Will silently lowered the scissors from the ready position and set them down on the carpet. He shook his head to signal to Julie not to reveal his presence, but she was not looking at him. I thought you and Peter weren't returning from Greece until tomorrow night. Peter's boss called him and said that he needed him to come in because the head chef had taken ill, so we had to fly back early, Isabella explained. Speaking of being home early, shouldn't you be at the lab? Yes, but an old friend called me unexpectedly. He is in Vienna on business, so I agreed to meet with him. Have I met him before? Is it that hot guy from Milano? Julie blushed, embarrassed, and glanced back at Will. Well, no. But she extended her hand toward the half-closed bedroom door. Isabella? Meet Bob. Bob, meet my roommate, Isabella. Will stepped out from behind the door and raised his hand in an awkward half-wave. Hello, I'm Bob, not from Milano. Sorry to disappoint. Um, very nice to meet you, Bob, Isabella stammered. An awkward silence filled the bedroom as they all stood looking at one another. We had better get going, Bob, if you want to make our appointment, Julie said, grabbing Will's sleeve and tugging. I agree. Look at the time. It was nice to meet you, Isabella. Isabella shook Will's hand. Very nice to meet you, too. Maybe we'll see each other again. Julie quickly gathered her computer, her wallet, sunglasses, and the remainder of the printouts from the lab, and stuffed them into the backpack. She gave Will a gentle push toward the door. He walked past Isabella and smiled at her. Isabella raised her eyebrows at Julie and silently mouthed, what is going on? Julie shrugged and gave her friend a devilish grin. Will you be back before dinner? Maybe the three of us can go out tonight for dinner and dancing, Isabella called after her. I wouldn't count on it tonight. Let's plan on dinner tomorrow night instead, okay? Great. Then Peter can join us, Isabella added. Where are you headed off to now? Just going to grab a coffee, Julie replied. 
She then took a step backward and whispered into Isabella's ear, If anyone comes by the flat looking for me, tell them you haven't seen me or talked to me recently, okay? Mm, okay. And don't say anything about Bob. Julie, what's going on? Nothing. Bob and I just need some alone time. Isabella eyed Will suspiciously and then grabbed Julie by the shoulders. Are you sure you're okay? You know I'm here for you if you need me. You can tell me anything. I know. Really, everything is fine, but we need to go. Okay, then. Ciao, Isabella said as she gave her friend a hug. Ciao. Chapter 29 She said her name was Meredith Morley, and that she worked for Virogen. She knew you were with me, Julie said, as she whipped her Opal Astra around a corner so fast that the tires squealed. Her eyes darted right and left, combing the avenue ahead for an open parking spot. An instant later... She slammed on the brakes and jerked the steering wheel to the right, bringing the little sedan to an abrupt halt in an open, angled slip. She turned the car off and immediately dropped her face into her hands. That name is not familiar. What else did she say? Will asked. She said I needed to make a choice between you and my career. What? I don't understand. How did she find us? Isn't it obvious? Bart Bennett at my lab must have contacted her. He was acting really strange after John brought me the test results. Never in a million years would I have thought he was connected to all this. Awfully convenient to be a coincidence, Will said, eyeing her. She looked up at him. What's that supposed to mean? I'm just saying, what are the odds that you're helping me and your buddy Bart happens to be collaborating with Virogen? I didn't rat you out, Will, she said with heat. I'm offended you'd even go there. They sat in silence for several minutes before Julie confessed in a quiet voice, There's something I need to tell you. Virogen owns Vienne Bioscience. Will choked on his own saliva. Coughing, he said, Excuse me? I didn't know that Leighton Harris was owned by Virogen, not until I ran the Internet search back at the apartment. I swear I didn't tell you then because I didn't want to plant a seed of doubt in your mind that would grow and fester the longer we were together. Things were going so smooth between us, I didn't want to poison the well with something that is outside our control. You've been through so much, Will, emotionally, physically, psychologically. I made the unilateral decision at that moment that I would carry this burden for both of us, and that I would tell you when the time was right. And so I'm telling you now. He flashed with anger. Was there no one he could trust? How far would he have to run to escape Virogen's reach? He looked at Julie. Unflinching, she met his gaze. Virogen had given her an ultimatum, and she had made her choice. She'd picked him. His anger ebbed and was replaced by something else. Respect. Gratitude. Adoration? He took a deep breath and grabbed her hand. What next? We need a safe local hideaway with Internet access where we can regroup. How about the Vienna Public Library? After what happened in Prague, I'd prefer to stay away from obvious hot spots like libraries and Internet cafes. I have a different place in mind called The Four Bells. It's a neighborhood Irish pub. She glanced at her watch. 2.14 p.m. It should be completely deserted at this time of day, and I've known the owners and the wait staff for years. We can trust them. Julie led Will inside the pub, and after exchanging pleasantries with the lone waiter-bartender, 
they slid into a semi-circular booth against the wall in the otherwise unoccupied pub. She opened a browser window on her laptop and logged into the Four Bells' free Wi-Fi. Then she turned to Will. We know who is responsible, but we still don't know the why. Is there anything else you haven't told me yet? Anything at all? Yes, he said in a low, solemn voice. The night of my escape, I stole a glass vial filled with a substance they had injected me with during the most recent round of experiments. Do you know what that substance was? Can I see that list of disease antibodies you showed me back in the apartment? She retrieved the printouts from the backpack and handed them to him. He leafed through the pages until he found it. This is it, he said, pointing to the name on the list. Yersinia pestis? You think Virogen intentionally injected you with live plague cultures? I know that they did. Julie's mind started spinning. She had joked about the antibody test results because she had made the logical assumption that Will had been inoculated with vaccines for each of the bugs on the list. Never in a million years would she have imagined the antibodies were from exposure to the live organisms. What you're saying defies logic. You would be dead if you were injected with every pathogen on that list. You said if I had the antibody for the bug, then that meant I had been exposed to the bug. Exposed as in vaccinated. That's what vaccines do. They safely expose your immune system to a specific pathogen so that your immune system can develop antibodies against it. But the pathogen is weakened, dead, or altered in such a way that it is rendered benign. I didn't mean to suggest that you were exposed to the actual live pathogens on this list, but I was. Are you sure that the vial you stole wasn't a Yersinia pestis vaccine? The label you read was probably the vaccine label. I know it wasn't a vaccine, because the vial accidentally broke when I was in Prague. I told you that during our I.M. chat. Remember the two college kids from the youth hostel that I said were sick? Honestly, no, I don't, Will. I'm working off of only two hours' sleep, and my mind is mush right now. Besides, at the time, I thought you were delusional. I don't want to go into the whole story, but the vial of Yersinia pestis smashed on the floor and contaminated two kids who were staying in the same room as me. Twelve hours later, they looked like they were on their deathbeds. I don't know what happened to them, though, because I had to run when some guys showed up at the hostel looking for me. Julie entered a new Google search. Plague plus Prague plus Youth Hostel. The search list populated, and to her astonishment, she saw several relevant hits. She clicked on one with English subtext. Two American tourists died in a Prague-area hospital after contracting a virulent strain of bubonic plague. A local woman, who was also exposed, is in critical but stable condition and expected to survive. Czech Health Administration officials released a statement that the infection resulted from exposure to improperly disposed medical waste and that this isolated incident in no way threatens public safety. She looked at him dumbfounded. Oh, Jesus! His lower lip began to tremble, and he fought back tears. He had been worried about Rutgers and Frankie, and the news that they had died uncorked a geyser of guilt and pain. It's my fault they died. She took his hand in hers. It was an accident, Will. You didn't know what was in the vial. I should have been more careful. It's not like you intentionally infected those boys. He stood in silence and did not answer her. Will, 
I know you're upset about those boys, but it doesn't change the situation we're in right now. I need you to focus. I need you to help me understand why Virogen would inject you with live Yersinia pestis cultures unless they were trying to kill you. Because that's exactly what they were trying to do. Kill you? No, trying to kill me. I was their experiment. They injected me with pathogens and watched to see what happened. How did you survive? Did they give you antibiotics after they infected you? No. Then why didn't the plague kill you? Because my body was somehow able to overcome the infection. He closed his eyes and reminded himself that she had proven her allegiance. It was time to tell her his secret. Julie, in the time we were together, do you ever remember me getting sick? Sure. Don't you remember the time you puked your brains out the morning after your twenty-first birthday? I'm not talking about that sort of thing. Do you ever remember me getting a stomach bug or a cold or food poisoning or athlete's foot or anything like that? Actually, now that you mention it, no, I don't. Even the time that nasty flu had me laid up for days, you didn't catch it. I know. It was the same when I was a kid, too. I won the attendance award every year in school. It was the running joke with all my friends that Will Foster's mom would never give him a sick day. In fact, when I think back on my childhood, I can't remember ever being sick. There's something inside me that's different. Something unique about my immune system. It's the reason I have immunity to all the bugs on your list. It's the why you've been looking for. I don't know what to say, she said. Do you believe me? Of course. It finally all makes sense. The question is, what do we do now? You need to tell me what these are, he said, pointing to the SEM images of his mysterious lymphocyte. I'm an oncology researcher, Will not an immunologist. So? This is out of my league. We need someone with subject matter expertise to look at these. Okay, then let's go see an immunologist. Vienna is a major city. There has to be somebody local we can talk to. Do you know anybody who fits the bill? Yeah, Bart Bennett, Julie thought, but did not say. No, Unfortunately, I don't. All right. Then Google it. You're the search engine guru. She sighed as she turned back to her computer. She entered numerous search criteria, but the one that finally yielded results was Plague plus Immunity plus Vienna plus Research. He leaned in for a closer look at the laptop screen. Dr. Roger Johansson, head professor at the Institute of Microbiology and Genetics, has real potential. His specialty is apparently using genealogy to trace patterns of immunity that develop in populations exposed to pandemics. I don't see what that has to do with me. How can he help us? I don't know if he can, but this is the best option I could find who is local. We need an immunologist, and I found one. Plus, I can't imagine that a guy who studies pandemics and genealogies in Vienna doesn't know volumes about plague. Vienna was practically the Black Death capital of Europe in the Middle Ages. Okay, let's go see Johansson. I like the fact that he works for a university. At least we don't have to worry about him being a Virogen spy. Yeah, Julie said, as she wrote down the professor's office address, phone number, and email address. You never know who might be on Virogen's payroll. 
Hello, we're here to see Dr. Johansson, Julie said to the middle-aged woman, sitting behind an old wooden desk covered with piles of journals, books, and papers. You are, the woman replied, peering over her reading spectacles. My name is Julie, and this is my colleague, Will. We have some microscope images we think the professor will be very interested in seeing. Dr. Johansson never mentioned this to me. Do you have an appointment? No, but I assure you this will only take a few minutes of his time. Dr. Johansson does not see anyone without an appointment. You can leave the images here with me, and if he is interested, he will contact you. Julie looked at Will. He shook his head no. I'm afraid we can't do that. The woman sighed with annoyance. Show me your pictures. Julie retrieved two prints of Will's lymphocytes from her backpack and set them down on the least cluttered area of the desk. The assistant looked carefully over the images. She stood abruptly, carrying one print in each hand. Wait here. Julie nodded and looked at Will. She tried to appear serious, but she could not suppress a smile. She looked back at Johansson's assistant to give her authorization, but the Austrian woman had already disappeared. After what seemed like an eternity, Johansson's assistant returned with a lanky, balding, handsome gentleman of sixty in tow. The assistant handed the images back to Julie. The man greeted them in English, flavored with a Scandinavian accent. Hello. My name is Dr. Roger Johansson. Please follow me. They followed him down a hallway and into his immense office. Have a seat, said Professor Johansson, motioning to a group of vacant chairs set haphazardly around a large round table in the middle of his immense office. The remainder of the room was more reminiscent of an architect's model city than a microbiologist's office, with books and journals rising from the floor in stacks like skyscrapers. Several paths wove between the towers like city streets, the widest of which led to his partially occluded desk, Main Street. This round table is where I hold all of our staff meetings. It is an excellent place for discerning discourse and heated discussion. Very Arthurian, Julie said. Indeed, except instead of Excalibur, in my laboratory, I have one of the world's most powerful, bright, field microscopes. Julie and Will chuckled politely. Your names again, I'm sorry. I'm Julie, and this is my colleague, Will. Julie and Will. Good. You are Americans, no? Yes, we are. Good. I like Americans. Now let us talk about why you were here, shall we? We're here to discuss possibilities, Will began. Johansson laughed, grinning ear to ear. Possibilities! Marvelous! Did you rehearse that opening? Will smiled, uncertain how to respond. Forgive my sense of humor, said Johansson, settling down. Let's take a look at the images together. Of course, Julie said. She retrieved all the pages from her backpack and spread them out across the table. Johansson retrieved a pair of eyeglasses from his shirt breast pocket, put them on, and leaned forward to take a closer look. These are lymphocytes, yes? Yes, except, except, this one is not a classical lymphocyte. Johansson interrupted, pointing with the tail end of his pen at the image. What is this cell here? We don't know, which is exactly why we've come to see you. Johansson scrutinized the pictures in silence while they waited patiently. 
Then he took off his eyeglasses, folded them, and looked up. What else can you tell me? This is interesting, that's for certain, but I can teach you nothing by looking at naked images. When were they taken? Do you have the blood panel that accompanies these? What was the medical condition of the subject? I can think of a thousand questions to ask you, so please, tell me what other information can you provide. These images were obtained using a scanning electron microscope on blood samples taken from a patient who demonstrates an unnatural resistance to infection. In this particular case, the patient had been exposed to live Yersinia pestis bacilli. The sample was drawn seven days after exposure to the pathogen. Excuse me, Johansson replied, practically falling out of his chair. By patient, are you referring to a non-human primate? No. Do you work with UNICEF? No. This patient was encountered during field work of yours? No, laboratory trial. Johansson's face hardened. Young woman, are you playing games with me? Absolutely not. If what you are telling me is true, I should be reporting you to the police, not trying to help you with some sick experiment. This is not my work. This is not my patient. I'm an oncologist, not an immunologist. I came to you because this is way out of my league. When I found your biography on the university website, I thought you might have the expertise necessary to help us. Johansson took a deep breath. What you are telling me is that these images were derived from samples drawn from someone who is not your patient enrolled in an experiment in a laboratory where you do not work, and in a field of study which you have no expertise? Yes. Johansson smiled and looked at Will. What is your role in all of this? Let me guess. You operated the microscope? No, Will said. I'm the patient. The professor looked at Will, then at Julie, and finally back at Will. He slowly and deliberately unfolded his eyeglasses and put them back on. Okay. I think I see what is happening here. What is that? asked Julie. Either you are both lying to me with this fantastic story, for what end I do not know, or you are telling me the truth, and we have a bona fide mystery on our hands. From the look on your faces, I am inclined to believe the latter. Professor Johansson, we come to you now at considerable risk, Will began. We have no one else to turn to, nowhere else to go. There is something inside of me, something that makes me different. I want to understand what that something is. We were hoping that with your help, I might finally be able to get some answers. If you want my help, then you must agree to my conditions. Which are? asked Julie. First... We agree to be completely honest with each other at all times, even if the truth is unpleasant. Second, you must agree that I can include the findings in my immunology research. We will agree to your conditions if you agree to one of ours, Will said. Which is, you agree to maintain complete and absolute secrecy about our identities 
and the nature of this finding. Without question, I will maintain complete confidentiality at all times. You have my word. Then you have mine, Will said. He turned to Julie. And mine, she added. Good. Where shall we begin? asked Will. With a history lesson, Johansson said with a smile. I came to Vienna almost twenty years ago. It was the logical place for me to locate my laboratory, Johansson explained. Why is that? asked Will. Vienna has a rich and fascinating plague history, a dubious distinction in most people's minds, but for my type of work, it's perfect. Geographically, Vienna is centrally located in Europe. The Danube River flows east through the center of the city and stretches 2,800 kilometers from Germany to the Black Sea. Through most of its history, Vienna has been a crossroads in Europe. A crossroads of what? Trade, migration, war, the inevitable mixing and mashing of different peoples from different lands, all converging here, all carrying germs, making Vienna a crossroads for disease as well, resulting in epidemics. You study epidemics, right? Julie asked. Very good. It's true. Vienna suffered many epidemics over the centuries, the most famous of which was the Great Plague of Vienna in 1679. Death estimates from this massive epidemic range from 75,000 to over 100,000. Literally half the population of the city was infected with bubonic plague. What is so fascinating about the 1679 scourge was that it was the result of two converging epidemics, one sweeping east from England and France, and one traveling west from the Ottoman Empire in Turkey. Taken as a whole... The bubonic plague was more than epidemic. It was pandemic, meaning it spread throughout most of the known civilizations of Europe and Asia. Why is that of interest to your research? Will asked. Because I am keenly interested in immunity factors associated with disease epidemics. Bubonic plague is the ideal research candidate because it was common practice for afflicted cities to institute quarantines. In some cases, townships quarantined themselves in entirety to prevent the spread of the disease to neighboring towns. The death tolls in quarantined sectors were horrific. I don't get it. Why do you care about the death tolls in quarantine areas? asked Julie. Good question. The death toll is only useful in the sense that it gives me an indication of the virulence of the particular strain of plague bacterium. What I really care about are the plague survivors, or more specifically, the survivors' progeny. For fifteen years I've been building a genealogical database tracing bloodlines of plague survivors all across Europe. Five hundred years' worth of birth and death records from over sixty towns spread across twelve countries. What do you hope to find? The descendants of plague survivors, of course, Johansson quipped. Not just any descendants. No, I'm looking for descendants who might carry in their DNA specific immunity factors or mutations that allowed their ancestors to survive the plague. Mutations that the living descendants would still carry to this day. What do you do when you find descendants? Will asked. We take DNA and blood samples from them with their permission, of course. Then we analyze the sample for immunity factors, and we enter the individual's DNA profile into my genealogical database. 
like a family tree? Yes, absolutely. Except this is a family tree for DNA. I am proud to say that our lab maintains the world's largest DNA-derived genealogical database focused on epidemiology. We have over half a million entries and counting. Would you like to become a member? When you were talking about adding my results to your research, that is what you were referring to? Will asked. Yes, except based on the images you've shown me, I think we'll be doing much more than just plugging your genome into the database. Are you ready to get started? Yes, I guess so. Very good. Let's start with you telling me about your family history and anything you know about your condition. I am of European descent, English, I think. I am thirty-four years old and an only child. Both my parents have passed away, so I am the only surviving male heir on my father's side of the family. For as long as I can remember, I have never been sick. That is, until I started receiving the injections. Uh, explain what you mean when you say you've never been sick. Just that. From the time I was a kid, I don't remember being sick. My mother used to joke that I repelled germs. My father said that I had my grandpa's famous foster constitution. Foster? Is that your surname? Yes. Why? That name is familiar to me. Did you know my grandfather? No, I don't think so. I need to check my notes. I have interviewed hundreds of people over the years and made thousands of data entries. You're both young. Your minds are still quick. When you get to be my age, you'll find it all begins to blur together. That's why I keep detailed handwritten notes. Then I make the grad students type them into the computer, Johansson said with a mischievous chuckle. Julie laughed. Grad students love grunt work. Don't let their belly aching fool you. The professor picked up his office phone and rang his assistant. Can you please pull any files we have on the surname Foster? from the United Kingdom, and bring them to my office, please? He then turned his attention back to Will. While we wait to see what she finds, let's talk some more about your experience never getting ill. When I was a kid, I never got sick. The other kids caught chicken pox, strep throat, the flu, but not me. Just so I understand... You are saying you have never been ill in your entire life? Not that I can remember, no. Not until they put me in quarantine and started the injections. I don't understand. Who put you in quarantine? What injections? It's a long story. You might want to grab a cup of coffee. Johansson leaned back in his chair and clasped his hands behind his head. I have nothing but time. Please, tell me everything. Chapter 30 This is it, the Ponte woman's apartment, Raymond Zern said to Udo. Do you want me to kick the door in, brother? Udo asked. Eyes glimmering. Battering rams are for barbarians. I am not a barbarian. I'm an artist. Artists are refined, skilled with instruments of their trade, Raymond quipped, retrieving a lock, picking kit from his bag with gloved hands. Thirty seconds later, the door was unlocked. Quiet, elegant, refined. Udo snorted with feigned irritation. The truth was that over the years he had come to enjoy his brother's theatrics. Raymond made him laugh, 
Udo was not a clever man, but being around Raymond made him feel clever by proximity. Besides, Udo knew from experience that the time for barbarism would come soon enough. Then he would have his fun. Raymond pushed the door open to Julie's apartment and stepped across the threshold. He stood erect and perfectly still, like a wolf surveying a stretch of tundra just before a caribou hunt. The clamorous sound of a television commercial emanated from the kitchen. Raymond turned to Udo, motioning him to enter the apartment. Udo followed, and then quietly shut and locked the apartment door. Raymond nodded approvingly at his brother, and then turned toward the sound. With a quick, deliberate stride, he moved toward the kitchen, withdrawing a white handkerchief laced with chloroform from his pocket en route. A tall, slender woman with dark hair stood at the sink counter, her back turned, humming a tune and slicing mushrooms on a cutting board. Raymond wrapped his left arm around her torso, pinning her arms against her sides. With his right hand, he held the handkerchief over her mouth and nose. She gasped, sucking in air through the chemical-laden cloth. Her body tensed and then fell limp in his arms. The paring knife hit the floor with a thud. His strike was so efficient, she never uttered a sound. The world was blurry and bright. Time seemed to be passing in slow motion for Isabella as she struggled to regain consciousness. Her eyelids were heavy, and she very much wanted to go back to sleep, but a voice deep in her mind told her she needed to wake up. She was in danger. From what or from whom, she could not recall. But the last thing she remembered was being deathly afraid. She's waking up. Udo announced. He walked over to Raymond, who had fallen asleep in a chair, and gave him a shake. Adrenaline coursed through Isabella's arteries, counteracting the waning effects of the anesthesia. She tried to move her legs. She could not. She struggled to free her arms. The effort was futile. She was securely bound to a chair by duct tape. Her pulse quickened, and she was surprised to hear herself panting as she writhed in the chair. "'You should save your energy,' Raymond said to Isabella, now standing in front of her. "'You're going to need it.' "'Who are you? What do you want?' Isabella demanded, trying to sound tough. "'It doesn't work that way.' I ask you the questions, not the other way around, he replied, shaking his index finger at her. Yeah, we ask the questions, Fraulein, Udo added. In my experience, everything progresses much more smoothly if I explain all the rules to you before we begin. I don't want any confusion or misunderstanding between us. Raymond walked around behind Isabella and put his hands on her shoulders. Quite simply, this is an interrogation. I am the interrogator, and you are the interrogatee. You have information that I need. If you answer all of my questions truthfully, then you will live... And this will all be over quite swiftly and painlessly. If you do not, then the interrogation will be quite long and painful. Do you understand the rules? Isabella began to tremble. I don't understand why you were doing this. I own a little wine bistro downstairs. She began to stammer. I, I, I don't. "'Understand what you could possibly want from me.' "'I don't think you were listening. "'It is very important that you listen to me. "'I ask the questions. "'You answer truthfully. "'Do you understand? "'These are the rules.' "'Yes, yes, but I have a question.' "'Okay.' 
Raymond replied, exasperated. One question. How do I know that you won't kill me even if I answer your questions? Because, number one, I am a man of my word. Number two, because I am not here to kill you. I am here to gather information. Let us return to the rules one final time. I ask you questions. You answer them truthfully, and you live. If you choose not to answer my questions, or you lie to me, then you will be tortured until your slow and painful death, Raymond expounded. What is your name? Isabella. That was very good, Isabella. You answered the first question truthfully. You are a very nice young woman, Isabella, with a long, happy future ahead of you. If you cooperate, you can return to your wine bistro, and you will never see me or my colleague again. If you do not cooperate, then I can make no such guarantee. Isabella began to sob. She could taste fear in her mouth. Her throat was tight. Her heart pounded. She could not believe this was happening to her. Raymond maintained his station behind her. It was a technique he had developed by accident during an interrogation many years ago. It proved so effective that he had used it ever since. First he found it much easier to be brutal without having to look into the victim's eyes. Second, the victim could not see his face. Pain sears powerful memories in the brain, and he did not want his face to be recalled. But most importantly, standing behind the victim seemed to magnify the terror of the experience more than any other technique he had experimented with. Over the years, he had learned that interrogation was like baking. It worked best when one followed a recipe. His recipe was two parts fear to one part pain. Okay, let's move on, he announced casually. Tell me, where can I find your roommate, Julie Ponty? Um, Julie? Yes, Julie Ponty. Where can I find her? I don't know. Why, what do you want with Julie? Isabella, you have broken the rules. Now I am forced to have my colleague demonstrate what happens every time you break the rules. Raymond reprimanded. Still standing behind her, Raymond grabbed her forehead and her chin and pulled her jaw open. Udo swiftly stuffed a balled-up kitchen rag deep into her mouth. Isabella tried to scream, but the sound was almost completely muffled by the wad of fabric pressing against her tongue, cheeks, and soft palate. Udo then walked around to her left side. With his massive hands, he effortlessly peeled her clenched left fingers free from the end of the armrest. Before she knew what was happening, he gripped her left pinky finger and snapped it like a fresh carrot at the knuckle joint. He released her broken finger at the angle he broke it, protruding ninety degrees to the side for her to see. Isabella shrieked in agony, but the gag in her mouth deadened the volume and pitch of her wail to a level undetectable outside the apartment. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Isabella, I want you to listen very carefully. This is the best that you will feel during the rest of this experience. From now on, it only gets worse. Now, I am going to ask you some questions with the gag in your mouth. You are going to nod your head up and down for yes, and shake your head side to side for no. Nod your head if you understand, said Raymond. Isabella nodded her head, trembling. She stared off into space, averting her gaze away from her left hand. Good girl. I am going to remove the gag from your mouth. If you scream, I will reinsert the gag and break another finger. 
Do you understand? Nod. Are you ready to cooperate? Nod. Good. Let's try again. Where can I find Julie Ponty? asked Raymond. He then motioned to his brother to remove the gag. I don't know where she is. Raymond was silent for several seconds, and then suddenly grabbed her forehead and chin. Udo stuffed the gag back into her mouth. Isabella shook the chair and screamed a muffled scream. He nodded at Udo. Udo gripped her left ring finger in his hand and twisted, snapping the bone between the second and third knuckles. Isabella shook the chair violently as tears gushed down her cheeks. Mucus was beginning to fill her nose and clog her throat. Raymond tenderly stroked her forehead and dark brown hair like a lover would do. Isabella, I am very disappointed in you. You've broken the rules again. This time you lied to me. Look at your fingers! Isabella continued to sob and looked up at the ceiling, resisting the urge to see her mangled left hand. Raymond grabbed her face between both hands and jerked her head down. Look at it, he shouted. The power of his voice dominated her will, and she looked at her left hand, two of her fingers protruding at unnatural, oblique angles. She began to hyperventilate. The rag stuffed in her mouth exacerbated the problem, causing her to panic. The veins in her neck and forehead bulged. Her face flushed red. Raymond sighed. He pulled the rag out of her mouth and waited while she panted in terror, trying to catch her breath, sweat now pouring from her brow. Isabella, Isabella, listen to me. This is not going very well. I'm going to ask you the same question again. This time I want you to tell me the truth, Raymond said to her. Where can I find your roommate, Julie Ponty? Isabella struggled to answer him in between sobs and gasps for air. I told you, I don't know. She left the apartment this morning, and she didn't tell me where she was going. Raymond stood silently behind her. Udo watched Raymond, like a guard dog stares at his master, awaiting the order to attack. I swear, I don't know where she was going. She didn't tell me, and I didn't ask. Okay, I believe you. Was she alone? Or was she with someone? An American man, perhaps? Isabella paused. She had not betrayed Julie, not yet. Now he was forcing her to make a choice, self-preservation or self-sacrifice, to protect a friend. She liked Julie, but she was not family. They had known each other not even two years, these crazy Germans would break all her fingers if she did not cooperate. She was certain of that. She had no choice. She had to look out for herself. She was alone, she said, and could not believe the words as they came out of her mouth. Raymond nodded at Udo, who moved to stuff the rag back into her mouth. Wait, no, you're right. There was an American. He went with her, Isabella blurted. Raymond nodded again, and Udo pressed the gag back into her mouth anyway. Break another finger. She lied to me. She wailed as Udo grabbed her middle finger on her left hand and broke it as he did the others. Isabella, you are beginning to make me very angry. This is not a game. Do you understand? 
Do you understand this is not a game? Raymond shouted in her ear. After giving her a few moments' recovery, Raymond removed the gag. I told you the truth, she stammered. But you lied to me first, he said. That is not a good strategy, Isabella. We are going to run out of fingers soon, and then I have to start breaking bigger bones. Udo snorted happily. He quite enjoyed the middle portion of interrogations, and this one was no exception. The pain in her left hand was unbearable. It was impossible to concentrate on anything else beside the pain. Fear of pain consumed her now. Her will was broken. There was no chance she could persevere against these devils. This American... What was his name? Bob. Julie said his name was Bob, Isabella answered nervously, watching Udo to see if punishment was forthcoming. I believe you are telling the truth. But I believe Julie lied to you. Was he tall? Yes. Was he ill with fever or cough? No, he was not ill, she panted. Not that I could see. How much time did you spend with them? I only returned to Vienna this morning. I arrived at the apartment as they were leaving. I only spent a few minutes with them. What did they say to you before they left? Julie introduced him to me as her American friend who was in Vienna on business. She said they were going out for a coffee. That's all. What else can you tell me? What else can I say? I just met this man for the first time in my life. They left, and I unpacked my luggage. You're hiding something. Tell me now, or my colleague breaks another finger. Sir, there is nothing else to tell, Isabella begged. Raymond nodded at Udo, who gagged Isabella and snapped her left index finger. This time he broke it to the right, opposite the others, a little variety to amuse himself. The intensity of the pain radiating from her broken index finger was more severe than the others and caused her to hyperventilate. Mucus flooded her nose and throat, blocking her airway. Her eyes bulged with panic. Black curtains eclipsed her field of vision. She tried to cough and blow the mucus clear, but it didn't work. The movement of her tongue only made her predicament worse, drawing the rag deeper into her throat. She was suffocating and powerless to stop it. Raymond let her writhe to the brink of unconsciousness before pulling the gag from her mouth. In between lurching gasps for air, she coughed and spat a thick and frothy mucus all over herself. It took several minutes, but eventually she gained control of her breathing and felt her wits returning to her. Her left hand was swelling, and port wine-colored bruises flourished under the skin. Inadvertently, she looked at the mangled hand. The irregular angles of her fingers were grotesque, nauseating. She vomited. A splatter of gastric juices and partially digested food painted Udo's right shoe as he tried to jump out of the way. Angered, he slapped her across the mouth with an open hand. Blood trickled from her lower lip and coated her white teeth with red. You are evil, terrible men, both of you. Devils, she sobbed. Raymond smoothly caressed her hair again which was now saturated with sweat. Isabella, you are a very brave, very strong woman. But it's time you stop this foolishness. What did Julie say to you when she left? 
What are you hiding from me? Isabella sobbed and did not answer. Raymond waited for a moment and repeated the question. In between sobs, she said, She told me if anyone came by the flat looking for her, to tell them that I had not seen her recently. Good. Very good, Isabella. What else did she say? Only that she needed some time alone with him. Did she say where she was going? No. Did they take luggage with them? Like they were going on a trip? No, only a backpack. Raymond rubbed his chin thoughtfully. I believe you are telling me the truth at last. I have only one more question before we go. Where can I find a picture of Julie? Isabella trembled. You know the answer to that question. I suppose I do. But I want you to tell me anyway. So you remember betraying your friend. Look in her bedroom. You'll find pictures of her there, she mumbled, her head down. Raymond wandered out of the kitchen and found Julie's bedroom. He walked over and stood by the window. He checked the signal strength on his mobile phone and dialed Stefan. We're at Ponty's apartment, but she's not here. Do you have any ideas how we can locate her? Give me a little time and I'll find Ponty for you. I'll have my contact at Orange Telecom look up Ponty's mobile number and ping her phone. With three towers pinging, we can easily narrow her position within a fifty-meter radius. But remember, Raymond, we pay five hundred euros per ping. So I hope we're making a big fee on this job, Stefan replied. Raymond smirked. Don't worry about the fee. I've got that covered. You just worry about finding Ponty. Text me when you get the first triangulation. Yeah, okay. Raymond ended the call and walked over to Julie's dresser. Neatly arranged in three rows stood a variety of pictures, each mounted in a unique frame that complemented the mood and color palette of the photograph. His eyes darted from one image to the next as he methodically dissected her features, burning her face into his memory. A serendipitous encounter on the sidewalk, a backward glance in a crowd, or a glimpse in a passing car window, no matter how fleeting the opportunity, he would be ready. After several minutes, he chose a picture for the taking. Careful not to knock over any of the others, he selected a picture of Julie and Isabella hugging each other, laughing, and wearing silly cone-shaped birthday hats. He walked back into the kitchen and showed the picture to Isabella. Remember this moment, because you may never see your friend again, Raymond taunted, showing her the picture. Isabella began to sob. Are you going to kill me now? I told you, we are not killers, and I am a man of my word. You cooperated, eventually. So you will live, Raymond said. He then looked at Udo. Let's go. Disappointed that the interrogation session was over, Udo let out an angry grunt and then turned and shuffled toward the door. Raymond followed behind in silence, waving goodbye to Isabella casually over his shoulder. Aren't you going to untie me? she called out after him. Raymond laughed. Brother, please go untie our little Fraulein. Udo turned and walked back into the kitchen. With the flick of his thumb, he opened a stainless steel pocket knife and cut free the duct tape that bound Isabella's mangled left hand to the chair, leaving her other limbs held fast. 
There, you are free, Udo said to her. Now we really must be going. We have a date with Fräulein Ponty, and we don't want to be late. Chapter 31 Professor Johansen shook his head in disbelief. What Virogen did to you violates the Hippocratic Oath. It makes me ill. It is like a war crime. Only you were not a soldier of any war. I think we may be dealing with a different kind of war, Professor, but a war nonetheless. A war between powerful multinational corporations fighting to bring the next blockbuster drug to market first. Will is an early civilian casualty of this war, Julie said. If what you are telling me is true, then I would agree. Please, Will, if you don't mind, tell me what happened after the injections. After the first several rounds of injections, nothing happened. Then six weeks became twelve weeks, and the injections became much stronger. I started to become sick. I think they were ramping up the virulence factor on what they were giving me. You know, trying to find my body's limit. They probably started with the common cold and ended with Yersinia pestis. But no matter how hard those bastards tried, they couldn't break me. I always recovered. Johansen was dumbfounded. The irony of the situation was profound. He had dedicated his entire career to researching the role of immunity mutations in bubonic plague pandemics, and now, seated in front of him, was a man who appeared to possess the very genetic mutation he had theorized to exist. To discover and decode such a mutation could mean a universal cure for all disease, except where he would offer the panacea to the world for free. Virogen wanted to pirate it, control it, make it exclusively their own. They would chop it up and sell a hundred variants to remedy a hundred different afflictions to maximize their profits. But Will Foster had abandoned Virogen, and in doing so, stumbled upon him. Fate, it seemed, did have a sense of humor. Professor, I have the Foster files you requested, Johansson's assistant said, standing in the doorway to his office. Thank you. You can set the box on the table. She did as he requested, looked at Will and Julie curiously, and then left the office without another word. Johansson picked up the Foster records and paged through them for a minute in silence. Ah, yes. Now I remember, Johansson said with a fine, nostalgic tone to his voice. This case dates back almost twenty years ago. It was one of my earlier investigations, only a few years after I decided to keep a genealogical database of epidemic survivors. As you can see, I used to store information in cardboard boxes. The professor gently parsed through the contents of the tattered box with a smile on his face. He retrieved a small leather-bound book and smiled broadly as he set it on the table. I was looking for germs, and I found a love story instead. What do you mean, Professor? Julie asked. This is a diary. It chronicles the hopes, dreams, and fears of a young woman who lived in I Am England during the infamous plague epidemic of 1665. I went to England specifically to research I Am. It's quite a famous little town in epidemiological circles, because it has such a unique plague saga. Johansen stroked the closed cover of the diary and leaned back in his chair, getting comfortable. Julie looked at Will and smiled. The atmosphere in the office had softened considerably. Johansen's story was something they all could use. 
The story goes that in 1665, the town's tailor ordered some fine fabrics from London. Unbeknownst to him and to the rest of the town's residents, the fabric that was delivered was infested with fleas, and the fleas were carrying the plague bacteria, Yersinia pestis. You see, at that time, London was suffering from recurring plague outbreaks. When the tailor opened his package, he released the infected fleas, and he was bitten. The tailor became infected, and so did many others as the disease quickly spread through the town. Recognizing the severity of the outbreak, the town rector convinced the elders to do a most unprecedented thing. They enacted a mandatory quarantine of all the town's residents. Why did they do that? Sounds like suicide to me, Will said. In one sense, you're right. For the people of Iam, it was a death sentence. But in another sense, the town leaders demonstrated both wisdom and compassion. By instituting the quarantine in Iam, they prevented the plague from spreading to all the surrounding villages. The sacrifice of the few saved the lives of the many. Utilitarianism, Will mumbled. Yes, I suppose that's one view. You could also call it altruism. I think it would be altruism if everyone in the town had been given a choice, and they all came to the same conclusion as the elders. A mandate like that is a different story in my book. Don't get me wrong. I think what they did was noble, but at the end of the day... Who really has the power to decide when some people's lives should be sacrificed for the greater good, and when they should not? Philosophers have debated the question for a thousand years, and here we are still discussing it today. It hits pretty close to home for me, because some rich executive decided to put me in quarantine under the auspice of serving the greater good, and I didn't have any choice in the matter? I definitely can relate to the people who lived in Iam. Johansen chuckled. Maybe more than you know. The professor slid the leather-bound diary across the table to Will. Be gentle with that. It's almost four hundred years old. Where did you get this? In a souvenir shop in Iam. It was one of the most expensive items in the shop. I paid two hundred pounds for that over twenty years ago. Imagine what it would fetch today. Will opened the cover and gingerly began turning the pages. Whose diary was this? It belonged to the tailor's daughter, Catherine Vickers, who married and became Catherine Foster. She lived in Iam when the plague hit. Will eyed the professor with curiosity. What happened to her? She became infected, and she died. And her family? Did they all die, too? No, not all. Catherine's father, the tailor, was the first to die, but Catherine eloped with her young lover, Paul Foster. Together they avoided infection during the first outbreak in the fall of 1665. Months later, the couple returned to Iam, only to find the town infested with plague. They decided to live at the Foster family farm. Catherine became pregnant and birthed a son, George. Sadly, there was a resurgence of the plague that lasted almost all of 1666. Catherine fell ill and died in August of that year. When the plague had finally run its course, only twenty percent of Iam's population remained. The story is all inside. The pages of the diary are laden with emotion, pain, sorrow, suffering, love, joy, 
New Beginnings. I read it cover to cover. It could be made into a movie. And Paul Foster? He lived because he was immune? Yes, and so did the son, George Foster, Johansson said. He grinned at Will. Now, I suspect the answer to my quest may be sitting at this table. I tried to trace the Foster lineage to the present, but the line went cold in the mid-1700s. Maybe that is because one of your ancestors sneaked across the pond and became a Yank without telling anyone. That would be incredible if it were true. I can propose one surefire way to find out, Johansson said with a raised eyebrow. Take a sample of my DNA? Yes. Will looked at Julie, who was beaming. Absolutely. Do it, Will. This is what you were hoping for. Answers to what makes you special. Will rubbed his chin and then said, First, let me ask you one more question. If you had to come up with a theory about why my immune system is impervious to disease, what would you say? Johansson laughed and then replied, I can't answer that question without conducting years of research. It's the very question I've dedicated my professional career to. If I knew the answer, I would retire tomorrow. But if you had to guess? Let's say the Nobel Committee told you to forward your hypothesis today, or they would never listen to you again, Will pressed. That sounds like the Nobel Committee all right, Johansson laughed. Since you are being very persistent, I will tell you my theory. Understand, however, I have no conclusive evidence to support this idea. It is only a theory. No problem. I speculate that you have a genetic mutation passed down from Paul Foster via your paternal lineage— which is responsible for the unusual lymphocyte in your pictures. I have postulated for several years now that, theoretically, a skeleton key lymphocyte could exist. Skeleton key lymphocyte? Julie questioned. Let me explain. T cells and B cells are specific, meaning a single lymphocyte has receptors that can bind only to a particular antigen. Think of this as a lock and key system. A single key fits a single lock. Now imagine a mutation where a lymphocyte could bind to a variety of antigens expressed by a variety of pathogens. Instead of being effective against only one specific type of pathogen— a skeleton key lymphocyte could mount a defense against many different pathogens, just as a skeleton key can work on many different locks. Such a mutation would bestow upon its owner an extremely efficient immune response. How can we determine if Will has this skeleton key mutation? I know only one way to do that, my dear, and it's the hard way. Research. Lots and lots of research, Johansson laughed. But let's start with the DNA test to confirm Will's ancestry first, shall we? How long will that take? I can draw the blood sample in the lab now, but the analysis will take some time. I should have a preliminary answer within a couple of days. I would also like to draw additional vials of blood to begin an analysis on that mystery lymphocyte of yours. Are you opposed to that? Johansson asked. Will looked at Julie. We're going to need some assurances from you and the university before we tread down that path, she said. Of course, Professor Johansson replied. Then he took Will's hand between both of his and squeezed, while looking Will in the eyes. Please understand, 
I might be a man of science, but I am also a man of conscience. I'm morally opposed to the patenting of genes. I maintain the belief that your genome is your property. I have no more right to patent it for my own personal gain than I do the right to pilfer the contents of your wallet. Virogen tried to exploit you, make you the Henrietta Lacks of our time, but I assure you that will never happen here. I sign a written contract with every research subject in my genealogy study, waiving any and all patent rights to genes discovered while conducting my research. The university doesn't always like it, but I've made it a condition of my employment. Gene patents? Henrietta Lacks? He turned to Julie again. What is he talking about, Julie? Medical practitioners and medical researchers have always been joined at the hip, but with the advent of modern genetics, we've become strange bedfellows, Julie said. It all started in the early 1950s with an American woman named Henrietta Lacks. She was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cervical cancer. She was treated at Johns Hopkins. For diagnostic purposes, her doctor ordered a tissue biopsy of her cervix. A scientist in the culture lab by the name of George Guy noticed that lax cancer cells did not die off in the culture dish like normal cells did. Instead, they survived and multiplied unfettered. He dubbed these resilient cells HeLa cells, borrowing the first two letters from Henrietta and Lax. As a scientist, Guy realized that these immortal cells would be invaluable to the field of medical research, so he cultured a HeLa cell line for this express purpose. This did nothing, of course, to help cure poor Henrietta of her cancer, but it did lay the foundation for sixty years of groundbreaking research based on her cells. How do you know all this? Will asked. I'm an oncology researcher, Will. I've been using HeLa cells my entire career. Every man, woman, and child on this planet owes Henrietta Lacks a debt of gratitude. Without HeLa cells, modern medicine would not be where it is today. Vaccine creation, cancer research, pharmaceutical drug development, our understanding of infectious diseases like HIV and influenza— all these things rely on the use of HeLa cells, she said. Then, exhaling slowly, she added, But there's more to it than that. In recent years, Henrietta Lacks has become the poster child for biomedical exploitation. Why? Because the HeLa cell line was cultured, patented, and commercialized without her knowledge or consent. Moreover, her family was kept in the dark and never financially compensated or paid a royalty from the subsequent profits. I think the point Professor Johansson was making is that if your mutation turns out to be the miraculous discovery we all think it is, then you and Henrietta Lacks would be kindred spirits, genetically exceptional and thus exploited for both patent and profit. Will narrowed his eyes. Are you saying that Virogen could patent my genes and make millions of dollars from my immunity mutation simply because they happened to stumble across it first? Billions of dollars, Johansson said, beating Julie to the punch. And yes... The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has been granting patents on genes since the Supreme Court case of Diamond v. Chakrabarti in 1980. A recent study estimated that approximately 20% of the human genome has already been patented. It is disgusting. Patent holders are granted a virtual monopoly on applications associated with their patented genes.
a practice that not only undermines scientific freedom and the collegial exchange of information, but also jeopardizes each and every person's right to have free access to and use of the information encoded in their own DNA. So Virogen has already won, Will said, his eyes cast down. Once they patent my mutation, they control everything. Not necessarily, Johansson replied. Then, with a sly grin, he added, I would never presume to tell you what to do in a scenario as extraordinary as yours. I can, however, tell you what I would do if our stations were reversed. And what would you do? I would publish my genome on the Internet for the entire world to see. It would be my gift to humanity, said Johansson. And it would make life hell for Virogen, Julie added. If Dr. Johansson can identify the genes responsible for your mutation and make a public disclosure before Virogen, then you win and Virogen loses. Johansson nodded. The irony of trying to sell something which is priceless is that one should never try to sell it to begin with. Will nodded, contemplating his words. Thank you, Professor, for everything. Don't thank me yet. We're just starting this race, said Johansson, shaking Will's hand. You've done plenty already. You've given me hope. Johansson smiled and looked down, almost embarrassed. He liked Will Foster. It took great courage to do what he was doing, especially considering the ordeal he had been through with Virogen, and great courage was hard to find in people these days. This, Johansson said, taking the diary off the table and handing it to Will, should belong to you. I think you will find the story to be inspirational. I couldn't, Will stammered. Don't be ridiculous. The words on these pages are no more mine to possess than the information encoded in your DNA. I'm just along for the ride. Please take it. Meet Catherine Foster. Meet her husband, Paul, and their son, George. Know what it was like to be a Foster in 1665. Will nodded and took the diary in his hands. He gently opened the worn leather cover and paged to where a black silk ribbon page divider rested and read a short entry. May 27th, 1666 Dearest diary, at length the day has come on which I am a mother. My tears flow as I write at the idea for I am both full of joy and wrought with fear at the prospect. My dearest Paul and Mother Alice have been steadfast at my bedside since the labor, and they chasten me for talking nonsense whenever I speak of my fears. Little George is so fair, but Alice says he is of nice color. To my eyes, his likeness is that of Paul. But Paul, of course, says the opposite, that he is wholly a reflection of me. It is no matter, because all in the family agree that nary have they seen a child so handsome, pleasant, and hungry as George. I have placed a cutting of his hair inside the crease of this page, so that I might never forget how soft and fair he was on this, the day of his birth. As I look upon my son, asleep at my bosom, I think that there is nary a child in the world, perhaps one in one hundred generations, as perfect as he. I pray that the plague never finds him, and that God grants me the good fortune to be able to love him for a thousand, thousand tomorrows. Chapter 32 Boston, Massachusetts He gazed upon the length of her long, 
arched, naked back. Her skin was the color of cream and smelled of lavender and honey. Caramel freckles accented her shoulders, and together with her rich auburn locks, dutifully honored her Irish lineage. Starting at the nape of her neck, like a running bead of water, he ran his fingertip over her trapezius muscle, and then along the arc of her protruding angular shoulder blade. Inward next, his touch danced across the plane of her latissimus dorsi, toward the middle of her back. Then downward, he surfed along her spine, and through a herringbone stream of delicate white-blonde peach fuzz that covered the small of her back. She purred, almost inaudibly, with delight. His caress terminated, finally, at a tiny indentation at the junction of her tailbone and bare, exposed buttocks. In this spot, he deposited a single, gentle kiss— before retracing the same path upward to its origin with more kisses. You paint me with your touch. This must be how the stones of the Sistine Chapel felt beneath Michelangelo's brush, Meredith mused. Michelangelo considered himself a sculptor first and foremost. Painting was conscription labor for the Pope. Forget about the brush. If you were made of stone, which we can debate later, you would be my David. But hewn as Michelangelo should have hewn it. As a woman, Nicolora replied, his voice baritone and seductive. Meredith rolled to her side and inched toward him. He drifted onto his back, propping himself up slightly, and then extended his arm outward to cradle her. She nuzzled close, pressing her right breast softly against his bare chest, and depositing her cheek in the comfortable depression between his shoulder and pectoral muscle. "'You've been a naughty boy, Robert,' she whispered. "'Very naughty.' And you've been a naughty girl, Meredith, especially about thirty minutes ago. Don't be cheeky. You know what I'm talking about, she mewed. After a pause, he said, If you're referring to Countess Carlyle, then you should consider the discussion tabled, because I have nothing to say on the matter. I'm not talking about another woman, you stupid lout. I'm talking about you sending your minions to spy on me. Then, punctuating each word with a bite, she moved her mouth across the span of his chest and said, I don't appreciate that. I'm sure, he said, devoting considerable effort not to flinch with each new and painful nibble, that I have no idea what you're talking about. Meredith sat up abruptly, facing him, chest puffing, face flushed, nipples erect. Don't play coy with me, Robert Nicolora. I know it was you. He did not answer, nor did he look her in the eyes, but rather let his gaze linger on her nakedness. Oh, you men are so pathetic, she huffed, as she turned abruptly to exit the bed. He caught her by her trailing arm before she was completely off the mattress and pulled her forcefully on top of him. Now wait a minute, Meredith. Don't do that, he implored. I did not mean to offend. Let go of me, you wretch. I never should have come to you. She squirmed to free herself from his iron grip. And I never should have trusted you. He held her tight. After a half-hearted struggle, she collapsed onto him. 
The team is making steady progress on locating Foster. But this is not an ordinary assignment. You've handed me a hornet's nest, Meredith, and I'm trying to manage it without getting stung, he said, his Eastern European accent emerging, charged by the emotion she had ignited in him. I know. It's just that I'm anxious, Robert. We have to find Foster soon, before more innocent people get hurt by him, she mumbled, her face pressed tight against his chest. I know we do. They laid together in silence for several minutes, and then he said, I have concerns, Meredith. Like what? First... Why did you keep Foster in-house? Why didn't you hand him over to the CDC or a proper hospital for quarantine and treatment? It seems a tremendous liability for you and for your company to accept for the sake of one man in a vaccine trial. Meredith grinned unfettered, knowing her face was hidden, buried against his chest. It had required one of her best theatrical performances, but she had finally managed to win the upper hand. Do you think I'm heartless, Robert? Those bureaucrats would have argued over treatment protocols, insurance coverage, public safety, and God knows what other red tape for weeks. Meanwhile... Poor Will would have been dying inside a giant inflatable Ziploc bag. Someone had to act. Someone had to do the responsible thing. I felt I had a duty to try to help him, using any and all means at my disposal. What about Virogen's miracle product? Why would you offer something so experimental to him? If you were in his shoes, staring death in the face, wouldn't you take it? Even if it's a long shot, it's better than doing nothing at all, she said, avoiding the heart of his question. Yes, I suppose you're right. He paused and then added, Something else I don't understand is what makes you suspect that Foster is the mastermind behind the espionage. We've performed a thorough investigation and background assessment on Foster, and to be perfectly blunt, the piece does not fit the puzzle. He was an advertising exec, not even a very good one, I might add. Yes, he was down on his luck— but we found nothing in his profile to suggest that he's capable of contemplating something of this magnitude, let alone capable of orchestrating it. Seriously, Meredith, we are perplexed. Foster has a bachelor's degree in economics, a non-technical background with no experience in microbiology. He has no criminal record, no apparent ties to the pharmaceutical industry whatsoever. Your logic of implicating him escapes us. Her mind raced. He had brought up several points she had not considered before she briefed the team. She needed time to think of a proper rebuttal. He was horsing her into a corner. She decided to snarl at him and see if he backed down. He did steal the formula and sabotage the lab. That much is fact, Robert. Whether Foster is the mastermind of the plot is a separate matter. Let me remind you that I've never claimed to have the answers to this case. In fact, I've made it quite clear that my theories were only conjecture based on my extremely limited experience in such matters— and that I am relying on your expertise to unravel the case. That's why I hired you. I should have never opened my mouth about Foster's role in the espionage, because I set your team looking down a path that may not be the true path. I know. I know. I'm sorry I'm pressing you, but it's only because you are the person closest to the heart of the case. 
He squeezed her affectionately. One more question? Her stomach churned. Of course. If we pursue the line of reasoning that Foster is not the mastermind behind the espionage, then we must assign a different role to him. Our hypothesis is that Foster was simply a mule to steal and deliver your intellectual property to a buyer. Okay, but where is the question, Robert? She laughed awkwardly. Yes, yes, I'm getting there, he said. Now, assuming Foster is a mule, we can say with confidence that no mule works alone. So this begs the question, who is Foster in collusion with? One of our competitors, no doubt. Yes, that was our initial inclination as well. However, shaking this tree has yielded no fruit. We can find no external connection, relationship, or even record of communication between Foster and persons of interest in the pharmaceutical industry. Really, that's surprising. Maybe your team needs to broaden their search, she said. He shook his head. No, no, certainly not. Our investigative capability is unrivaled. If a connection existed, my people would have sniffed it out. This leaves us only one place left to look. We have turned our investigation inward. Inward? Yes, inward. The logical hypothesis is that Foster is colluding with someone inside Virogen. Only an insider would know about the experimental product. Only an insider would know about the H1N1 vaccine trial. Only an insider would have access to Foster while he was in quarantine. He hugged her again. Tight. Her heart pounded. Goose flesh stood up on her arms. Her mouth went dry. He was squeezing her, literally and figuratively. Her mind stumbled over itself. She grasped for something to say, anything. No words would come. Her mouth was a black hole, agape and devoid of all sound, and all potential for sound. Robert, I, she stuttered, I can't imagine that someone on my staff would... She stopped abruptly. The taut corners of her mouth curled into a wicked grin. He had opened a door for her. Not the exit she had expected, but an exit nonetheless from her burning house of cards. Actually, there is one person who is capable of such a thing. Yes? Yes. His name is Xavier Pope. Stop looking at me that way, Nicolora said to Briggs from across the white tablecloth and over the Art Deco stemware. What way? You know exactly what way. Now wipe that smug look off your face and eat your damn soup. Briggs lowered his spoon and raised the napkin from his lap to wipe his mouth. It's not smugness. It's lobster bisque, he said. You look flushed, Robert. Did you have to run to lunch? Is that why you were late? I was working, Nicolora said, suppressing a smile. Gathering intelligence. Is that what we're calling it these days? I'll have to remember that for my expense reports. Briggs dropped his hands into his lap. They still haven't found Foster, have they? No. Do you know where he is? No. Does Meredith? No. Briggs grunted and turned back to his soup. He was about to press Nicolora about his one-time flame, but he had danced that dance enough times to know better. Best to keep quiet and let his friend talk. Don't ask, 
Nicolora said. I didn't say anything. You were thinking it. I can see it in your beady little eyes. I've never asked you about it before, and I see no reason this meal has to be any different. Underneath that cover-girl facade and flowing mane of auburn hair is a deeply competitive and focused woman. I find her to be, in a word, irresistible. I know. You weren't there, Jack. Briggs laughed. I know. But I dined with the two of you in Boston several times. Twice. Fine. Twice. But even then she had you by the Briggs cupped his hands explicitly, finishing the sentence. I have things under control. Do you trust her? Absolutely not, Nicolora said without pause. Do you think this is her deal, or is someone else pulling the strings? That is the question, isn't it? On the one hand, Meredith is certainly capable of something like this on her own. On the other, I can't shake the feeling that this goes higher up. It just has the stink of Client One all over it. She's implicated Xavier Pope as the mastermind. With CDC involvement, we can't rule it out. What do you think Uncle Sam would be willing to pay for soldiers with absolute immunity to biological warfare agents? Briggs nodded as he stuffed half a dinner roll slathered in white cream butter into his mouth. If you're right, Briggs mumbled over the food in his mouth, it won't be long until agency boys start showing up. I know, I know. I'm surprised she's had this long to clean up her mess. Patience has never been one of their defining characteristics. It's going to be the devil's circus if that happens. We need to have a contingency plan in place. I'm working on it. By the way, take it easy on the butter there, Chief. We don't want to have to roto-root your arteries again any time soon. Peck, peck, mother hen. Briggs quipped. Then, rubbing his chin, he asked, When we finally do locate Foster, you're not really going to turn him over to her? I haven't decided. But one thing is certain. Foster is too valuable for us to let him slip away into the night. Chapter 33 the obsidian-colored V-12-powered BMW 760LI sedan glided across the Austrian countryside effortlessly at 130 kilometers per hour. Somewhere, many kilometers ahead, Kalin was rocketing past Porsches and BMWs on his Ducati Diavel. A.J. had never ridden a real motorcycle, only his scooter. He had asked Kalin what the allure of the Ducati was, fully expecting to hear a soliloquy on the exhilaration of wrangling raw power or the rush of adrenaline from catapulting oneself from a standstill to a ludicrous velocity in a heartbeat. Instead, what he got was a nasal snort. If you have to ask, then you'll never get it, kid. Wearily. A.J. glanced at his watch. "'What is our E.T.A. in Vienna?' he asked the driver. "'Approximately forty-five minutes, sir.' He reclined his head against the headrest. He had not slept since they had arrived in Prague, and he was losing the battle against unconsciousness. In the rear passenger's seat to his left sat Alban. She looked at him, studying him in profile." Tired? she asked. Tired would be an understatement, he mumbled. Here, take this, she said, handing him a white pill. The surface of the caplet was etched with the words, Provigil, two hundred milligrams. What's Provigil? In our line of work, 
That's salvation in a pill. We all do it. It's not a stimulant. Rather, a class of drug called a wakefulness agent. The military has been using it with soldiers and pilots for years. I was wondering why I was the only one who seemed to be dragging like a jet-lagged zombie. He popped the pill in his mouth and washed it down with a swallow of lukewarm bottled water. Alban smiled at him, but her eyes showed a hint of melancholy, as if to say, Another chemical convert, and I'm his maker. She pressed zero on her phone and summoned a coordinator. After several minutes of rapid-fire dialogue with C. Remy, she ended the call and grabbed her tablet computer. The screen sprang to life. Images and files downloaded on command from the think tank servers. What's going on? A.J. asked her. She turned the tablet screen to show him. Okay, I'll bite. Who is he? he asked, staring at the picture of a handsome gentleman in his mid-thirties on the screen. His name is Xavier Pope. Meredith mentioned him in her brief. He's the heavy hitter from the CDC, right? Yes, but she didn't tell us the whole story. Pope was at CDC, but then four months ago we suddenly left and went to work for Virogen Pharmaceuticals, Van Cleve said from the front seat. Precisely. Here is Pope photographed at a black tie benefit dinner with Meredith Morley standing to his left, and the CEO of Virogen to his right, along with some other VIPs. This picture was published with an article from the New York Times and was taken ten days before Virogen announced Pope as their new director of the Immunological Therapeutics Division. But that's not all. Are you ready for the bomb? Hit me. According to Founder One, Meredith has just implicated Xavier Pope as a possible mole trying to steal Virogen's breakthrough research, she said. Unlikely in my opinion, A.J. said. Unless... Go on. It's a stupid idea. A total conspiracy red herring. In my experience, even suppositions we second-guess are still worthy of consideration. Tell me. I was going to say that seems highly unlikely unless Pope never really stopped working for the government. Maybe the military wants to get his hands on Virogen's research, and Pope's connection with the CDC made him the perfect mole. If Meredith is telling the truth, that's one plausible explanation. Interesting theory, but we know Meredith has been hiding things from us. Implicating Pope could also be a ruse especially if she suspects we were behind the Chiaric Norse surprise inspection. If I were in her position, I'd be getting nervous. We could question him, A.J. said. Not a bad idea, she said, pondering for a moment. Then she shook her head. Right now, pursuing the Julie Ponty lead is our number one priority. We'll keep Pope on the back burner. If we don't find Foster with Ponty, then what? Alban pulled up a map of Vienna on her tablet. A.J. saw two dots, one static, one moving. She selected the two dots. Then, using a swiping motion with her finger, she connected them with a line. A pop-up window appeared with data. Kalen is only ten kilometers from Ponty's apartment now. Keep your fingers crossed, and hopefully we won't have to worry about a plan B. Chapter 34 K. Immel, 
R.S. Physical. Social, this is Physical. I'm standing outside Ponty's apartment, and we've got a problem. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. I'm listening. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Ponty wasn't here, but her roommate, Isabella, was. Unfortunately for Isabella, a goon squad got her before I did, and they broke every finger on her left hand. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Interrogation? K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Roger that. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Will she talk to you? K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Yes, she's been very helpful. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. What alias did you use? K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Special Agent Nelson. I told her I was with Justice. She bought it. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Good. Was she able to ID her torturers for you? K. Immel, R.S. Physical. No, just physical descriptions. Two men, one with a shaved head, thirties or forties, of Austrian or German nationality. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Okay, make a report to Founder One and have a coordinator open a file. This changes things. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. I know. We've got another player, someone local from the sound of it. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Did you call an ambulance for the roommate? K. Immel, R.S. Physical. No, her injuries were painful, but not life-threatening. I paid for a taxi and sent her to the ER. I'll meet you in the nest in fifteen, and we can finish debriefing then. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Roger. Social out. So the roommate confirmed that Foster is with Ponty, Alban asked Kalin as he walked in the door of their Vienna hotel suite. Yes, they were in the apartment when she arrived midday, but then left in a rush. She had no idea where they were going, but said that Ponty seemed very nervous, Kalin said. What about the thugs that tortured her? What's their story? They showed up several hours later, picked the lock, and chloroformed her. When she woke up, she was strapped in a chair. They broke all the fingers on her left hand, questioning her about Ponty and Foster. She said she told them everything she told me. They left her bound to a chair in the kitchen. If I hadn't shown up, she might have been trapped for days. It would have been real ugly. Alban pursed her lips. Not exactly the scenario we were hoping for, but it's progress. We've confirmed Foster is with Ponty. Now it's a matter of chasing them. Kalin smiled. What's so funny? Alban asked. Do you know what the problem is with chasing chickens? Kalin said. Van Cleve, who was sitting at the table between Alban and A.J., looked up. Excuse me, he said, cocking an eyebrow at Kalin. The problem with chasing chickens is that they're damn near impossible to catch. Have you ever tried to catch a chicken, Van Cleve? Are you speaking allegorically, Kalin, or are you talking about the actual bird? I don't recall you ever using a metaphor before. Kalin winked at Van Cleve and continued. When I was a kid, I spent one summer working on my grandfather's farm. One of my chores was to replace some rotting wooden slats in the fence around the chicken coop. I made so many trips in and out of the chicken coop that one time I forgot to latch the door and a hen got out. This story is relevant because... Van Cleve moaned. I chased that damn hen around for hours. I tried sprinting after her, sneaking up on her, dive-bombing her. Hell, I even tried to chase her into a shed. I never could catch her. Chickens are just too fast. They always stay three paces ahead of you. What did you do? A.J. asked. I stopped chasing it. You gave up? No. 
I just realized that I was never going to catch that chicken by chasing it all over the farm. To catch it, I had to outwit it. To do that, I had to figure out what is important to a chicken. What motivates a hen? Not getting plucked is what matters to a chicken, Van Cleve said. I could have told you that. Very insightful, Eugene. But I don't think chickens possess that kind of foresight, Alban quipped. A.J. looked at Alban and mouthed, Eugene, silently, with a schoolboy grin across his face. She smiled impishly. Anyway, as I was saying, Kalin continued, I realized that the only thing that motivates a chicken is chicken food. So I laid a trail of kernels along the ground, leading to a pile of feed under an old milk bottle crate that I propped up on one side with a stick. I tied a ten-foot length of string to the stick and hit around the corner. Then I waited. The hen pecked its way along the ground, following the feed trail all the way into the crate, and then, wham, I pulled the stick out. That was that. Captive chicken, game over. The point I'm trying to make here is I'm tired of chasing chickens. Interesting analogy, said Alban. What sort of trap are you suggesting for Foster? That's for you guys to figure out. You're the brains of this operation. I'm the biceps, Kalin said, propping his feet up on an ottoman and clasping his hands behind his neck. I know chickens want chicken feed, but I have no idea what Foster wants. Alban closed her eyes. If a man is drowning, she said to the ether, then throw him a rope, A.J. answered. Exactly, she said with a smile. We're going to offer Foster the one thing that nobody has offered him yet. Which is, asked Van Cleve, a way out. Why would Foster deal with us? He doesn't know us. He'll presume it's a trap, Van Cleve argued. Yes, but why does a rabbit leave the safety of its burrow even when it knows the fox is nearby? Because sometimes it has to. Because the allure of a carrot can overwhelm the fear of the fox. She grabbed a piece of paper, jotted four short sentences down, and handed it to Van Cleve. That's what we're going to tell Foster? Yes, she replied. Kalin swiped the paper from Van Cleve's hand and read it. This could be more fun than Chiarek Norse, he beamed. Time to play SMS poker, she said. Van Cleve, do we have Julie Ponty's mobile number? Of course. Can you please text her that message? Kalin handed the paper back to Van Cleve, who then composed the text message on his phone. After double-checking his work, he pressed the send button and transmitted Alban's carefully crafted words to Julie Ponty's mobile. To Will Foster We know about Virogen. We're here to help. We can get you home and clear your name. Special Agent Nelson, FBI. It's done, he reported to the group. Now what? With eyes narrowed, Alban replied, Now we wait. Chapter 35 What now? We can't go back to your apartment, Will said to Julie as they walked down the stone steps outside Johansson's office. We need to keep moving, but I'm so exhausted I can't think clearly. We need to go somewhere where we can rest, Julie said, taking hold of Will's hand, just for a little while. What did you have in mind? A hotel won't work. Too many security cameras. And don't they require ID to check into hotels in Europe? She gave his hand a squeeze. I have another idea. I know somewhere private, safe, and off the grid. He squeezed her hand back and said, 
Okay. Lead the way. Will surveyed the small, modest bedroom with a measure of skepticism. Sunlight filtered through the room's only window onto a white and blue flowered duvet, covering a double bed. A simple five-drawer dresser, stained the color of honey, occupied the wall to his right. To his left, a door fitted with an ivory and brass antique knob was partially open, revealing a tidy bathroom. It was tiled entirely in white, with accenting blue tiles interspersed in a diamond pattern on the floor and shower walls. He set Julie's backpack on the hardwood floor and then took a seat at the foot of the bed. "'How do you know this place?' he asked. "'Are you sure we can trust that woman?' Julie chuckled. "'Auntie Heigl? "'Of course we can trust her. "'I've known her for years since I came to Vienna.' Auntie Heigl, huh? Is she really your aunt? She lowered an eyebrow at him playfully. No, that's just her nickname. One day she started referring to herself as my Tantchen Heigl, so I honor the convention. She'll always be my auntie. How did you meet her? I rented this room when I first moved to Vienna. I stayed here for eight months. It took me a while to find an apartment I liked that I could afford. She's a good, honest woman, mother of two, a recent widow. She's been like a second mom to me. He nodded. Relax, Will. We're safe here. Virogen can look up my apartment address, but nobody knows about this place. If you say so. She walked over and sat down next to him on the bed, her thigh pressed against his. She looked at him, but said nothing. Virogen is never going to stop hunting me, he said, his voice solemn. She nodded. I don't want to be on the run forever. I don't want to live like a fugitive. I know. I wish I didn't have the immunity mutation. I wish I could go back to the way things were before, living in ignorance, blissful ignorance. She put her head on his shoulder. We can't control the cards we're dealt. All we can do is find the courage to play the hand we've been given. Most people wouldn't have had the cunning and courage to escape from Chiarik Norse. Most people would have folded their cards and quit the game. You didn't do that, Will, because you're a fighter. You are still fighting, right? He nodded. They sat together in silence for a long while before he spoke. Johansson said if he was the one whose DNA was encoded with a skeleton key mutation, then he would publish his genome for all the world to see. Yeah. I remember. He's looking at the situation like open-source software, applying the same principle to my DNA. Give your genetic code away for free and see what people can build with it, like Wikipedia, she said. It would save millions of lives. Yes, you would, she said, and laid her hand on his thigh. Morally, it's the right decision. I agree. Once everyone has access to my genetic code, Virogen will have lost their competitive advantage, he said, with hope in his voice. That sounds logical, she said, but going public exposes you, and if Johansson beats Virogen to the punch and kills their patent efforts, it might incite them to seek retribution. Are you prepared to face those consequences? Yes, she gazed at him. What? A wave of lustful, nervous expectation rippled through his body. I'm proud of you. He blushed. It's what anybody would do. No, it's not. Your journey has led you to a crossroads today. On the left is the path of self-preservation. Keep running, keep hiding, forever looking out for yourself above all else. 
On the right is the path of self-sacrifice, exposing yourself, giving away your genome, standing in defiance of your enemy. You've chosen the harder path, the noble path. That takes courage. I couldn't have made it this far without you. I was trapped in a deep, dark hole, and when I called for help, you came and pulled me out. You're my angel. I'm happy you found me again. She paused for a moment before she continued in a softer voice. I'm just beginning to realize how much I've missed you. I've missed you, too. Before he could move to kiss her, her lips were on him, wet, flush, and warm. He gently cradled the back of her neck with his hand, his fingers becoming entwined in the fine strands of her hair. His tongue found hers, circled, caressed, and tasted. She pulled away from him, gasping, grinning. He leaned in for another kiss, but missed. She moved in front of him, straddling his knees. She touched his lips with her finger. Staring into his eyes, she began to unbutton her blouse slowly, one button at a time. How long have I been asleep? Julie asked. An hour, maybe, Will replied, turning to face her. He set Catherine Foster's diary down on the mattress next to him, reached over and stroked her forehead tenderly along the hairline. Mm, that's nice. Did you sleep? Couldn't. My mind was racing. What have you been doing? Reading this, he said, holding up the diary for her to see. I'm drawn to it. I feel like one of them. She propped herself up to a reclined sitting position against the headboard of the bed next to him. The bed sheet slid to her waist, exposing her breasts, but she made no attempt to cover herself. Tell me about it, she said. He picked up the diary and opened it to the page where he had placed the black silk ribbon bookmark. Instead of trying to recount the individual diary entries, he wove the events and details into a coherent narrative. She listened, enraptured, to a tale of love, self-sacrifice, courage, and tragedy. He concluded by reading Catherine Foster's dying words, and it left them both in tears. It's a remarkable story, Julie said at last wiping her cheeks. Paul Foster reminds me of you. He smiled at her. A long but comfortable silence lingered in the room as they both drifted off into private musing, until Julie's stomach interrupted their daydreams with a loud, rolling growl. They both burst into laughter. Sounds like I've got a monster in there, she said. I'm starving. Me too. What time is it, anyway? She reached across his body to grab her mobile phone from the bedside table. She pressed the power button, turning it on, and was greeted with a notification that she had a voicemail waiting. As she listened to the recorded message, Will saw her go pale. That was my roommate, Isabella. She's in a taxi on the way to the hospital. Two brutes showed up at the apartment looking for us. They broke every finger on her left hand. She called to warn me, Julie said, her voice shaky. She said if they find us, she's certain they'll kill us. I'm sure it was the same guys who jumped me in Prague. Bastards. I'm sorry about Isabella. I want to go see her in the hospital, she said, and began to hurriedly get dressed. You can't. That's exactly what they want. They'll be waiting for us. Her phone chimed again, signaling that a text message had been received. Well, you'd better look at this, she said, and tossed him her phone. To Will Foster, we know about Virogen. We're here to help. We can get you home and clear your name, Special Agent Nelson, FBI. 
Will stared at the lines of text on the phone's color LCD display. I don't buy it. How would the FBI know I'm with you? It's a setup orchestrated by Virogen. What do we do? Julie said. Nothing. Ignore it. Turn your phone off so they can't trace us here, he barked, grabbing the phone. Will, we need to consider all the possibilities here. The FBI could protect you, she started rubbing her left hand. What happened to Isabella changes things. These bastards are out for blood. Maybe we need to rethink our plan. Come on, Julie, it's obviously a trap. Not if the FBI really is investigating Virogen. Will's brow furrowed. You're too trusting. I've been burned once by putting my faith in the establishment. I don't mean to be burned again. Okay, then let's test whoever sent this message. If they fail the test, then we know it's a trap. But if they pass, then we consider talking with them. What exactly do you have in mind? We've got something, said Van Cleve, picking up his phone. Kalen, get a coordinator on the line and ping Ponty's phone. If we're quick enough, we can triangulate their location, Alban ordered. I'm on it, Kalen replied. Van Cleve turned the screen toward his colleagues who had gathered around his phone. Need proof to trust you. Excellent. He's still with Ponty, and we've got his attention, Alban said. She scrawled a note on a sheet of paper and handed it to Van Cleve. Send this. Van Cleve nodded and thumb-typed. Investigation of Virogen's Chiarek Norse facility uncovered illegal research on human test subjects. There have been suspicious deaths, but you survived. Went to Ponty's apartment, found roommate tortured. You and Julie are in terrible danger. Call me at 1-555-724-2341. Julie's phone chimed with receipt of the text message. She read it aloud. He knows about Chiarek Norse and Isabella, but that's not definitive proof. It could be the bounty hunters pretending to be FBI, Will said. Those mercenaries wouldn't have access to Virogen's research records, Julie said. Will rubbed his chin. True, but why wait to contact me until now? Where were they when I was locked up in that hellhole? She shrugged. Good point. Let's ask them. She thumbed a message back. Why wait until now to contact me? Where were you when I was locked up inside that hellhole being tortured? Will, I'm calling Isabella now. I need to make sure she's safe, Julie said, with eyes that screamed, and don't even try to stop me. Van Cleve read Julie's reply for the group. So, now we know, Alban said, pacing. Foster is a victim, not a mule for an industrial espionage plot. I need to inform Nicolora. With her mobile in her hand, Alban left the room and walked into the adjoining suite. Do we have a fix on their location yet? Kalin asked. Yes. They're here, in this building near Stefansplatz, Van Cleve replied. He pointed to a red dot on a digital map on his tablet computer. After several minutes, Alban returned. Nicolora wants us to arrange a meeting. If Foster cooperates and confirms our preliminary findings of virogen foul play, then we have instructions to protect him until we can turn him safely over to the real FBI. If not, then we're still on the case for virogen. I'll send a message requesting a meeting, Van Cleve said. Alban nodded. Let Foster pick the location. We want him to feel in control. He wants to meet, 
Julie said, looking at the incoming text message. What do you think? I don't know. It doesn't feel right. The strain in his voice made her want to wrap her arms around him and tell him it would be okay, that she would protect him and that together they could take on any foe. But after what happened to Isabella, she knew she couldn't protect Will. She wasn't rich or powerful or well-connected. Yes, they could keep running, but eventually the money would run out. Eventually they'd be caught or maybe even killed to ensure their silence. The FBI was Will's best chance to get his life back. Isabella confirmed that an American calling himself Agent Nelson rescued her after the thugs left her for dead. I think we should meet him, somewhere public, that he can't grab you and stuff you in the back of an unmarked van. I know a good place. It's called the Hotel Satcher. It's a popular tourist attraction, well-lit and crowded. Most importantly, the hotel has security. How far away is it? Walking distance. It's near the Vienna State Opera House. Julie, I don't think it's a good idea for us to meet him together. Why not? If it's a trap, they can grab both of us. We need to split up. If something happens to me, you can call the Austrian police. I need you as my backup. All right. I'll watch you from across the street at the State Opera. It sits on the corner of Kartnerstrasse and Philharmonikerstrasse. Where should we meet if I'm forced to ditch? Stephanstum Cathedral. It's the most famous and crowded church in Vienna. We'll be safe there. She powered on her computer and, using Google Maps, showed him a bird's-eye view of the streets around Hotel Satcher and Stephanstum. Okay. Sounds like a reasonable plan, Will said, feigning confidence. His mind drifted back to the taser match in the middle of Wenceslas Square in Prague. Nobody in the crowd had intervened to help him there. Why would this be any different if things went south? Although he acquiesced, she could see he was riddled with doubt. I have an idea. Why don't I meet Agent Nelson instead of you? she suggested. It keeps you safe and your location secret. I'll go to the meeting alone, ask questions, and report back to you here. Absolutely not. No way. Why not? Give me one good reason. First, it puts you in danger. And second, this is my fight, not yours. Will barked. Julie's face turned red. Oh, really? So all this time, everything that's happened since I picked you up in Prague hasn't put me in danger? Really? Interesting, because I seem to recall you telling me repeatedly that I'm in danger as long as I'm with you. And since when did this become your fight? I thought we were in this together. You were twisting things. That's not what I meant. Oh, that's what it sounded like to me. Why don't you tell me, Will? What did you mean? She crossed her arms and stared at him. He gently set his hands on her shoulders. Julie, listen to me. I'm sorry. That came out completely wrong. What I meant to say was that I appreciate your offer. It is very brave of you to want to protect me and to risk yourself for me, but this is something that I need to do. She glared at him. He pulled her to his chest until he felt her relax in his arms. Okay. What time do you want me to tell him? She mumbled, her face buried in his shirt. Café Satcher 7.30 p.m. Van Cleve's phone buzzed. He agreed to meet, he announced. 19.30 at the Café Satcher. Game on, Kalin said, and started moving toward the door. I need to scout the location. Come on, Van Cleve, I need your help, and we don't have much time. Give me ten seconds. 
I'm just sending him an acknowledgment, Van Cleve replied. Then, chasing after Kalin, he added, I'm taking the BMW, Immel. You're insane if you think I'm riding bitch on the back of your damn motorcycle. Chapter 36 I still don't see why I have to play Agent Nelson, A.J. protested. Because Van Cleve will be providing tactical direction from the bird's-eye position, I'll be providing emergency egress, and Foster knows Agent Nelson is a dude because I was the one who rescued the roommate at Ponty's apartment, Kalin said. I'm not trained for this shit like you guys are. I'm a lab geek, not a field operative. You're crazy if you think I'll be able to pull this off. That didn't seem to stop you at Chiaric Norse. You were a pro. Beginner's luck, A.J. whined. Enough. You can and you will do this. End of discussion, Kalin said sternly. A.J. looked at Alban, protesting, but she shook her head. The decision was final. Kalin made a gather-round gesture to the group with his hands and outlined the plan. In all likelihood, Foster won't approach until he sees our agent first. A.J., you should be seated with your back to the exterior hotel wall so you have good visibility and Foster can see you. We'll text Foster that you'll be wearing a black sport jacket with a blue pocket square. Make sure, A.J., that you maintain a clear line of sight with me at all times. I'll be idling with the Ducati a half block away, ready to jump in if the situation warrants. What do I do if Ponty is with him? Unless she crashes the party with a police escort, I don't see her being a factor. What if the goons from Potty's apartment show up? If anything goes awry, anything at all, I can extract you within seconds. I'll be on the Ducati, twenty-five yards away from your position with a clear line of sight. My visor will be up, and I'll be pretending to flirt with Alban and showing off my bike like the testosterone-charged egomaniac that I am. You can signal me covertly by standing and saying, This meeting is over, emphatically, or by saying the code words, Echo November. See, Remy will be the coordinator for the op. We'll be on open mics. If we split up, rendezvous back here. The most important thing to remember is that if you can't convince Foster to come with you willingly, then it is imperative that you mark him so we can track him. I will consider this meeting is a success, even if the only thing you accomplish is tagging Foster, Kalin said. The primary method for tagging Foster is to get him to accept this bug that looks like a USB memory stick. The bug is equipped with a 30-day battery, microphone, and GPS transponder. I've loaded it with a subset of Foster's medical files from Chiarek Norse. If he checks them, he'll know we're telling him the truth, Van Cleve explained. As long as Foster has the USB key in his possession, we can track his movements. What if he plugs it into a computer but ditches it after he downloads the files? The USB key is also equipped with a virus. If Foster plugs it into any computer with Internet access, I will be notified instantly, and bingo, we have his location. What's the backup tagging method? A.J. asked. The backup tagging method is for you to touch Foster's shoe or pant leg with the tip of your shoe. I've applied a radioisotope marker to the toe of your right shoe. If you graze him, it will rub off and I can track him, Van Cleve said. What if I actually convince Foster to come with me? What then? asked A.J. That's the goal, A.J. The driver will pick you up in the seven series and bring you back to the nest. Okay. So what do we do once we get this guy? Silly boy. We interrogate him, Kalin laughed. Chapter 37 K. Immel, R.S. Physical They're here. 
standing behind the corner art support of the state opera. Technical, can you see them from your position in the hotel room? Kalin had taken station strategically at the northeast corner of Kartner and Philharmoniker, in front of a Starbucks coffee shop, and Caddy Corner to where Julie and Will were standing at the Vienna Staatsoper, the Vienna State Opera House. From his location, he would be able to observe the meeting between A.J. and Will at the Café Satcher and intervene within seconds if necessary. Van Cleve had rented a room at the Hotel Satcher, facing south, and positioned almost directly above the hotel's outdoor café. From his bird's-eye vantage point, he could see all the players, monitor foot and vehicle traffic in and out of the T-shaped intersection, and use a directional microphone to listen to conversations within a seventy-five-meter radius. E. Van Cleve, R.S. Technical Got him. Calibrating the directional mic. I have good audio. Ponty is wishing Foster good luck. She just kissed him. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Foster is moving. He's crossing the street. Bio, get ready. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Roger. The second and third stories of the state opera overhung the first story, creating a covered walkway and allowing more space for pedestrian traffic along Kartner. The portico was supported by stone columns that formed a series of arches. Occupying the southwest corner of Kartner and Philharmoniker, the portico was two arches deep by five arches long. Will and Julie had taken position under the portico and behind one of the many columns. "'I think I see him,' Julie said to Will." peering around a cream-colored stone column toward the hotel satcher. There, in the black jacket with the blue pocket square. He's looking around. He just sat down facing the street. Wish me luck, Will replied. Julie leaned in and gave him a quick kiss. Good luck. I'll be right here watching. He crossed Felharmonica Strasse and walked toward three maroon awnings, each adorned with a printed golden S and circled by a wreath, the logo of the Satcher Hotel and Café. Seven small round bistro tables, each with two chairs, formed a modest row along the window front. The brisk evening air made the café's outdoor seating a more welcome choice for most diners, so only five people sat outside. Only one sat alone, facing the street. Will paused ten paces from the tables and surveyed the landscape. He scanned the crowd, looking for men in black with curlicue wires dangling from their ears and government-issue overcoats. He found none. Only automobile traffic, wandering tourists, and a man showing off his sport bike to a raven-haired girl in front of a Starbucks down the sidewalk. Will took a deep breath and walked up to the table where the agent was seated. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Talk to him, Bio. Engage him, or we'll lose him. Mr. Foster, my name is Special Agent Nelson. Thank you for coming. Will stood motionless, considering... You look a little young for a federal agent. Would you believe I'm five years out of the academy? My nickname in the bureau was Babyface. I hate it, but what you gonna do? A.J. improvised. A. Menil, R.S. Social. That's good, Bio. Keep it up. Please, Mr. Foster, have a seat. We're just going to talk. That's all. A.J. said. Will stared into the young man's hazel eyes. A.J. met Will's gaze and held the eye contact. After several seconds, satisfied, he pulled back the empty chair and sat down. You called this meeting. Talk. You asked for proof, so I brought it. 
This USB key contains data and documentation we've obtained from the Chiarik Norse facility, the very facility where you were detained. Virogen Pharmaceuticals took extreme measures to keep these files secret, and now we know why. We're here to help you, Mr. Foster, but we need your cooperation, A.J. said, and placed the USB key on the table in front of Will. A. May Neal, R.S. Social. Don't say things like that. You sound like you're setting him up. Tell him your goal is to protect him and Julie. Help him get his life back. Empathy, Bio. Empathy. Cooperation, Will said. So you want me to testify against Virogen? Is that the only reason you're here? We're here to protect you and Miss Ponty. I want to help you get your life back. That's our number one priority. From the files we've commandeered, we have a pretty good picture what Virogen has been up to. But I'm not going to lie to you. We could definitely use your help to fill in some of the blanks. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Good. Now appeal to his sense of duty. We need to protect other innocents like him. A.J. continued. We can protect you against Virogen, but we also need to know if there are others. Others like you research subjects who survived and need our help. My job is to make sure that Virogen is stopped and to help the innocent people who they've hurt. A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Beautiful, Bio. Assuming I believe you, what are you proposing? Well asked, still making no move to pick up the USB key. E. Van Cleave, R.S. Technical. Bio, he's not going to take the USB. Go to secondary marking protocol. Gently swipe your right toe on Foster's leg. Do it now. I'm proposing that you come with me. Miss Ponty can come, too, if she chooses. We'll debrief in a safe location here in Vienna. Then, when you're ready, we'll take you home under protective custody. As he spoke, A.J. slid his right foot forward six inches and hit the table leg awkwardly. He missed. Before I consider going with you, I need to see your credentials, Will said. A.J. nodded. Below the table, he made another sweep with his right foot, this time successfully brushing Will's left pant leg. Have your contact at Orange Telecom ping Ponty's phone again, Raymond Zern barked. I still don't see them. The accuracy is only plus or minus fifty meters, brother. The last triangulation puts their position at these GPS coordinates. We need to be patient. Remember, they could be inside a building. The ping works anywhere that the phone has a signal, Stefan said. There, Udo said, pointing out the right passenger window of the van. The girl is there, standing against that stone column. Good eyes, Udo, Raymond said, pressing the brake pedal and slowing the van to a crawl. She's alone. Look for Foster. He is there, Udo said, at that cafe on the other side. Raymond smirked and brought the van to a stop along the curb. He shifted the automatic transmission into park, flipped on the hazard flashers, and turned to face Udo and Stefan. Stick to the plan and everything will be fine. In twelve hours, my brothers, we'll be counting our money and drunk on Augustiner. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Bio, we have a bogey incoming. Your three o'clock. Gray jacket, blue jeans, black boots. A.J. turned his head to the right, looking east toward Kartnerstrasse. A man in a gray jacket was walking straight toward them, quickly and deliberately. 
His face was expressionless and cold. Will scooted his chair back away from the table. He turned to his left to see what A.J. was looking at. Raymond Zern crossed the threshold of the Café Satcher outdoor dining area. He stepped around two empty tables and was upon them. You, Will said with disdain to the bounty hunter he had tussled with on the streets of Prague. His stomach tightened. How could he have been so stupid as to agree to meet this guy Nelson? It had been a double cross from the beginning, and he had fallen for it. I believe we have unfinished business, Raymond Zern said with a malevolence that made Will's skin crawl. Funny, as I recall, our business was concluded when I left you clutching your balls at the cyber cafe in Prague, Will said, trying to mask his fear. Who is your friend? Don't tell me you've hired a bodyguard, Raymond turned to A.J. You're not going to be any trouble, are you, little boy? Perplexed, Will looked at A.J. and then back at Zern. Was this charade part of the double cross? E. Van Cleve, R.S. Technical White Van traveling east on Philharmonikerstrasse. It just stopped in front of the Ponty Woman. We've got trouble. A white cargo van with black-tinted windows stopped on Philharmonikerstrasse, directly in front of Julie, blocking her line of sight. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, she said, exasperated. Move, stupid van. The van did not move. The passenger door opened, and a muscular man with a shaved head stepped out and onto the sidewalk. Julie tensed. It was just a coincidence, she told herself. He turned around to face the van. The passenger window had been rolled down, and he was talking to the driver. He then stepped away from the window, waved goodbye to the driver, and began walking south, down Kartnerstrasse. She watched him for several seconds, just to be certain, until he was halfway down the block. Never once did he look at her. Satisfied, she turned back to watch Will, but the white van was still there, idling at the curb, blocking her view. Damn it, she surveyed the area, looking for another vantage point with cover. She noticed another stone column three meters to her left, where she might gain a clear line of sight around the van. It was time to relocate. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, A.J. said, turning his chair forty-five degrees toward Zern. That's because I didn't tell you my name, Raymond replied. I think it's time for you to leave. Mr. Foster and I have some unfinished business we need to discuss in private. Raymond pulled the flap of his leather jacket open, revealing a Sig Sauer pistol with suppressor suspended in an underarm shoulder holster. A.J. looked at the weapon, then up at Zern's face. He had never met a killer, until now. The eyes confirmed it, eyes full of malice and pompous impunity. This man would gun him down where he sat without a second thought. A.J. glanced to his right, surveying the van that Van Cleve had just reported. The van was idling at the curb. The driver window was tinted so he could not make out a face inside. His stomach went sour, and his mouth turned to parchment. Udo Zern walked a half-block south on Kartnerstrasse before he glanced back at Julie. To his surprise, she was no longer there. He immediately turned right toward the State Opera Building. She had been standing behind the corner column on the perimeter of the portico nearest to the street. He darted between two columns, entering the portico to the south behind her. He looked north. From his new vantage point he could see that she had shifted one column to her left. She was now peeking out from behind the middle column instead. He smiled. Perfect. From his left jacket pocket, Udo retrieved and donned a pair of black leather driving gloves. From his right jacket pocket, he pulled a Ziploc plastic bag. Sealed inside was a chloroform-laden handkerchief, which he withdrew and wadded up in the palm of his gloved right hand. He moved quickly, covering the distance separating them in mere seconds. 
by the time Julie became aware of the footsteps closing in behind her, it was too late. Udo's grip was all-encompassing, suffocating. She stiffened as she felt folds of silky fabric against her lips. Her nostrils tingled and she felt queasy, then light-headed. Darkness swept into her field of vision, gobbling up the light like a shade pulled down over a sun-filled picture window. She threw an elbow into the wall of flesh behind her. It was futile. He was iron, and she was... unconscious. Her body was limp as Udo lifted her. He carried her 125-pound frame as effortlessly as he would a sleeping toddler back to the white van. Stefan Zern had opened the side cargo door from the inside, and he was peering out the opening toward them. Udo trotted over to the van, ducked his head, and stepped inside with Julie in his arms. Stefan closed the door behind him. The rear compartment of the cargo van had no seats. Udo's motorcycle stood inside, held upright by nylon straps lashed to four metal tie-down rings bolted to the bare sheet metal floor. The motorbike took up the majority of the cargo hold, so Udo laid Julie down parallel to the bike, up against the side wall of the van. He looked at Stefan for approval. Perfect, Stefan said. Now we wait for Raymond. E. Van Cleave, R.S. Technical. They're making their move. A male Caucasian just grabbed Ponty. He's dragging her into the van. Damn it! They're here for Foster. Change of plans. Extract Foster. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Roger. A.J. stood abruptly. This meeting is over. We're leaving, he commanded. The high revving whir of the Ducati engine pierced the nighttime air. Kalen popped the clutch and the motorcycle launched forward like a missile. He jumped the curb and sped across the pedestrian-only section of Kartnerstrasse. In less than two seconds' time, Kalen and his motorcycle had covered the distance between the café and his starting point. All three men, Zern, Archer, and Foster, turned toward the direction of the motorcycle engine. Pandemonium erupted on the sidewalk as pedestrians screamed and jumped clear of the speeding motorbike's path. Zern drew his pistol from the concealed holster and took aim at the rider. At the same time, Kalen shifted his center of gravity— turned to the left, and powered on the throttle, dipping and spinning the Ducati into a controlled slide. His head and torso dropped below the line of fire as three bullets whisked through the air above him. At the last second, he hoisted his left foot up onto the fuel tank so that his leg would not be pinned and abraded across the concrete. Bike and rider surfed along the ground at sixty kilometers per hour toward Raymond. Empty bistro tables and chairs flew into the air like popping corn off a hot stove as the undercarriage of the bike clipped the legs of everything in its path. The rear wheel of the bike crashed into Raymond's shins, just above the ankles, precisely on target. Raymond spun like a pinwheel, his legs catapulting up, his torso arcing down. The force of the impact with the concrete jolted the Sig Sauer loose from his grip, the weapon tumbled through the air and landed with a thud on the ground a meter away. Raymond grunted and rolled onto his side. He scanned the ground, looking for his pistol. Both A.J. and Raymond located the handgun simultaneously and then glanced knowingly at each other. A.J. dove over a fallen bistro table at the same time Zern lurched for the gun from his fallen position. Kalen popped the Ducati back up to the riding position revved the throttle in neutral, and turned to Foster. He flipped the black visor up on his helmet and looked at Will. If you want to live, come with me, Kalen said. Will looked at Kalen and then glanced around him at the van parked across the street, blocking his view of Julie. Julie! he exclaimed, taking a step toward the street. It's time to go, Kalen ordered, seizing Will's arm and pulling him toward the bike. They've already taken her. Get on the bike! Amongst a pile of toppled tables and chairs, A.J. and Raymond tussled over the Sig Sauer on the ground. A.J. locked one hand around the barrel and with his other gripped the suppressor of the pistol, controlling the direction of the muzzle. 
Raymond clutched the pistol grip with his right hand, repeatedly jerked the weapon, trying to pull it free from A.J.'s grasp. With his free left hand, Zern Rabbit punched A.J. in the face. Once. Twice. As Raymond cocked his fist back for a third blow, A.J. tucked his knees and swung his lower body around 180 degrees so that the soles of his feet were now toward Raymond. He pulled with both hands on the Sig Sauer, drawing it close to his chest, straightening and lengthening Raymond's right arm. The maneuver had repositioned A.J.'s head out of fist-striking distance and gave him additional leverage, but in doing so, the muzzle angle had changed. Raymond grinned. He squeezed the trigger, sending a round whizzing centimeters past A.J.'s face. The errant bullet struck a metal table behind A.J. with a clang. Will jerked at the strident sound of the bullet ricocheting off the metal table. He looked down at A.J. and Raymond, wrestling on the ground over the gun, then at the Ducati, and then back at the van. His expressionless eyes belied the turmoil he felt inside. How could he abandon Julie now? Will stared at Kalin, motionless. We'll get her back, Kalin said. I promise. Will reluctantly climbed onto the motorcycle behind Kalin. He locked his arms around Kalin's waist and placed his feet on the passenger stirrups. Keep your forehead pressed in the middle of my back. Close your eyes, and no matter what happens, don't let go, Kalin instructed, yelling over his shoulder. He flipped his helmet visor down with a thud, engaged the clutch, and twisted the throttle. Kalin's black Ducati streaked away from the Café Satcher in a blur. "'Raymond is in trouble,' Stefan said, looking out the driver's side window of the van at the commotion across the street. "'What do we do?' Udo asked, leaning forward from the cargo compartment of the van, so that his head was even between the driver and passenger seat headrests. "'We're behind on the timeline.' If someone saw you take the Ponty girl, then the police will be coming soon, Stefan answered, panicked. We need to go. We can't leave Raymond behind. I'll crush those bastards. There's no time, Udo. Raymond can take care of himself. Foster is getting away. Take the Kawasaki and follow that bike. Do not lose Foster. We're switching to the backup plan. Remember, no matter what happens, we rendezvous at the warehouse at 2200. Okay, yeah, I'll get him back. A.J.'s eyes bulged as he looked down and saw the open muzzle pointing at his face. He twisted the barrel violently, reorienting the line of fire away from his head and up toward the sky. As he did... Raymond squeezed off another round, this time piercing one of the maroon-colored Hotel Satcher awnings. A.J. pulled Raymond's arm straight between his legs and drew his knees up to his chest. With all his might, A.J. kicked with both feet at the same time. The sole of one shoe impacted the top of Raymond's head, and the other foot glanced off Raymond's left shoulder. The force of the blow had its desired effect— popping the handgun free from Zern's grip. A.J. scooted backward, crab-like, pushing with his feet to distance himself from his foe. Raymond grunted and grabbed the top of his head in pain, before rolling over onto his hands and knees into a crawling position. Raymond lifted his head up to look at A.J., who had backed himself up against the stone façade of the building. A.J. sat with his back upright, legs extended in V and both arms fully extended as he aimed the sig at his rival. "'Fuck you!' said Raymond with disdain, staring at A.J. He then stood up and dusted himself off. A.J. said nothing, but elevated the barrel of the gun to maintain his aim at Raymond's chest. In the background, the scream of a second motorcycle engine echoed in the night. Raymond turned in the direction of the sound. A red Kawasaki ninja launched out of the open rear cargo doors of the van parked across the street. Both motorcycle tires chirped when they hit the pavement. The bike skidded and wobbled momentarily before the rider skillfully recovered his balance. The rider sped west on Philharmonica Strasse in pursuit of Kalen and Will. Raymond turned back to look at A.J. and then limped toward the van idling across the street. 
He hauled himself into the rear cargo compartment and pulled the two doors shut behind him as the vehicle raced away down Kartnerstrasse. A.J. looked for the safety on the Sig Sauer. Finding none, he stuffed it inside the waistline of his pants at the small of his back. He looked up. Two shapely female legs in high heels and black stockings filled his frame of view. Let's go. We don't have much time, Alban said to A.J., extending her hand to help him up. He grabbed her wrist and rose to his feet. Her grip was firm, and the pull she exerted on his arm both impressed and surprised him. Alban had some muscles packed on her lithe frame. In the background, the sound of police sirens blaring grew louder with each passing second. The tank's armored BMW 760LI was waiting at the curb for them with the rear passenger door open. A.J. and Alban ran to the sedan and jumped inside. The driver wasted no time pressing the accelerator to the floor before A.J. had shut the door. The V-12 engine roared, and the svelte sedan raced away into the Viennese night. As instructed, Will pressed his forehead against the middle of Kalin's back. His fingers clenched the folds of Kalin's leather jacket, like a madman holding the reins of a demon stallion galloping toward the gates of hell. Will was not an experienced motorcycle rider, but he knew that any attempt by him to balance the bike or anticipate an evasive maneuver by the driver would have a deleterious effect. As long as he was dead weight, the driver's reflexes would naturally compensate for his presence. A backpack. That was what he aimed to be, a 170-pound human backpack. The speed was ludicrous. Will knew this because the loose fabric of his chinos stung his thighs as it flapped violently in the wind. He kept his eyes shut, pretending like a small child that what he couldn't see wasn't really happening. A terrible jolt, followed by a skid, caused Will to instinctively open his eyes. Bright red taillights swept by in a blur. Tires squealed as drivers in passing cars slammed on their brakes. Will squeezed his eyes closed, for fear of panic would cause him to fall off the bike. Behind, he could hear the whine of another street motorcycle, but no sirens. He assumed the worst. One of the thugs from Prague was in pursuit. He cringed. For one motorcycle, the chase was certain to end badly. Kalin panted inside his helmet. Evasive driving was exhausting, exhilarating. Hot pain shot through his right knee. He grunted, but his concentration did not waver. He had clipped something. A fender, a bumper, a small dog. It didn't matter. The pain was a reminder. With Foster on the bike, he was severely hampered. Like a gymnast trying to compete with a lead weight strapped to one foot, maneuvers he could normally perform with ease were impossible with a passenger. His pursuer had no such handicap. Time to level the playing field. K. Immel, R.S. Physical This jerk-off on my ass is starting to piss me off. Give me the count. C. Remy, R.S. Coordinator Three minutes, forty seconds... Seventy seconds past the evacuation timeline. Physical, you need to escalate your evasion tactics. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. No shit. Really. The problem is I've got a two-hundred-pound gorilla on my back. I can't cut for shit. I'm shredding my tires. C. Remy, R.S. Coordinator. Be advised, the police have just issued a pursuit call on the police band to units in your vicinity. K. Emil, R.S. Physical. That's just fucking great. I need real-time routing. C. Remy, R.S. Coordinator. Stand by for routing. In 400 meters, execute a U-turn. 300, 200. Stand by for the turn. Mark the turn. K. Emil, R.S. Physical. Turn executed. I think I... Ooh. That's a four, no, five-car pileup in my wake. C. Remy, R.S. Coordinator. And your bogey? K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Checking. He made it through. 
Still on my ass. C. Remy, R.S. Coordinator. In five hundred meters, execute a left turn. Three hundred. Two hundred. Stand by for the turn. Mark the turn. K. Emil, R.S. Physical. The light is red. Do you have traffic cameras? Can I burn it? C. Remy, R.S. Coordinator. Negative. Take the sidewalk. Kalin braked the bike hard and turned left onto a sidewalk just before the cross street of the busy intersection. A twist of the throttle, and he catapulted the bike forward on the new vector, blowing past 100 kilometers per hour in three seconds. Kalin bobbed and weaved between potted trees and shrieking pedestrians on the sidewalk like an alpine skier negotiating the flags on a downhill run. Udo braked late wrestled his bike through a skidding turn, and scraped along the side of a parked Audi as he recovered his balance. He accelerated in pursuit of his quarry, electing to drive against the flow of traffic in a narrow gap between a row of parked cars and oncoming vehicles in the right lane. Horns blared and tires squealed as drivers reacted to the reckless motorcycle racing past. Kalen jumped the curb back onto the street, the rear tire squealed as it grabbed asphalt. Udo shot through a gap across two lanes of ongoing traffic, a red blur, and merged into the southbound flow behind Kalen and Foster. Three police cars were now in pursuit, dodging and weaving clumsily behind the more agile racing bikes. Kalen took up a position precariously piloting the divider line, overtaking two lanes of moving traffic between the cars. Udo followed... Two hundred meters behind, steadily closing the gap. The light at the upcoming intersection was green. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Chit, I still have my bogey. I need a blocking fullback. Where the hell is Bavarian 1? C. Remy, R.S. Coordinator. Bavarian 1 is in egress with bio and social. Do you want me to reroute? K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Chit. Mm, hold on. Kalen glanced to his right, looking down the cross street, checking the flow of traffic. The front cars were crossing, but the lagging cars were slowing. The light ahead changed to yellow. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Never mind, Coordinator. I have a crazy idea. This was his chance. The transition the two-second period when the intersection was vacant between the switching of traffic flows. He would need to time the maneuver perfectly. If it worked, he would trap the police cruisers behind the blockade of stopped cars at the light and peel his bogey off into the grill of a crossing vehicle moving into the intersection. If his timing was off, or if some bastard ran the light— then it would be him and his precious cargo that the EMTs would be scraping up off the pavement. Kalen twisted the throttle, accelerating toward the column of cars ahead, slowing at the intersection. The space between the doors of adjacent cars was just wide enough to permit the clear passage of a motorcycle and rider, provided he maintained a perfectly straight trajectory. And nobody opened a car door. One hundred meters to the intersection. The light changed red. Braking was not an option. Kalin clenched his teeth. Headlights flashed. Someone was about to die. Chapter 38 Checker, Raymond Zern ordered Stefan. Stefan walked over to the chair where Julie was bound. Her body sagged like a wet paper doll. Only the duct tape they'd bound her with kept her from sliding off the seat onto the floor in a heap. Stefan leaned over at the waist and put his right cheek next to her nose and mouth. Her faint warm breath caressed his smooth boyish skin. She's alive and still unconscious, Stefan said. Wake her. How do you suggest I do that? The chloroform is still in her system. Slap her, yell at her, use the smelling salts. I don't care. Just wake her, Raymond yelled. Stefan tensed. He was not accustomed to seeing his brother Raymond in such a manic state. Then again, 
field work was rare for Stefan, so it was possible that Raymond was always this way in the field. Stefan preferred to stay behind in Munich, functioning as a one-man computer command center for the brothers' assignments. He left the wet work for his two older brothers. They seemed to enjoy it immensely. Stefan did not have the stomach for it. Tooth and nail were not his weapons of choice. The pain Stefan inflicted on his victims was in the form of ones and zeros. The anonymity of his firewall was his shield, the software hack his blade. Stefan stared at the American woman. She was completely vulnerable, oblivious. He had never held a position of power over a woman like this before. Stefan Zern had been dominated by women his entire life, starting with his mother and then followed by every woman he had encountered ever since. Women were an enigma, enchanting and enraging, and Stefan was a boy of a man. Even at age twenty-four, he had yet to know a woman. Now, at this moment, he had the sudden urge to strip this woman of her clothes, make her naked while he stood over her, clothed, dominant, erect, powerful. Stefan, Raymond yelled, startling his brother out of his trance. Wake her up! I'm not waiting for Udo any longer. I want answers. Yes, I'm sorry. I was just, Stefan stammered. He pulled a tiny sealed container of pungent smelling salts from his pocket. He unscrewed the black cap, held his breath, and wafted the open container beneath Julie's nose. Her head jerked once, but her eyelids did not open. He repeated the process, this time letting the open vial linger beneath her nostrils several seconds longer. Stefan was not sure if smelling salts could wake a person from drug-induced unconsciousness, but he had no intention of arguing with Raymond about the point. She would wake up as soon as her body metabolized the sedative compound in her bloodstream, and not one second before. Until that time, he would appease his brother by trying his dampness to wake her. After several attempts, she made a gurgling noise and pulled her face away from the source of the piquant odor. Her eyelids opened a crack and then quickly shut again. Julie Ponty, Julie Ponty, wake up, Stefan said in her ear, shaking her by the shoulder. Sleeping, Julie moaned. I want to sleep. Stefan put the salts under her nose again. This time her eyes popped open. The warehouse where they had taken Julie was empty. Once a storage facility for a plastics company, all that remained inside were rows and rows of barren metal shelving. Each storage rack was ten feet tall and stretched off into the darkness. Julie sat, duct-taped to a decrepit metal chair. The only light in the warehouse emanated from the headlamps of the van, parked ten feet away and facing Julie. Raymond had cut a rusty padlock from one of the loading dock doors, and Stefan had pulled the van completely inside so they could not be seen. Hey! Raymond snapped at Julie, annoyed at his brother's ineffectiveness at such a simple task. Wake up! Her head bobbed. She was still in a fog. Raymond slapped her across her cheek. Wake up, bitch! The slap sent adrenaline pumping through her veins, and she regained consciousness. The shadow in front of her moved, letting the headlights from the van blind her. She tried to raise her hand to shield her eyes, but it was securely lashed to the frame of the chair. Panic set in. This is an interrogation, Miss Ponty. Before we begin, I am going to explain the rules. Listen very carefully carefully. I ask you questions. You answer them truthfully. If you answer truthfully, you will live. If you try to deceive me, I will torture you until your death, said a voice from behind her. Do you understand the rules? The last thing she remembered was watching Will across the street at the Café Satcher meeting with Agent Nelson. Something went wrong. Someone had grabbed her from behind. 
She had no memory of the events that transpired afterward. She had no knowledge of her captors, their motives, or where they had taken her. One thing she did know was that her life was in grave danger. She looked left and then right, trying to catch a glimpse of her interrogator. I said, Do you understand the rules? Raymond repeated, growing more and more agitated by the second. I understand the rules, she mumbled. Good, he replied. What is your name? She paused. He already knew her name. He had said it earlier. This was a test, she told herself. My name is Julie Ponty. What were you doing at the Wiener Staatsoper? He was setting her up, baiting her to lie so he could punish her and begin the process of breaking her. She had never been interrogated before, but her instincts told her this was no time to be coy. Every answer was a high wire crossing. One misstep, and she would pay. I was watching a meeting take place across the street. Where was the meeting? At the Café Satcher. Who was at the meeting? You already know the answers to all these questions, she said. Don't test me. I will hurt you if you break the rules again. This is my promise to you he said quietly. It was a meeting between a man named Will Foster and a man calling himself Agent Nelson. Agent Nelson? What kind of agent? She took a deep breath. The easy part was over now. She was at the crossroads now. She had to make a choice. Tell the truth and risk him not believing her, or lie and risk him seeing right through her. She knew what she had to do. He's not a real agent. It was all part of the plan. What plan? Meredith Morley's plan to get Foster back. Raymond took a step backward. What are you talking about? Who do you work for? I work for a company called Virogen Pharmaceuticals. Mr. Foster was enrolled in a drug pilot program at my company involving highly infectious diseases. A few days ago, he broke out of our research facility in Prague. Mr. Foster is an extremely dangerous individual. I have been trying desperately to bring him back into quarantine, but at the moment, she said, wiggling her bound hands at the wrist, you are making my assignment extremely difficult. Raymond locked eyes with his brother. Stefan motioned for Raymond to follow him away from Julie so they could talk in private. We fucked up, Raymond. She works for Virogen. Stefan whispered, with a hint of panic in his voice. Raymond rubbed his chin. It seems our employer has been withholding critical information from us. Frau Morley already had an asset in place with Foster, while she left us wasting time looking for him in Prague. Why would she do that? when we could have easily brought Foster in. She was stalling, probably because she doesn't want to pay. The last time we spoke, she tried to cancel our contract. I thought you changed her mind. So did I. After a pause, Raymond added, We need this fee, Stefan. I know, but what do we do with her? If we let her go, she'll call Morley. So we don't let her go. You're not suggesting that we kill her? No, at least not yet. First, 
we find out everything Morley is doing. Then we decide what to do with her. She could be valuable bargaining leverage if Morley chooses not to pay. Yeah, agreed. Raymond and Stefan walked back toward Julie. Raymond stood behind her and began to caress her hair. You have been very cooperative so far, Miss Ponty. You have followed the rules. This makes me very happy. Now I want you to tell me everything. I'll try, Julie replied. Her skin crawled as he stroked her. She steeled herself so as not to shudder under his touch. Tell me about this ploy with the man you called Agent Nelson. I don't understand the purpose. If you are working for Virogen, and Ms. Morley is working for Virogen, what are you doing in Vienna wasting time? She lowered her eyes. Ms. Ponty? Foster doesn't know that I work for Virogen, she said. Morley couldn't risk him running again, so we had to think of a different way to get him back. The stick wasn't working, so we decided to try the carrot. My assignment was to get close to Foster, get him to trust me. But it was taking too long. So Morley came up with the idea of setting up a meeting with a Confederate FBI agent. Nelson was going to offer Foster protection. Her candor surprised Raymond. He expected to be breaking fingers by now. This is a very clever plan, but there is still something that confuses me. Your plan seemed to be working. So why did Meredith call me today and direct me to your apartment? A volcano of fury and fear erupted inside her. This was the bastard who had tortured Isabella, broken every finger on her left hand. You'll have to ask her that question, she said through clenched teeth. I didn't even know she'd hired you until now. Raymond began to ask Julie another question when he was interrupted by the ringing of his mobile phone. He answered the call in German. As he listened to the voice on the other end of the receiver, he began to shake. Stefan walked over to his brother and tried to listen to what was being said. Something was very wrong. Raymond finished the call. His fingers opened, and the phone dropped to the ground with a clatter. What is it? Stefan questioned in German. Udo is dead. Our brother is dead. What? How? Traffic accident. He drove his motorcycle into a fucking trolley. He was killed instantly. They didn't even take him to the hospital. Stefan stared at Raymond, but said nothing. Raymond began pacing back and forth behind Julie's chair. Then he stopped and unleashed a guttural, primeval scream full of rage and anguish. His throaty roar reverberated off the metal shelving and uninsulated ceiling structure. The hairs on the back of Julie's neck stood up. Julie was fluent in German, although she had no intention of making this detail known to her captors. She had not met Udo Zern, but she surmised that he was the thug who grabbed her from behind at the state opera. Terror welled up inside her. The violent brother, the one pacing behind her, was infinitely more of a danger to her now than he was five minutes ago. Before he had been agitated and cold— now he was burning with rage and hatred over the news of his brother's death. Julie knew that she would be the likely target of his fury. She would be bludgeoned, whether she cooperated or not. She began to tremble. 
This is your fault, bitch, Raymond screamed at Julie. He walked around in front of her, boldly facing her. You and your American bitch boss, Meredith Morley. If it hadn't been for the two of you, Udo would still be alive. Julie looked down at her knees in silence, saying nothing so as to avoid provoking him with her eye contact. Answer me, Raymond screamed at her. What do you want me to say? I don't even know what you're talking about. He struck the side of her head with his open palm. Liar! Raymond! Stefan screamed in a high-pitched voice. Raymond glared at his younger brother. This woman did not kill Udo. Raymond grabbed Julie's face with his left hand, gripping her from below the chin, his fingers and thumb squeezing her cheeks. He raised her chin angle so that she was looking up at him. Who was the man on the black motorcycle that took Foster? he questioned, releasing her jaw at the end of the sentence. What man? I never saw a man on a motorcycle, she replied, trembling. You lie! he struck her again, this time across the cheek. She yelped and her eyes began to fill with tears. It was part of your plan. You arranged the meeting, he said. I have no idea what you're talking about. You parked your fucking van in front of me, blocking my view. Then someone grabbed me from behind and drugged me, she said brazenly. Raymond drew his hand back to strike her again, but Stefan seized his wrist. She is telling the truth, brother. We grabbed her before the motorcycle chase. She was already unconscious by the time the black motorcycle appeared. Raymond's face contorted with rage. He jerked his hand free from his younger brother's grip. He walked quickly over to the van, opened the rear cargo door, and disappeared inside. Seconds later, he reemerged, face expressionless, and clenching a pistol in his right hand. He marched over to Julie and pressed the muzzle of the pistol firmly into her temple. Tell me who killed Udo. I don't know, she cried. Who is the Black Rider, he screamed, spit flying from his lips, veins bulging in his neck and forehead. I don't know. I swear I don't know, she screamed back. Tell me. Tell me now, or I swear I'll blow your fucking head off. Chapter 39 Who the hell are you people? Will asked, scanning the four stoic faces seated opposite him inside a luxury-appointed suite at the Vienne Intercontinental Hotel. My name is Special Agent Reed. You've already met Special Agent Nelson, Alban said, nodding at A.J. Collectively... We are members of a special U.S. government interagency task force assigned to investigate cases of multinational espionage and corruption. That is all I am at liberty to disclose to you at this time. Will nodded, stood up, and started walking toward the door. Where are you going, Mr. Foster? If you're not going to be straight with me, then I'm out of here. The minute you walk out that door, you can forget about rescuing Julie, she called after him. You can't get her back on your own. He stopped in his tracks, but he did not turn around. With his back to her, he said, Will you help me rescue her if I stay? We will rescue her if you stay. All we ask in return is that you answer our questions about Virogen. He turned. What would you like to know? Alban looked over her shoulder into the adjoining room at Will. He was sitting on a sofa, lost in thought. She turned back to A.J. 
The look in A.J.'s eyes told her damage control was necessary. She could see that his mind was a whirlpool, spinning with questions and doubt. She had years of experience in the tank to call upon, giving her perspective on the tangled, thorny events of the Virogen case as it had unfolded. With less than two days on the job, A.J. did not. I know what you're thinking, and no, A.J., it's not always like this, she said. Then, laying a hand on his shoulder, she added, This case is an aberration. He searched her eyes, hoping to find a glimmer of truth he could never glean from her perfectly anodyne speech. Everything has gotten so twisted I don't know what to think. Since we've left Boston, we've committed espionage against our client, impersonated Czech and U.S. government agents, and kidnapped a man. I thought we were supposed to be the good guys. I know it might not feel like it, but we are the good guys. We don't wear uniforms or carry badges, but we do serve a higher calling. Meredith Morley put us into a horrible situation. Not only did she hire us under false pretenses, but she meant to use the tank as an instrument of malfeasance. We don't work that way, no matter how much money the client is offering. She gave his shoulder a squeeze. And for the record, we didn't kidnap Foster. We saved him from the real bad guys. A.J. saw the glimmer in her eyes he needed to see. You're probably right, but that doesn't quell the indigestion I'm feeling right now. This is nasty business. I had no idea the world outside academia was like this. The real world is guns and roses. You'll get used to it. Then, with a smile, she added, Next thing you know, you'll be asking to borrow keys to Kalen's Ducati. A.J. laughed. Her expression turned serious. I need to debrief Nicolora. Please go in the other room and keep an eye on Foster. Don't let him do anything stupid. He nodded and did as she instructed. Alban pressed zero on her phone. See, Remy, R.S. Coordinator. Coordinator. Hey, May Neal, R.S. Social. Coordinator Social. Request conference call with Founder One. C. Remy, R.S. Coordinator. Founder One is standing by. Let me patch him in. R. Nicolora, Founder One. I listen to the entire broadcast of your Foster interview. Consider me up to speed. A. Mayneil, R.S. Social. I believe him. R. Nicolora, Founder One. So do I. A. Mayneil, R.S. Social. Now what? Foster is clearly the victim here. Kidnapping, genetic piracy, human rights violations, torture. It's a long, dirty list. What Virogen did is unconscionable. R. Nicolora. Founder One. I know. But before we deal with that, we have the immediate problem of the bounty hunters and Julie Ponty. After Kalen's report from Ponty's apartment, I confronted Meredith about torturing the roommate. She admitted to hiring German bounty hunters to find Foster, but swears she never authorized torture. I have the coordinator uploading the bounty hunter's bios to your computer as we speak. A. Mayneil, R.S. Social. I am receiving them now. R. Nicolora, Founder One. The men we're dealing with are brothers, Raymond, Udo, and Stefan Zern. Raymond is the brain, Udo is the brute, and Stefan is the tech. A. Mayneil, R.S. Social. I don't understand why they are still in the picture. When Meredith hired us, why didn't she have the Zerns stand down? 
R. Nicolora, Founder One. According to Meredith, she tried, but Raymond Zern refused and went rogue. The case became personal for him. Now, with Udo Zern dead, we must consider Raymond to be unstable and likely to seek revenge for his brother's death. A. Neal, R.S. Social. They have Ponte. What do you want us to do? R. Nicolora, Founder One. What we always do in situations like this. Rescue her. A. Neal, R.S. Social. Assuming we're successful, what do we do with Ponte and Foster when we're done? R. Nicolora, Founder One. Fly them back to Boston on Niatros. From what I've learned tonight, Foster deserves to get his life back. I'll even help him out with a new identity. A. Neal, R.S. Social. What about the client? R. Nicolora, Founder One. Don't worry about that. You have more urgent matters to attend to. I'll handle Meredith. Founder One, out. Alban strode into the adjoining suite and, with fire in her eyes, addressed her colleagues. Gather round. We've got a rescue mission to prep. Have you ever participated in a hostage negotiation, Mr. Foster? Call me Will. And no, I haven't. Alban crossed her legs and leaned forward in her chair. Although some would disagree with me, I consider hostage negotiations to fall under the umbrella of game theory. Are you familiar with the logic problem commonly referred to as the prisoner's dilemma? Will nodded. I studied it in college, but it's been a while. A.J. shook his head. I've heard the term, but to be honest, I can't say I'm well versed on the subject. Okay, let's walk through an example to refresh everyone's memories, Alban said reassuringly. The prisoner's dilemma is a simple but powerful logic game with two players. In the classic scenario, two criminals are arrested for reckless driving after committing arson. However, the police don't have sufficient evidence to convict either criminal, that is, without defecting testimony from one criminal or the other. So they place the two criminals in separate rooms for interrogation and offer them deals for their testimony in court. Both criminals find themselves to be players in a game with four outcomes. Each outcome is dictated by whether the players choose to defect or cooperate with the other player. Case 1. Both criminals cooperate with each other and remain silent. Each man is sentenced to one year in jail for reckless driving. Neither is implicated in the arson. Case 2. Criminal A defects by incriminating criminal B in the arson, while criminal B remains silent. Criminal A goes free. Criminal B is sentenced to ten years in jail for the reckless driving and the arson. Case 3. Criminal A remains silent, and Criminal B defects by incriminating Criminal A in the arson. This time, Criminal B goes free, and Criminal A is sentenced to ten years in jail. Case 4. Both criminals defect and testify against the other in the arson case. Each criminal is sentenced to six years in jail. A.J. rubbed his temples, concentrating. Okay. So if I heard you clearly, the best scenario is for both criminals to cooperate and remain silent so that they'll receive only one-year jail terms. Yes, the best mutual outcome occurs when both players cooperate with each other. But remember, each player would do best for himself if he defects and his partner remains silent. 
Alban explained. Game theory says that rational, self-interested players will always defect in a single iteration prisoner's dilemma. In the effort to achieve their personal best-case scenario of zero jail time, both criminals will defect. In doing so, each will end up with six years. Another way to think about it is when the participants in a prisoner's dilemma do not trust each other implicitly, then fear of being the sucker stuck with the ten-year jail sentence will drive both players to defect. What do you mean by a single iteration prisoner's dilemma? A.J. asked. What I mean is that cooperation only emerges as a strategy when the players both intend to participate in another round of the game. Keep in mind, prisoners' dilemmas can be redefined in an infinite number of scenarios. Business, finance, military strategy, evolution, you get the picture. The outcomes don't have to be punishment. They can be tangible goods, currency, time goodwill, etc. The point I'm trying to make, Will, is that screwing your opponent is a perfectly acceptable strategy if you plan on never seeing him again. But if he is anyone you intend to have future interaction with, a business acquaintance or a friend, for example, then cooperation emerges as a leading strategy. How does... Any of that relate to hostage negotiation, Will questioned. Van Cleve interjected, Two-party hostage negotiation is just a prisoner's dilemma with window dressing. Both parties have two choices, cooperate or defect. In hostage negotiation, both sides feign cooperation while pursuing the strategy of defection. It is important that you realize this fact in our upcoming negotiation with the bounty hunter Raymond Zern. The laws of game theory dictate that he will defect on any promise. Will deflated. Whatever Zern promises, it will be a lie? Yes. Then Julie will die, no matter what we do? Alban smirked. No because our strategy is also to defect. May the shrewdest defector win, Kalin cheered. Then what is our plan? Will asked. We negotiate a hostage exchange, Alban said, her voice velvet. We ask for Julie, and they ask for... The four compatriots stared at him, but they said nothing. His eyes darted from face to face to face, until at last, quietly, he said, Me. Chapter 40 Julie trembled uncontrollably. Raymond was pressing the cold steel muzzle of his pistol against her temple so hard that her head was craned over to the limit, her ear nearly parallel to the floor. She did not know the identities of her interrogators, but she had learned that Meredith Morley had hired them. Bounty hunters, she surmised. The nature of Raymond's questions told her that they knew little about her, save her name and the fact that she was with Will. Clearly, Meredith had not told them anything substantive about her. They didn't know that she was fluent in German because they had conducted their side conversations within earshot, a lucky break, and one that had saved her a great deal of pain. But the phone call moments ago had changed everything. The news of his brother's death had flipped a switch in the German boss man's head, and now he was like a rabid dog. She gave herself a ten percent chance of survival. Since he couldn't kill the man on the black motorcycle who he blamed for his brother's death, odds were she would be an acceptable stand-in for his revenge. It didn't matter what she said. 
talking only would infuriate him. For the first time in her life she could feel death's breath on the nape of her neck. This was not a nightmare. It was real. She began to sob. Who is the Black Rider? Who killed my brother? Raymond screamed. I told you. I don't know. That wasn't part of the plan. My job was to stay close to Foster and keep him from running. Everything else was orchestrated by Meredith Morley. She didn't tell me the details. I was just supposed to get Foster to the meeting. She was in charge of transporting Foster back to Prague. I don't know anything else. I swear. I've told you everything I know. Raymond yearned to pull the trigger and unleash on this American girl all the hatred and fury he felt against the Black Rider, against Meredith Morley, against William Foster, and against the whole fucking world. But his index finger was non-compliant. He withdrew the pistol muzzle from Julie's temple. Her death would revenge nothing. Her murder would not quench the fire raging in his soul. Julie Ponty would serve his needs better as a bargaining chip. He threw the weapon onto the concrete floor of the warehouse, raised his fists toward the sky, and unleashed a blood-curdling scream. When he was done, Raymond collapsed to his knees and buried his head in his hands. Stefan looked down at Raymond. His older brother's reaction to Udo's death had been immediate and visceral. Raymond had spared Ponty, but he would unleash hell on whomever he ultimately deemed responsible for Udo's death. Stefan's mind had not yet internalized the news of his brother's death. He was in denial, but it was a denial that he was strangely conscious of. He would not start to mourn his dead brother for days, maybe even weeks. Pain would find him, but later— Grief would overwhelm him suddenly and completely, during a subway ride, or while he was having a beer at a pub. For now, though, he felt nothing. The sound of a mobile phone ringing pierced the silence. Julie lifted her head instinctively. The ringing phone was hers. Raymond jumped to his feet. "'That's your phone, isn't it?' he asked her. "'Yes. Where is it?' My right jacket zipper pocket, she replied. Raymond walked around her and retrieved the phone from her pocket. He looked at the LCD screen. The caller ID was blocked. Raymond pressed the talk button on the phone and raised it to Julie's ear. Answer it. Hello, she said. Julie? Will? Raymond pulled the phone from her ear and raised it to his own. You are causing a great deal of trouble for everyone. Funny. I was going to say the same thing about you and your mercenary brothers. You took someone I care about. I want her back. You're going to get her back in little pieces and a garbage bag unless you give me what I want. Then I propose a trade. Raymond cackled. A trade? What could you possibly trade that I want? Me? Interesting. What are your terms? Release Julie unharmed, and I will turn myself over to you. After that, you can do with me what you will. Now, deal. Silence persisted on the line for several moments. What do you mean, no deal? I will only release the girl in exchange for you and the motorcycle rider who stole you away from the Café Satcher. That is going to be impossible. Then the girl dies. It's impossible because the motorcycle rider you are talking about is dead. Raymond held the line in silence. His mind was racing. 
Maybe the police had made a mistake. Maybe his brother Udo was alive, and it was the other motorcycle driver who was killed. Maybe this was a trick. There was an accident during the chase. Both motorcycle drivers were killed. I was thrown from the bike and managed to hobble away from the accident before the police arrived. I'm tired of running. I'm ready to end this. Raymond rubbed his temples. He could not decide if the American was deceiving him. Foster spoke with confidence and without hesitation. His answers were logical, and they did not sound rehearsed. Unless he was an accomplished liar, odds were that he was telling the truth. Raymond decided that it didn't matter anyway. He occupied the position of advantage. As long as he had control of the American woman, he could manipulate Foster. After the trade, he could torture Foster for the truth about the Black Rider. Raymond smiled. He would enjoy torturing Will Foster. I agree to your terms. Meet me at the Karlskirke Catholic Cathedral at ten o'clock. I want to make my peace with God first. At this hour? The church will be locked, Raymond said. I have never known a priest to turn away a man requesting his last rites. Leave the church when you're done. We'll make the trade outside. No deal. I don't trust you. If you want me, then this exchange is going to happen in front of God's witness. When I leave with you, Julie stays behind with the priest. Raymond had not anticipated this little wrinkle. A man of faith he certainly was not, but the idea of killing a priest did not sit well with him. Then the voice in his head reminded him that his brother Udo was dead. Unless he was a coward, nothing should stand in the way of his revenge. Raymond shrugged. He would see how it played out and do what was necessary in the end. If a priest needed to die, then a priest would die. Karl's Kirke would serve his needs well. The surrounding area would be deserted so late at night. The thick marble walls would conceal the sound of any gunshots, should things get out of hand. Ten o'clock. Come alone, or the girl dies. Raymond hung up the phone. He turned to Julie and studied her face a moment before speaking. It seems your charms were quite effective. Will Foster just agreed to trade his life for yours. You must have quite a mouth on you to seduce a man so completely. He turned to Stefan. What do you think, Stefan? Should I let her try to earn her freedom? He said, and unzipped the fly on his pants. Stefan laughed. Careful. Women are unpredictable, and this one has teeth. I can solve that problem. Teeth are removable. I just need a good set of pliers. Julie looked up at him in terror, and he met her gaze. He took pleasure in her fear. He let her mind churn. Her skin was pale, and she looked nauseous. He smirked and then zipped up his fly. Come, Stefan. We haven't much time. We need to plan for this meeting. Raymond said as he turned and walked toward the van. "'What do you have in mind, brother?' Stefan asked, speaking in German and trotting to catch up. "'I want you to take the sniper rifle and go to the Karlskirk in advance. Find a position in one of the balconies. Choose your location carefully.' Pick a balcony where you have a clear line of fire to all locations in the congregation area below. If Foster brings help, then you know what to do. Chapter 41 
Will stared at the twin spires and ornate copper cupola of the Karlskirche from across the reflecting pool in the courtyard. Moonlight and the breeze danced a Viennese waltz across the surface of water. The reflection of the church was a grand mosaic, a thousand ripples moving in melody. Ironic that his journey would end here, at this church dedicated to pay homage to the hundreds of thousands of Austrians who had died of the plague centuries ago. It was no accident that he had insisted on this location for the final showdown with the Zern brothers. Fifteen hours earlier, he had entered the Karlskirche sanctuary and inconspicuously hidden the stolen glass vial under a wooden pew. Special Agent Reed knew about the vials. Apparently, Meredith Morley had reported them stolen from Chiaric Norse, but in trying to extract details from Will about the location of the vials, Reed revealed that one of the vials contained a gene therapy believed to be derived from Will's DNA. Will had responded to Reed's questions with a lie and said that both vials were lost when they shattered on the floor of the youth hostel. He had no choice but to lie. The remaining vial was the only bargaining leverage he possessed. Other than his life, that was. He doubted the FBI understood the true nature of his mutation. He had not told them about his meeting with Johansson. Will estimated the formula was worth tens of millions of dollars on the black market, and he was certain that even Raymond Zern, despite all his fury, could be persuaded by that much money. If Reed and Nelson knew the vial's true worth, he doubted their government masters would let them hand it over to Zern, even in exchange for Julie's life. All that mattered now was that the vial stay hidden until he could make the trade. He would do whatever was necessary to save Julie, just as she had done for him. Alban patted Will's shoulder. Are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be. Nervous? I'd be a liar if I said otherwise. Good. Then you're not overconfident. Overconfidence, in my experience, is an omen of failure. Will offered up an awkward smile, but said nothing. Raymond Zern may be vicious, but I promise you he has no idea what's about to hit him, she said. She reached into her pocket, retrieving a button with an adhesive backing, and fixed it to the inside of his shirt collar. What's that? he asked. A microphone transceiver disguised as a button. When you talk, we'll be able to hear everything you say. Like a wire they use on cop shows on TV? Exactly. Just much smaller. Do you remember your handle? Yes, it's Foxtrot. Coordinator, this is social. How do you copy Foxtrot? Our parish, RS coordinator. Social, this is your coordinator. I copy Foxtrot, Lima Charlie. Good. We can hear you perfectly. How will I hear you? Shouldn't I have an earpiece or something? Well asked. I don't think that would be a good idea. There will be a lot of chatter on the circuit and if you're not used to it, it makes it hard to think. Trust me, I'm speaking from experience. It's better if you're not distracted. You're going to have your hands full just talking to Zern. Will nodded. His eyes expressed all the emotions he felt without uttering a word to her. He pulled his jacket collar up and began walking toward the church. The front entrance of the Karlskirche was situated behind six Corinthian stone pillars supporting a Doric portico mimicking the Parthenon in Athens, but these doors were kept closed and locked except for special occasions. 
Regular access to the church was via a set of tall wooden double doors on the west side. Viewing hours for tourists ended at five o'clock. Catholic evening mass began at six o'clock, and the church was closed to the public after the conclusion of mass. The west entrance was locked promptly after mass, and the church was closed until the next morning. Kalin had arrived thirty minutes before the rest of the team, bypassed building security, and unlocked the doors from the inside. After a survey of the nave and transept, he exited the public area of the church through a set of doors beyond the altar that led to the restricted areas of the church where he would complete his final preparations for the engagement. Also already inside the church was Stefan Zern, who had arrived before Will, but after Kalin. To his delight, he had found the west entrance unlocked, which allowed him to sneak inside without having to fuss with breaking in. However, an unlocked entrance also meant that he was not alone. He took care not to make a sound as he crept along the dark west corridor. Before entering the nave, he stood motionless and surveyed the pews to ensure no one was praying in the church. Killing a man or woman of the cloth was not on his agenda. Karls Kirke was undergoing extensive interior renovations. A massive scaffold occupied the west side of the church, stretching from the ground level up over one hundred feet in the air to the top of the cupola. The scaffold was so tall that an elevator had been installed within to facilitate travel to and from the dome. Marble structures everywhere were being polished to remove centuries' worth of candle smoke from their surfaces. Frescoes adorning the dome of the cupola were being meticulously freshened and retouched. The division between the old and the renovated portions of a structure was dramatic visual evidence of how the grandeur of the church had faded over the years. For Stefan, the scaffolding had been an unexpected gift, a sniper's dream. The interlocking steel trusses were bathed in shadow. Horizontal platforms with interconnecting ladder stairs formed staggered tiers all the way up to the ceiling and offered him a firing angle to every location inside the church except for directly beneath him. It was almost too easy, he thought to himself, as he worked his way up to the fifth-level platform. Once in position, he assembled his sniper rifle from memory in the dark and chambered around. Then he waited. Will pushed against the heavy wooden door of the west entrance. The hinges creaked as the massive door stubbornly gave way. The west corridor was dark, the only illumination coming from the end of the hall where it intersected the nave of the church. He stepped across the threshold and pulled the door closed behind him, erasing the triangle of moonlight on the floor at his feet. His stomach was uneasy. Fear and foreboding washed over him in waves. He was a soldier marching to battle. He was a condemned man shuffling to the gallows. He had agreed to the agent's plan to confront Zern. It was a sound plan. Certainly a better strategy than he could have conceived, but in his heart he did not expect it to work. He walked slowly and deliberately into the nave. His eyes were now adjusted to the dark. Two candles flickered at the altar, which was located past the transept at the head of the church, some thirty meters away. Moonlight shining through the glass windows of the cupola cast a bluish hue throughout the church. He moved down the center aisle. He extended his left hand and let his fingers brush lightly across the tops of the aged oak pews, one by one. One, two, three, seven, eight, nine, thirteen, fourteen. He stepped sideways into the fourteenth pew, 
and sat down. He scooted along the bench until he was in the approximate middle. With his right hand, he reached down under the bench and swept back and forth, feeling for the vial. After a moment, he felt a lump and a texture he immediately recognized as the gauze tape. He peeled the tape free from the underside of the pew and retrieved the glass vial he had hidden, his insurance policy. He stripped the gauze tape off the vial and held it up into a beam of moonlight. The liquid inside shimmered as he tilted the glass tube side to side, watching the angle of the meniscus change. Above, from his hiding place on the scaffold, Stefan watched Will's every move through his monocular night vision scope. He zoomed in on the vial. He could see that the glass tube contained a liquid, but he did not know what the liquid was. Raymond had never mentioned a vial before. Maybe Raymond did not know about it. Maybe it was valuable. Maybe it was dangerous. He would have to inform his brother of this new development. Taking care not to make a sound, Stefan set the rifle down on the plywood decking. He retrieved his mobile phone from his pants pocket and began composing a text message to Raymond. Will wrapped a piece of gauze tape around the top of the vial to help secure the rubber cap. He then slid the tube into his right pants pocket. He lowered his head into his hands. A creaking noise broke the silence and startled Will out of his fretful monologue. The sound came from behind him. He turned his head and looked toward the back of the nave where it intersected the west corridor. He heard footsteps. He exited the pew and took position in the center aisle facing the back of the church. It's time, Will said into the microphone button pinned to his collar. They're here. E. Van Cleve, R.S. Technical. I just detected an electronic transmission from inside the church. Not one of ours. I'm running a trace. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Who has eyes on Romeo Zulu? Our parish, R.S. Coordinator. Social is trailing Romeo Zulu. Social, maintain radio silence. Click once for yes, twice for no. Do you have eyes on Romeo Zulu? A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Click. Our parish, R.S. Coordinator. Is he talking on his phone? A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Click, click. R. Parish, R.S. Coordinator. Is R. Juliet with him? A. Mayneal, R.S. Social. Click. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Shit. Who's transmitting, then? Did we confirm Udo Zern's death? R. Parish, R.S. Coordinator. Yes. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Then it's the other brother, Stefan. We need to locate him. According to their bios, the Zern brothers like their guns. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. If Bio is right, then we've got a shooter on our hands. Shit. That complicates things. The north end of the nave has a balcony that houses a pipe organ. Good sniper location. The staircase off the west corridor leads up to it. I swept it clear, but someone could have ducked in after me. There is also a tower of renovation scaffolding beneath the cupola that could be trouble. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Technical, can you pinpoint the location of the transmission? E. Van Cleve, R.S. Technical. Stand by. Pinging the phone. The target is inside the church. Initiating handshake. It's a mobile phone. Running a trace. The number is registered to one Mr. Stefan Zern. Confirm bios hypothesis. 
The other brother is in the game. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Social, do you have your Kevlar on? A. Neal, R.S. Social. Click. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. Social, divert to the balcony. Eyes only. Do not engage Sierra Zulu. Bio, if you're in the car, I need you inside ASAP to cover social. A. Neal, R.S. Social. Click. To his astonishment, A.J. found himself reaching into the duffel bag on the back seat of the BMW and grabbing the Sig Sauer pistol he had taken from Raymond Zern. Instead of wishing he were back in the familiar safety of his lab at B.U., all he could think about was protecting his colleagues. He had bumbled his way through the sampling op at Chiarek Norse, with the coordinator and Nicolora telling him what to do every step of the way, but he had survived. He had improvised during his meeting with Foster at the Hotel Satcher, and gotten lucky scuffling with Zern, but he had survived. This time would be no different, he told himself. As he reached for the door handle, a hand gripped his shoulder and pulled him back. Slow down, said Van Cleve, his eyes fixed on A.J. They need me in there. You heard Kalen. A.J., we're not real special agents. We're not the Navy SEALs. As a rule, we don't run around toting guns. We don't kill people. This organization solves people's problems, but we don't fight their wars for them. This case has mutated into the worst type of assignment, the kind the tank wants nothing to do with. We're magicians, not warriors. The Van Cleve before him was not the Van Cleve A.J. was accustomed to. The condescending, pompous techno-god was gone, replaced by a concerned father figure. A.J. met his gaze and said, Van Cleve, I'm going. Van Cleve shook his head. Then you'd better take Edgar with you. Who's Edgar? A.J. followed Van Cleve out of the car and to the trunk. Inside the trunk were three hard-sided black suitcases. Van Cleve opened the middle one and retrieved a device the size of a handheld camcorder. This is Edgar. It's an acronym for Electromagnetic Detection, Geometry, and Ranging. This device uses modulated radar pulses to detect structures and movement through solid objects, a.k.a. walls. Edgar will find your sniper for you wherever he's hiding, Van Cleve said. Turn it on, point, and look at the LCD display. Moving things turn red. So it's a thermal imager, like firefighters use? No. Thermal imagers measure irradiated heat. Imagers are passive. They can't see through walls or windows. Edgar uses modulated EM signals to see through objects. Think Superman's X-ray vision. If the sniper is not moving, how will it find him? Edgar is sensitive enough to detect even the slightest movement. It will ID a stationary living target based on the expansion and contraction of the chest cavity during respiration. Van Cleve, I almost feel like hugging you right now, Van Cleve grimaced. Oh, one more thing, A.J. said, nodding sheepishly at the Sig pistol in his hand. Before I go... Can you please show me where the hell the safety is on this thing? Raymond Zern emerged from the shadows of the west corridor, with Julie standing on his left side. Her posture was erect and awkward. Something was wrong. They shuffled together toward the center aisle, 
stepping into the moonlight and stopping shy of the first pew. Will could not make out exactly what it was, but Zern had something wrapped around her neck. It was pulled taut underneath her jaw and disappeared beneath her blonde hair. The tension on her neck was causing her visible discomfort. Will could not see Raymond's left hand, but surmised it held a cord that he was using to choke her. In his other hand, Zern gripped a pistol and pressed it against the side of her face. "'I'm surprised you came, Foster. I figured you for a coward the way you're always running away,' said Raymond, his voice reverberating in the empty church. "'You mean like the time I kicked your ass in Prague?' Will said. "'Let her go, Zern. I'm the one you want.' Pretty arrogant for a man who's about to— Raymond was interrupted by the sound of his mobile phone vibrating in its holster. He raised one eyebrow. He wanted to ignore the call, but if it was Stefan, the information could be critical. Raymond turned to Julie. He pressed the muzzle of the pistol firmly into the fleshy part of her cheek. Reach down and grab my phone off of my belt. Show me the screen. Don't say a word. Don't press any buttons. Fuck with me and I'll blow a hole right through the middle of your pretty face. Julie did as he instructed, retrieving and raising the phone so he could see the backlit LCD screen. The screen read, Foster has a glass vial in his pocket. Put the phone back in the holster on my belt, Raymond said. She struggled to complete the task. The piano wire he had strung around her neck made it impossible for her to tilt her head to see what she was doing. Eventually, she felt the holster and slid the phone back inside. It seems that you've been holding out on me, Foster, Raymond said. The glass vial in your pocket. Let me see it. Will blanched. He thought he had been alone when he retrieved the sample. There was only one way that the bounty hunter could have learned about it. Someone else was in the church. Our parish, R.S. coordinator. Physical, this is the coordinator. Stand by for revised tasking from Founder One. K. Immel, R.S. Physical. What? Foster is in trouble. I need to get in there. Our parish, R.S. coordinator. Tasking sent. Check your handheld. Kalen pulled his phone from his pocket. The screen flashed with a text message. Revised tasking. From Founder 1 to R.S. Physical. Priority 1. Obtain sample vial from Foxtrot. Priority 2. Execute hostage retrieval. Dressed in black pants, a black shirt, and a Catholic priest's white collar, Kalen emerged from a door on the west side of the altar. His dark hair was colored with streaks of gray, and he had applied makeup to accentuate the fine wrinkles around his eyes and forehead, visibly aging him twenty years. He took three strained steps toward the altar, using a wooden cane in his left hand to assist him, and then stopped. "'What are you people doing in here? The church is closed,' he called out in German. "'You must leave immediately, or I'm going to call the police.' "'You're not going to call the police, Father,' Raymond replied from the other end of the church. "'Why not?' Kalin called back. Because if you do, I'll blow this nice young woman's brains all over your beautiful marble floor. Kalin feigned dismay, raising his right hand to his heart. He hobbled forward, pretending to try to get a better view of the intruders in his church. Will turned toward Kalin, verifying the priest he heard was the priest he expected to see. Father Heigel? Will said. Yes, I'm Father Heigel, 
Kalin replied in English, flavored with a thick Austrian accent. Just the person I was hoping to see. Excuse me? Do I know you? No, we've never met. I'm the one who left the message on your answering machine to meet me here tonight. Thank you for coming. As you can see, things are not going very well for me and my lady friend, Will said, gesturing to the captive Julie down the aisle. Kalin shuffled down six steps from the altar into the nave. He hobbled slowly across the marble floor toward Will, leaning heavily on the cane. With his right hand raised in the air, palm facing forward, he said, "'Gentlemen, I'm not sure what is going on here, but you are in the Lord's house. This is no place for violence. Please put down your guns. We can end this peacefully.' "'I'm sorry, Father,' scoffed Raymond." But that is not going to happen. Why don't you just shut up and sit your holy ass down in one of those pews where I can see you? Listen, Zern, you've got what you want. Why don't you let Julie go like we agreed? She can stay behind in the church with Father Heigel, and I will go with you. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Social report status of balcony sweep. A. Menil, R.S. Social. The balcony is clear. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Roger, I'm in the west corridor, but I can't see shit. Technical, I thought you told me that this Edgar radar scope could see through walls. E. Van Cleave, R.S. Technical. Try adjusting the penetrating depth. Use the dial on the left to set the focal range. You'll see the number change in the top left corner of the screen. That's the focal depth in feet. If you turn the knob all the way to the left, past the detent, Edgar will sweep automatically across a range of depths. I suggest you use sweep mode. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Okay, I see it. Going to sweep mode. It's working. I've got two bodies, our Romeo and Juliet, I presume. And there's Foxtrot and Physical. Bingo! I've got the shooter. Edgar puts him directly above Foster and Immel. He's on some sort of truss structure. A. Maynil, R.S. Social. There's a scaffold in the middle of the church on the west side of the nave. It goes all the way up to the top of the dome ceiling. That is the structure you're seeing. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. This shooter has taken a bird's-eye position. Physical, this is Bio... You've got a shooter hiding in the scaffolding on the fifth level, almost directly above you. E. Van Cleave, R.S. Technical. Social, do you have a view of the shooter? A. Menil, R.S. Social. Negative. What's worse is that his position is 100% defensible. It's impossible for someone to approach the scaffold without traversing his line of fire. E. Van Cleave, R.S. Technical. I have an idea. Bio, egress to the main entrance and wait for me there. I'll need your help. Julie gagged. Raymond was unconsciously ratcheting up the pressure on the piano wire around her neck, matching the rising tension in the air. A drop of warm blood trickled down her neck. The piano wire complicated the scenario. He had absolute control of her. She couldn't crack him in the balls and run away— if he were to be shot, her head would almost certainly be severed from her body by the force of his body crashing to the ground, pulling the piano wire with it. She was trapped in a human guillotine. You're joking me, she rasped. Zern ignored her. I said sit down, father, 
Raymond repeated with vehemence. Kalin had crept forward to the point that he was now standing beside Will in the center aisle. Okay, okay, but please put down your gun. Kalin made a lowering motion with his free hand. Raymond cocked his head and lowered his eyebrows. A disapproving look for a disobedient child. He removed the pistol from Julie's cheek and took aim at the priest. Kalin bowed his head subserviently, but did not move to take a seat. Raymond tweaked his aim and fired a warning shot. The muzzle flare lit up the interior of the church like a flash of lightning, followed by the crash of thunder from the shot. The bullet whisked through the air and slammed into the back of a wooden pew with a splintering thud. Will instinctively cowered. Kalin collapsed on the ground at Foster's feet in a quaking heap, holding his right hand over his heart. Will glowered at Raymond. He looked down at the fallen, crumpled Kalin at his feet, and then extended his arm to help the imposter priest to his feet. Kalin clutched Will's right wrist with his right hand and pulled hard, yanking Will off balance. Will buckled at the waist, and reflexively his left foot shot forward to catch his balance, so he did not fall over. Kalin swung his body around, so his back faced Zern. With his left hand, the priest pawed at Will's waist, finding a handhold on Will's right pants pocket. Will heaved Kalin up to his feet. Kalin feigned difficulty, loading weight onto a supposedly bum left leg. He stumbled to the left, leaning heavily on Will. "'Help me to the pew, my son,' Kalin said to Will, trembling and eyeing the bounty hunter in mock terror. Will lugged the groaning priest toward the closest pew. He could feel Kalin's thick and sinewy muscles flexing with each movement beneath the black garments. A lamb carrying a lion— Kalin played his part with the dramatic flair of a seasoned stage actor. With great effort, Will helped lower him onto the pew bench. Raymond watched the proceedings with increasing agitation. Will stepped back into the aisle and bent at the waist to retrieve the priest's wooden cane from the marble floor. "'Leave it!' yelled Raymond. Will froze and then stood back up, leaving the cane to lie where it fell. Enough of these games, Raymond snarled. You lied to me, Foster. You have lied to me from the beginning. In your pocket you have a glass vial. It contains something important, important enough that you would risk your life and Fräulein Ponty's life to retrieve it. I want to know what it is. Give it to me, now. Will stood motionless. The vial was his insurance policy. Turning it over to Zern would shift the balance of power. It was a move he could not afford to make. I will separate this woman's head from her body if you test me, Foster. You have three seconds to show me the vial. Raymond increased the pressure on the piano wire around Julie's throat. The metal strand sliced into her soft skin like a cheese cutter. She whimpered. A dark stain grew across the front of her white blouse as dual trickles of blood snaked down either side of her throat, creating a Y-shaped crimson necklace. Julie, Will mumbled pleadingly. One, two... All right, all right. You can have it. Please, just let her go, Will pleaded. Not until I see the vial. Take this, Van Cleve said, trying to catch his breath after sprinting from the BMW to the church. A.J. set Edgar down on the marble floor and took a stainless steel case from Van Cleve. The case looked familiar. He had seen it before. What's going on? Open it, Van Cleve instructed, while he powered on a tiny notebook computer.
Inside you'll find a thermos-like cylinder with Abby's spiders. Unscrew the lid and dump all the spiders on the floor. Count them. A.J. did as instructed. Seven. Good, said Van Cleve, and he began typing furiously on his laptop. Three-dimensional models of different polyhedrons on X, Y, and Z coordinates appeared, and then detonated on his computer screen. The sequence accelerated, flashing through permutation after permutation, and then suddenly stopped. The screen depicted an elongated hexagonal pyramid and flashed the text, Optimal Yield Geometry. Activate all seven spiders, just like you did in Prague. Do you remember? Yes, I remember. A.J. moved quickly, methodically performing the activation procedure for each spider, and then setting it on the ground. They're activated. Now what? Inside the case, you will find six strips of plastic explosive. Three black three light green in color. Remove one of the green strips. Pinch off seven equal-size portions. Roll them into a ball about the size of a gumball, Van Cleve ordered, never looking away from his computer screen. A.J. glanced at Van Cleve's screen and noticed that the exploding polyhedron graphics were gone, replaced by the spider interface control software. Are you crazy? I'm not touching plastic explosive, A.J. protested. This compound requires a detonator charge. It's very stable. Now shut up and do as I say. Reluctantly, A.J. peeled a strip of green plastic explosive from a stowage slot in the briefcase. The feel and consistency of the material reminded him of modeling clay he played with as a kid. He pinched off seven blobs of the stuff while trying to suppress gruesome mental images of his hands being blown off. Now what? A.J. asked, showing Van Cleve his handiwork. I'll take it from here, Van Cleve said. He pressed the blobs of plastic explosive firmly onto the backs of the robot spiders, taking care not to let any of the substance cover the head sensors or leg joints. Then, cupping his hands together as if he was going to take a drink of water from a stream, he added, Now hold out your hands like this. A.J. extended his cupped hands, and Van Cleve then gently placed the seven explosive-laden micro-machines inside. Okay, let's go, Van Cleve said. Will reached his right hand into his right pants pocket and felt for the vial. To his dismay, his fingers found nothing but pocket fabric. He began to panic. The vial was gone. Raymond's expression morphed from smug satisfaction to dismay, and then to rage, as the realization of what was happening began to register. He had been set up. Stefan, shoot the priest, Raymond yelled. A hollow, dissonant moan from the organ echoed throughout the church. The sound reverberated throughout the nave, reflecting off the marble walls and floor, filling the air with a baritone thrum, completely drowning Raymond's voice before Stefan could hear the end of his brother's order. Alban had been listening to the entire exchange from above, hiding in the shadows of the organ balcony. She had waited until the last instant to intervene and bravely played the organ her back facing the nave. Stefan turned to the organ balcony. He trained the crosshairs of his night vision scope on the middle of her back and pulled the trigger. The bullet struck her in between her shoulder blades. Her body fell forward onto the organ keys, adding a new chorus of dissonant notes to the air for several seconds before she collapsed onto the floor. The organ fell silent. Satisfied, 
Stefan chambered a second round in the sniper rifle and shifted his aim away from the balcony down to the center aisle below, zeroing in on the location where Will and the priest had been standing. He quickly found Will, but the priest was nowhere in sight. He scanned left, sweeping the viewing circle of his night vision scope over to Raymond's position. To his astonishment, he watched as the priest head butted his brother and then freed the American girl. Stefan adjusted his torso and slid his index finger over the trigger in preparation for his next shot. But the firing geometry did not offer him a clear shot at the priest without risk of hitting his brother. He would have to wait for the scuffle to play itself out. Eventually he would have a clean shot. Stefan exhaled. Patience. The organ blast gave Kalin the opportunity he needed. During the few seconds Zern turned his head to look at the organ balcony behind him, Kalin closed the distance between them. Eyes forward, arms and legs churning, he sprinted down the center aisle like an Olympic athlete out of the blocks. He decelerated to a stop in front of the bounty hunter. Kalin saw shock in Zern's eyes when he returned his gaze to the front and found the priest's face mere inches from his own. Kalin grunted and smashed his forehead into Zern's right eye socket. With his left hand, Kalin pushed Julie's face to the left, away from the gun barrel pressed into her cheek, until her jaw was parallel to the muzzle. He then slid his fingers down her throat and into the small triangular gap between the piano wire and the two outside ligaments on either side of her neck. He pulled the wire away from her throat with both hands. The razor-sharp wire sliced into the fleshy pads on the underside of his fingers as he created a triangular opening slightly larger than her head. He wailed in pain, a guttural, primal bellow, but it was drowned out by the thunderclap of two successive gunshots. Stunned by the priest's precision headbutt, Raymond wobbled and blinked his eyes. Coming to... He squeezed the trigger of the Sig Sauer twice. Julie yelped as the muzzle flares seared her left cheek, but the bullets sailed harmlessly by. The acrid smell of scorched hair and skin wafted through the air. She opened her eyes. The hot steel barrel of Zern's weapon was resting next to her left ear and cheek. She became acutely aware of her lips, her tongue, and her teeth, all intact and unmolested. She had not been shot. Thanks to the foresight of the priest, her face had been clear of the line of fire. She wasted no time. This was her chance, and she knew it. The priest was holding the wire several inches away from her face, and suffering greatly for it. Julie tucked her chin to her chest and squatted, she felt the wire scrape against her ear, nose, and forehead as she ducked her head through the triangular opening. But she was free. Raymond yanked the wire noose, a split second too late to foil Julie's escape, but before the priest could extricate both his hands. The razor wire cinched tightly around the priest's left hand, compressing and cutting deeper into his fingers. Raymond grinned with sadistic pleasure as the priest dropped to a knee in front of him. With the butt of his gun, he struck a powerful blow across the priest's face. "'Goodbye, father,' Raymond sneered. Then, pressing the pistol against the priest's forehead, he added, "'See you in hell!' A.J. and Van Cleve crouched side by side, peering around the corner of the main entrance into the nave. Van Cleve had his laptop open, balanced precariously on his thighs, while he wirelessly piloted the spiders toward the scaffold. Each spider was equipped with an internal self-destruct charge, designed to erase any trace of the device after the completion of a data reconnaissance mission. Van Cleve's plan was to use this self-destruct charge as the detonator for the payload of plastic explosive each spider carried on its back. In theory, 
His tactical improvisation should work, but it had never been tested. A baritone organ blast caused him to bobble his computer, and he nearly dropped it onto the marble floor. A.J. ducked by his side. Recovering their wits, both men turned and looked up at the organ balcony in time to see a female shape, bathed in moonlight, fall onto the organ keyboard and then collapse to the balcony floor. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. Oh, God! Social must have used the organ to distract the sniper, but I think he just shot her. Our parish coordinator. Social, this is the coordinator. Over. Social, this is the coordinator. Do you copy? E. Van Cleave, R.S. Technical. She's not responding. Bio, go help Social, but don't be stupid. Stay below the balcony railing, or the sniper will take a shot at you, too. A. Archer, R.S. Bio. What about the spiders? E. Van Cleave, R.S. Technical. They're almost in position. I can handle this. Go! Van Cleave glanced to the center aisle, where a scuffle had just broken out. A bead of sweat rolled down his forehead and plopped onto the keypad. Every passing second could be Kalin's last. Were he a religious man, Van Cleve thought to himself, he would be praying. Van Cleve's computer screen flashed a message. Position geometry obtained. Press Enter to initiate self-destruct sequence. Countdown timer, zero seconds. Prayer answered. He pressed the Enter key. The explosion roared through the cavernous main hall of the Karlskirke like a twelve-gun salute from a battleship. The power of Van Cleve's shaped charge blew out a two-meter section of steel in the southwest corner of the scaffold frame, causing the platform tiers at each level above to tip abruptly downward in the direction of the break. Stefan Zern was jolted out of his prone shooting position into a sideways slide. His body skidded uncontrollably toward the dipping corner of the platform. Reflexively, he let go of his sniper rifle with both hands and flailed desperately for a handhold. The sniper rifle sailed off the platform edge and bounced on the marble floor below with a triple clack. Like a thousand burning needles... Splinters from the plywood decking raked the pads of his fingertips and palms of his hands as he clawed wildly for his life. His right forearm contacted a metal strut. He tried desperately to grab the strut as he slid by, but the side of his head slammed into the corner post, knocking him senseless. His limp body rolled over the edge and started to fall before abruptly jerking to a halt. Nearly five stories above the unforgiving marble floor of the Karlskirk, Stefan Zern swung upside down and unconscious. He was saved by the calf strap of his ankle holster, which snagged a protruding bolt on a scaffold clamp affixed to the corner post. Seven detonations of plastic explosive erupting simultaneously provided Kalin a stay of execution. Raymond, who was facing the scaffold when the charges blew, stumbled backward in shock. Stefan! he cried, as he watched his younger brother fall off the scaffold platform into shadow. Taking a page from Kalin's playbook, Will seized the moment. He picked up Kalin's walking cane, closed the gap to where the others stood, and swung it at Zern's head. The blow connected squarely with Raymond's mouth. Blood exploded from his lower lip like a bursting piñata. His head snapped back and then forward. Howling in pain, Raymond pulled the trigger on the Sig Sauer, but Kalin had already moved clear of the line of fire. Kalin performed a scissor kick, sweeping the bounty hunter's legs out from underneath him. Raymond landed flat on his back. The impact jarred the handgun loose from his grip and sent it spinning across the marble floor until it came to rest at Julie's feet. She bent and picked it up. Julie looked at the pistol in her hand with a glassy, distant stare. All three men fixated on her. 
she was standing in the middle of the center aisle, six feet from where they were clustered. Her face flushed, and her eyes erupted with fire. Her neck and chest glistened with her own blood, and her disheveled hair glowed like a golden halo in the moonlight. She pointed the gun at Raymond. Will shivered. And, behold, the angel of death came to pass judgment upon him, Kalin mumbled under his breath. You're a monster, she seethed, her eyes fixed on Raymond. And you're a traitorous bitch. He laughed and raised himself into a sitting position, his legs extended in V in front of him. Should I tell your boyfriend how you betrayed him? That you've been working with Meredith Morley all along? That's a lie. We're on the same side, you and me. We're both working for the same goal, to put this lab rat back in his cage. Raymond turned to Will. Don't look so surprised, Yankee. Never trust a beautiful woman. Just an hour before we came here, she was begging me to fuck her like a whore. Will looked at Julie. Her lip was quivering. Her hand was trembling. Julie, don't do it. He's not worth it. This guy is a psychopath. His words are poison. The muzzle flashed, illuminating the church like a strobe. Raymond jerked and reflexively clutched his crotch as the bullet ricocheted off the marble tile in between his legs, inches from his groin. Will walked to where she stood and peeled the pistol from her grip before she could fire another round. She turned and faced him, tears streaming down her cheeks. He put his arm around her and pulled her into his chest. It's over now, Will said softly. A.J. knelt beside Alban's fallen body at the base of the organ. She faced away from him, sprawled on her right side. He stroked her left cheek with his hand. She stirred. <coughs> Alban? Alban, can you hear me? he whispered. It feels like someone ripped my spine out of my body, she moaned. I think the round hit my upper back. How long have I been out? I don't know. Not long. Do you have your vest on? Yes. Kalin made me wear one with ceramic armor inserts. Good. Can you feel this? A.J. asked, squeezing her right hand. Yes. Can you feel this? Yes, that's my foot. Very good. Next, we need to check if the bullet penetrated through your vest, to see if you're bleeding. Also, we need to determine if you have any broken vertebrae. If you do, moving you could damage your spinal cord. That would be bad. How do you know this stuff, A.J.? Before grad school, I was an EMT in training for two years. You are full of surprises today, he smiled. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to stay very still. I'm going to slide my hand underneath the vest to check for blood. You just want an excuse to get your hands up my shirt, don't you, Bio? Alban said feebly. You're right. I should probably check your chest first to see if the bullet passed clear through. Don't you dare, Alban chuckled and then moaned in pain. A.J. slid his hand along the small of her back and felt for wetness under her vest. He gently pulled his hand out and rubbed his thumb and forefinger together. Dry. Nothing slippery. He then held his fingers up into a beam of moonlight to double-check himself. No blood. I think the vest did its job. But that doesn't guarantee against a broken back. 
The force of a round at that velocity is like getting hit with a crowbar. We need to get you out of here. What about the shooter? He's been neutralized. You have Van Cleave to thank for that, and Abby's spiders. Do you hear that? Alban asked in a hush. Sirens. The police, no doubt. It sounds like they've brought a chopper, too. Time to go. The authorities are coming. We should go, now, Van Cleve yelled to Kalin. What about Zern? Will said, keeping Raymond on the ground and at bay with the sig. We can't just let him go. Kalin glared at Raymond as he freed his bloody left hand from the piano wire noose. Tie him up. Leave him for the police. And him? Will asked, glancing up at Stefan Zern, who was still hanging upside down precariously from the scaffold platform. Leave him. He's not going any before Kalin could finish his sentence. The calf strap on Stefan Zern's ankle holster gave way, and the unconscious sniper plummeted head first to the ground. Stefan! Raymond screamed. He looked at the broken body of his fallen brother, splayed unnaturally across the marble tiles, surrounded by an expanding pool of dark red blood. Hatred welled up in his eyes. He had nothing left to lose, nothing left to live for, nothing except for revenge. Zern slipped his right hand inside the flap of his button-down shirt. His fingers found the grip of a Glock 26 9mm pocket pistol concealed snugly in an underarm holster. He looked away from his fallen brother to Will, the man who had ruined his life. Weapon! Van Cleve yelled, but it was too late. A single shot reverberated like a thunderclap inside the church. Will buckled. Julie screamed. She looked from Will to Raymond, expecting him to fire another shot. Raymond's eyes twitched. He had a strange, vapid smile on his face. Then he collapsed, prone onto the marble floor, his shooting arm extended, the barrel of the Glock still smoldering. Kalin knelt and withdrew a small dagger from the base of the bounty hunter's skull. He could not bring himself to look at Julie. His eyes were lowered in shame. He had failed, delivering the death strike a split second after the impulse from Raymond's brain had traveled to his trigger finger. The nine-millimeter round had found its target and pierced Will's chest. Julie ran to Will and knelt at his side. His face was already going pale. She cradled his head in her hands, tears streaming from her eyes. He reached up and touched her cheek. I never betrayed you, she said. I know, he whispered. Can you hear those sirens? Help is coming. You've just got to hang on until they get here, she pleaded, stroking his forehead. He managed a fragile, tentative smile. My legs are cold. Don't you leave me, William Foster. Do you hear me? Please, please don't leave me. I love you, Julie. She held him tight against her chest as she wept. I love you, too. Chapter 42 Boston, Massachusetts What I'm saying is that I don't fucking believe you, Robert, Meredith hissed. Believe what you want, Meredith. It is what it is, Nicolora said. She glowered at him from across the table. I'm not Jesus. I can't raise Foster from the dead, he added and then casually stuffed a whole piece of spicy tuna roll, dripping in wasabi-infused soy sauce, into his mouth with a pair of chopsticks. A waiter approached the couple and asked if they would like another bottle of sake for the table. She ignored him. 
He shook his head no, and the waiter skittered away with prudent haste. Failure is the last thing I expected from your organization on this assignment. I've seen your teams negotiate impossible situations, solve intractable problems, some beyond mortal comprehension. But this? This was easy. A simple search and rescue, and you couldn't pull it off. I don't understand, she ranted. Meredith, what you fail to recognize is that this outcome is entirely your fault. If you want to blame someone, then blame yourself. My fault? My fault? I hardly see how this is my... You were lazy and cheap. You hired amateurs when you should have hired professionals from the beginning, he interrupted. He thrust a scolding finger at her and continued. Haven't you learned anything from me? The most efficient way to solve a problem is to eliminate as many variables from the equation as possible. Not introduce new ones, for God's sake. "'especially independent variables over which you have limited or no control. "'The Zern brothers were absolute wild cards. "'You set a brush fire to try to catch your rabbit, "'but ended up burning down the entire forest. "'If anyone should be disappointed, it should be me.' "'She bit her lower lip. "'Abruptly, her expression softened.' She blinked coyly, flashing him her best bedroom eyes. No, he reprimanded. Tell me where he is, she begged. I said no. What did you do with him? I didn't do anything with him. After he was shot by your man, Zern, the Austrians intervened. I had no choice. I pulled my team. You must know something. He shrugged. My sources tell me that Foster died and was discreetly laid to rest. That's all I know. Where? I'd like to pay my respects. No, you don't. You want to dig him up. Robert, how could you think such a thing? Nicolora stuffed another piece of sushi into his mouth, a rainbow roll this time. This place is brilliant. Best sushi in Boston. You are really not going to tell me, are you? She pouted. No. I could still salvage things if you just— He cut her off. Enough, Meredith. There's nothing left to salvage. She looked down at her lap. This will ruin me, you realize. Nicolora wiped his mouth with the cloth napkin from his lap. His thoughts drifted to the sample vial Kalin had lifted from Foster's pocket in the Karlskirke that fateful night. Contrary to the charade he was now playing with his ex-client and ex-lover, all had not been lost. At this very moment, A.J. was working late in his lab at the tank, trying to replicate Virogen's work. And while it had never been Nicolora's intent to pirate Meredith's research, circumstances had left him no choice. The real FBI had since fixed its spotlight squarely on Virogen and Meredith, and he would not permit the greatest medical discovery of the twenty-first century to be confiscated away into some government black hole. No. He would be the secret's custodian. Both the Nicolora Foundation and the think tank could reap great rewards from this golden seed. He would leverage philanthropic and commercial opportunities to bring his public and private faces esteem and wealth. He was confident his new R.S. bio would succeed where Meredith's team had failed. In his experience... Any problem could be solved with enough time, resources, and money, all of which he possessed in abundance. After a painfully long pause, 
Nicolora finally said, Let's leave this dirty business behind us for the rest of the evening, shall we? Then, staring brazenly across the table at her stark cleavage framed by the plunging V neckline of her emerald-colored dress, he added, Let's talk about something more stimulating. You look ravishing. Is that a new dress? Chapter 43 I am England, four months later. Julie wiped a stream of tears from her cheeks. I miss you, Will, she whispered. Huddled under her umbrella, she watched raindrops stream down the hewn granite headstone. Today was the third time she had come to Iam to visit Will's grave since his death. It was also the third time she had been unable to fight back the tears. Losing him had been harder on her than she ever imagined it would be. She was taking life one day at a time. She had moved to London and taken a new job with a small biotechnology consulting firm, hoping to make a fresh start. She had not tendered a written resignation to Vienne Bioscience, nor did she receive a termination letter. Apparently, the terms of her departure were mutually implicit. Her final direct deposit payment was prorated to the date she had taken Will's blood sample to the lab and had it analyzed by Bart Bennett. She wondered whatever became of Bart. She had not heard from Meredith Morley again, although sometimes she had nightmares of picking up the phone to make a call, but instead of a dial tone, being greeted by Meredith's bone-chilling voice. Because of the dreams, she had changed her mobile number. Whether it was prudent or paranoid, she didn't care. It made her feel safer. The enigmatic crew who had orchestrated her rescue at the Karlskirche had vanished from her life as suddenly and mysteriously as they had appeared. The events of that night were so surreal and disjointed, she still had trouble stitching her memories together into a cogent narrative. One minute she was cradling Will in her arms, surrounded by the American agents who had just risked their lives to save her. The next she was alone, arguing with a cadre of Viennese police officers and paramedics. The officer in charge at the scene had refused to let her accompany Will on the life-flight helicopter that fateful night. Instead, he had ordered her taken to a nearby precinct for questioning. After twelve hours of intense interrogation at the hands of the Austrian police, she had been abruptly discharged with no charges filed against her. For the next three days, Julie had stormed the city, trying to learn what had become of Will. But no one could or would answer her questions. She had checked every hospital in a sixty-kilometer radius from the Karlskirche, but found no record of a man matching Will's description being admitted with a gunshot wound to the chest. Most upsetting, however, was when she was told by a senior official that there was no record of a life-flight helicopter pickup at the Karlskirche on the night Will was shot. At every turn, her crusade was stymied. The final rebuke came four days later, when she returned to the police precinct, where she had been interrogated, only to learn that the OIC from the scene had been transferred to another division in Strasbourg. When she asked to speak with the precinct chief, the reception attendant said the chief was prohibited from discussing the details of the case with anyone— and that her request for an audience was denied. Fourteen days passed with no news about Will. Then, on the fifteenth day, she received a most unexpected visitor at her apartment, Xavier Pope. Her initial reaction had been to slam the door in his face. Through the closed door, he'd politely and persistently pressed her, 
saying repeatedly that he refused to leave until she gave him a chance to say his peace. But it was the urn he held that swayed her, not the begging. To her astonishment, they talked for over an hour. Pope freely corroborated certain elements of Will's story and adamantly denied others. She had scrutinized Pope's every word and asked him the tough questions, but he never balked. After they had dispensed with the past, she opened the door to the present. Where had the life-flight helicopter taken Will? Why could she find no record of his hospital admittance in all of Vienna? Why was nobody talking about the events of that night? Pope took all her questions in stride. He explained that because of the perceived biosafety risks associated with the case, the Austrian armed forces had been tasked with locating and securing Foster. From what he had learned, Will had not been loaded into a life-flight helicopter that night, but rather into an Austrian military helicopter. He had been transported to a military hospital for emergency medical care, but regrettably had died en route. Pope went on to say that the Austrian military unilaterally made the decision to cremate Will's body for biosafety reasons. The details and emotion in Pope's story seemed genuine, and this left her confounded. On the one hand, she wanted to hate Pope, hold him responsible for all the pain she was feeling, all the pain he had caused Will. But on the other hand, Pope was the only person from Virogen who had reached out to her, apologized, and offered her closure. Before leaving that night, Pope made a last and final gesture of goodwill. He explained that even though he had resigned from Virogen, he felt personally accountable for Will's death. As such, he insisted that he pay for all of Will's funeral expenses, an act of contrition, he had called it. Catatonic with grief and shock, she had graciously accepted. She instructed that Will's ashes be buried in Iam, in the same cemetery as his ancestors. Something told her he would have wanted it that way. What remained of Will's legacy, she decided to leave in Professor Johansson's capable hands. She informed Johansson of Will's decision to publish his genome, and instructed him to post Will's immunity mutation on the Internet as open source code, so all the world could benefit from his gift. During their last conversation, Johansson had told Julie that Will's dream was still very much alive, and that he had recently obtained grant money from the university to sequence Will's entire genome. Will's sacrifice would not be in vain, he had promised her. Of this fact, she was certain. Meandering out of her daydream, she became aware that she was gently running her hand along her stomach, feeling the bump beneath the fabric of her raincoat. She was showing now. She'd already completed her first trimester and had her first ultrasound. Everything was normal. The baby was perfect. Beautiful. Watching the monitor that day had been the saddest, happiest moment of her life. When she asked about the gender, the doctor had said it was too soon to tell. No matter. She knew it was a boy. She would call him Will, just as she had his father. Epilogue United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases USAMRID Fort Detrick, Maryland Is he brain dead? No, he's in a medically sustained coma. But that's technically not the same as brain dead, Xavier Pope replied, staring down at the gray body lying on a lone hospital bed.
An orchestra of automated commotion set an unnerving cadence in the room. Machines whirred, and monitors beeped. IVs dripped, and fluids pumped. Pope frowned. There would be no miraculous escape this time. He looked apprehensively at the figure standing next to him. Given the cloak and dagger communication protocols the curator had insisted on over the past several months, Pope had imagined a very different character. His preconceptions were of the men in black variety. Hyper-masculine, dark glasses, dark suit, and a humorless face chiseled from stone. He had been wrong about everything, except for the face chiseled from stone bit. First of all, the curator was not a he. The woman beside him bore no resemblance to the stereotypical agency spook. To the contrary, she looked like the poster child for a World War II Nazi Aryan eugenics program. Her mane of shoulder-length hair was the color of the midday Nordic sun. The white business dress she wore was fitted and tailored just above the knee, showing off her tight, sinewy calf muscles. She stood perfectly erect, and her square shoulders and taut stomach added an aura of military bearing. What struck him most were her eyes. So pale and cold, they seemed carved from a glacier, shimmering and arctic blue. Have you resumed the work you were conducting for Virogen? the woman asked. Yes. Good. She reached into her handbag and retrieved a mobile phone. She pressed a button on the touchscreen. The curator would like to speak with you, she said plainly, handing him the phone. Pope raised an eyebrow. I thought you were the curator. She smirked, seemingly pleased by his misconception. No, I am his right hand. Pope took her mobile phone and raised it to his ear. This is Xavier Pope. A coarse and curious voice said, Dr. Pope, I understand from Murr that your transition into the new position at Usamrid has been seamless. Yes, it has. Thank you for asking. And thank you for rescuing my career. I know I left a trail of red tape in my wake, complicating things. Red tape is easy to cut, if you have a sharp pair of scissors, said the voice. Now... I want to make sure that going forward we're on the proverbial same page. Understood? Pope shifted his weight nervously from leg to leg. I'm listening, sir. Do you understand that the test subject is the property of the United States Army now? Yes. And that even though you are a civilian... You work for the United States Army? Yes, of course. And that you also work for me? Um, no, I was not aware of that. I was afraid that detail might not have been made clear to you. No matter, I will explain. Until your debt to me is paid... You serve two masters, the United States of America and me. Is that clear, Dr. Pope? Yes, Pope replied. Good. These are my instructions, so listen very carefully. You will finish your research on the mutation within eighteen months. You will turn over the findings to your Usamrid department head at that time. However, you will deliver a viable product, your methods, and all of your research data to me within nine months' time. I don't 
understand. How am I supposed to finish the work in eighteen months? But the curator interrupted him. The room you presently occupy is under surveillance, doctor. So choose your words more carefully. I'm sorry. What you said doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense. My deadline is nine months. The Usamrid deadline will be set at eighteen months. You answer to me first and foremost. I gave you your life back, and I am the one keeping the wolves at bay. But I can just as easily take away that which I have given. Cross me, and the pain and humiliation you'll suffer will be terrible. Is that clear? Pope nodded and answered, yes. Good, the voice said, satisfied. One last thing, Dr. Pope. A storm is coming. When it does, if you've paid your debt to me, I will give you shelter. Thank you, Pope replied, confused. Then he added awkwardly, I won't let you down. The line was already dead. He glanced at the phone's LCD screen, hoping to catch a glimpse of the caller ID. But the text displayed read, Blocked. He handed the phone back to the woman the curator had called Murr. Her glacier eyes sent an unnerving chill down his spine. He took a step back, increasing the space between them. She held her stare, overtly passing judgment, before returning her gaze to the subject of her visit. "'What is his name?' she asked, staring at the comatose patient. Pope paused before answering. Certainly she knew the answer to her question. That meant the question had to be a test, the first of many tests in his new life. He chose his words carefully. His name is Patient Sixty-Five.